Redemption, written by Nicole Dykes, narrated by Thurlow Holmes and Dash Coleman. Prologue, Logan, 13 years old. What the hell was that? I jump up from my twin mattress, tucked away in the dining room of the one-bedroom, run-down, raggedy-ass apartment my mom is renting. She is currently entertaining a guest in the only bedroom, but at least there's a closed door between us. I'll take it. I rip the earbuds from my ears that I'm using to block out the god-awful sounds coming from my mom's room and listen for what I thought I heard. I look out the window, yellowed from age in the elements, and jump back when I see a small hand grasp the top rung of the fire escape. I sigh a breath of relief when my best friend Quinn's face appears next until I notice the state of her beautiful features. Not again. I slide the window up, letting her climb in the window like she's done so many times before. It's bitterly cold out, and Quinn is clad only in a ratty old hoodie she's pulled over her long blonde hair and a pair of ripped jeans. Quinn! I close the window and stand in front of her, waiting for her sapphire eyes to meet mine. This is nothing new. I've known Quinn since I was four and wound up in a temporary foster home after my mom was arrested for soliciting an undercover police officer for a blowjob in exchange for her choice of drug, meth with a hint of danger. Good old mom. I was only in foster care for a few days that time, for as long as it took my mom to wiggle her way out on a technicality. But in the short time I was there, a bond was made with Quinn that I'm sure can never be broken. She offered me her goldfish crackers when she noticed me sitting alone in the corner, skinny and shivering with fear, crying to go home. Her big blue eyes were the first thing I saw as her little face poked into my space, and then she held the small pouch of crackers out and told me, and I quote, Toughen up, buttercup. And that was it. I wiped my pathetic tears, straightened my back, and acted like she was crazy before taking some of the crackers to satisfy my growling stomach. Quinn, it turned out, had been in foster care since she was two, when her junkie mother overdosed, and Quinn became a ward of the state of Kansas. She was in the temporary foster home because she set off a couple of fire alarms in a store and ran away from her last foster mom, and they needed a place to stash her until they could find a place for the little Hellraiser. After that, she and I couldn't escape one another. On my first day of kindergarten, the little girl in pigtails sitting at the desk next to mine was none other than the goldfish-eating, devilish angel herself, Quinn Foster. Ironic last name, right? It was destiny. The girl was set up to live her life in a system. And after that, our paths had been nearly identical, along with Reese and Sean, two other lifers we met along the way. All of us had the same thing in common, shitty parents who couldn't care less about us or more about getting high. Quinn's chin tilts up, and her eyes meet mine, confirming what I thought I'd seen when she was climbing up the fire escape. Her right eye is swollen and watery, the impact from a fist more than evident. I'll kill him. She shakes her head sadly, not saying a word. Not having to. We've been through this so many times. Her foster father is a mean drunk. Well, he's a mean sober person, but he unleashes holy hell when he's had a few, and his target is always Quinn. She walks to my mattress, scooting to the corner, and leaning back against the hard wall, lifting one of my earbuds and placing it in her ear, listening to my playlist before tossing it back down. I need to teach you what real music is. Quinn loves the classics and doesn't have much tolerance for newer music of any kind. I lay down on the bed, my head next to her legs that are pulled up to her chest as I look up at the dingy ceiling. School me, oh wise one. I grab the old battered acoustic guitar next to my bed and hand it to her. It was a gift from me, Sean, and Reese for her 13th birthday, and we may have obtained it in a not-so-legal way. Okay, a totally illegal, risky, stupid way, but... We're street kids, right? Who among us doesn't have one or two shoplifting escapades under their belt? Besides, the owner of that pawn shop has been ripping people off for decades, and this guitar belongs to Quinn. The asshole was going to throw it out until he realized Quinn wanted it and then tried to charge her $200 for it. Fuck him. The strings were busted and the body was cracked, but Sean is really handy with that kind of stuff. He's a savant in fixing and tuning instruments. His grandmother taught him before she died, and for whatever reason, it stuck with him. Not the best skill to have when you literally come from nothing, but in this case, it came in handy. She loves this guitar, and keeps it here with me because she knows I'll protect it with my life. 
We all know to keep as little with us as we can when we go into the system because the chances of coming out with any of it are slim. Quinn strums the strings with fingers that are still blue from being out in the cold winter night. She stops, shaking her fingers in front of her. Too cold. My fingers won't work when they're freezing. It's not much warmer in the apartment than it is outside. Getting high is a hell of a lot more important to my mother than paying the gas bill. I sit up and take Quinn's small soft hands in mine, cupping them and pulling them to my mouth. Her eyebrow quirks up, but she doesn't pull away as I blow hot air between my hands that are encompassing hers. I lift my eyes, meeting hers. A strange expression is playing on her pretty face that I can't decipher as our gazes lock while my breath warms her icy hands. Better? My voice is low and husky. She nods her head, but still doesn't pull away. Thank you. I pull back from the weird trance I was in with my best friend and slowly release her before lying back down. A few beats later, her magical fingers are making that run-down guitar her bitch. The sound she can pull from that beat-up old thing is beyond me, but that's Quinn. The girl is pure magic. Her soft, raspy voice fills the room as she plays an old Fleetwood Mac song, her version of Landslide causing honest-to-God goosebumps to form across my cool skin under my hoodie. When she's finished, she hands me the guitar, and as I place it back in its spot next to my bed, she slides down next to me, staring up at the ceiling, her right hand slipping into my left one. You can't keep letting him get away with this, Quinn. You deserve so much better. Clearly, I don't. This is my life, Logan. She turns her head to look at me, the brightness and size of her dark blue eyes not outshined by the gnarly purple bruise encompassing her right one. Besides, he's not that bad. Tell that to your fucking face. The word fuck doesn't bother Quinn. We aren't typical adolescents. Our middle school has armed guards and metal detectors. We've witnessed drive-by shootings and police chases in our backyards. Prostitutes in the hallways sucking dick for money as we walk to our apartments after school. A little bad language is nothing new to either of us. I'm serious, Logan. So he gets a little pissy on Friday nights after losing money at the casino. This one actually has a job rather than collecting the government check. I share a room with only two other girls. She shifts uncomfortably next to me. And other than a couple of beatings, he pretty much keeps his hands to himself. I roll to my side, propping my head up on my elbow. A little pissy? Quinn, your face is battered all to hell. She rolls to her side, unbothered. Bull, I'm perfect. I smile tucking a long strand of her straw-colored hair back into her hoodie. She really is. True, but you need to tell someone so it doesn't happen again. She snorts. What world do you live in? Who exactly am I going to tell, Wally? I don't even blink at her outdated Leave it to Beaver reference. There weren't a ton of television channels available to us over the years. No one we know can afford anything but basic cable or an antenna. The cops who hate my ass and would love nothing better than to send me the juvie because they're convinced I'll end up like my mom, or the social workers, who I have done nothing but give extra work to since I was two. Some of the social workers aren't so bad. She tilts her head in astonishment. Logan, no. Besides, I could end up somewhere way worse than this one. No way. I lay my head back down flat on the pillow in a huff. Fuck, Quinn. I can't stand to see you like this. What if it goes further next time? It won't. I feel her shrug next to me, even if I can't actually see it. Or it will. Fate, Logan. It's a motherfucker. I scoff, but can't fight the laugh. I've never actually heard her say motherfucker before, and it sounded strange coming from her beautiful lips. True. Look at me. Her voice is low and raspy, and for whatever reason, it sends an inexplicable chill through my body and it takes me a moment to actually turn my head to look at her. Her large, doe eyes gaze into mine with something I've never seen before. Vulnerability. We never show it, not even to each other. It's too dangerous for kids like us to show weakness of any kind. Kiss me. It's half command and half question, and I'm almost completely positive my eyeballs just leapt from their sockets in shock, leaving the rest of me completely immobile. What? No. She doesn't look surprised or hurt. She's completely calm and unaffected. Logan, don't be a baby. We are best friends, right? Right, 
That's why there's no way in hell I'm going to kiss you. She turns more to her side, allowing her to face me. That's why you have to kiss me. I shake my head like a psycho, still stunned by her request. Quinn is one of the guys. Granted, a smaller, feminine, pretty guy, but still. No matter what toll puberty has started to take on our bodies and unholy hormones, I can't see her as anything other than that. It's not right. No fucking way. Drop it. Her face, which I realize has somehow overnight started to morph into high cheekbones, long eyelashes, and pouty, incredibly luscious full lips, moves near my own as a gulp catches in my throat. I need this. I wouldn't ask if it weren't important to me. My words are caught in my throat for what seems like an eternity before I finally croak out a lame, Why? She's deadly serious, her voice quiet, yet still confident. I have five years left in foster care. Five. I'm not stupid. I know this isn't the last home I'll be in, not by a long shot. She shakes her head, seemingly brushing off a chilling thought, her eyes locking on mine. I just want to make certain that I have all control of whose lips touch mine first. I swallow hard as I stare at her, knowing what she means, and it sends fury through my body. If anyone ever puts their lips or anything else on you without you wanting it, I'll kill the motherfucker. I've never meant any words more than I mean these. Her hand brushes my cheek, the contact sparking something deep inside me. I know. Just do this for me. You're the best friend I've ever had. You're the only person who's ever made me feel safe. Do this for me. I can't believe I'm even considering this. I've never kissed a girl. I've never wanted to, but... Shit. No, I can't do this. Quinn. Don't make me ask Reese. Who knows where that ass hat has been, and Sean is too sweet. My blood boils at the thought, and my hand lands on her hip, pulling her closer to me. Don't you fucking dare. It's an intense growl that comes deep from my chest. I've never felt so possessive over anything in my life. Then toughen up, buttercup, and kiss me. My eyes search hers, and I know she's serious. I give in, starting to lean in, but her small hand pushes my chest back. I start to panic, thinking maybe she was just messing with me. Wait, you haven't kissed someone yet and just not told me, right? What? No. I tell Quinn everything. Okay, good. If I kiss you, I'll be kissing everyone you have, or so they say, and I just wanted to know what kind of nasty skank I'd be kissing. You're kind of messing with the mood, Quinn. She writes her shoulders and nods her head. Right, sorry. Kiss me. She looks right into my eyes, focused and determined. This is my best friend. The girl I've known practically my whole life. Those eyes. I know those eyes better than anyone's. Solid blue, no flecks of any color in them. Dark and stormy, beautiful eyes. Fuck. I run a hand over my face in frustration. Close your eyes. What? She looks at me like I'm completely ridiculous, which I admit I am. Just do it. She huffs, but closes her eyes, and I do the same, leaning forward slowly until my nose brushes hers. My heart is racing, and I'm convinced it's going to jump out of my mouth and run the hell away from this insane situation. But when Quinn puffs out a frustrated breath and is about to bitch at me again for being a wuss, I mash my lips against her full ones. She lets out a surprise yelp because the pressure was far too much, and my inexperience is showing. But as I pull back, she presses forward her soft lips fusing with mine, and her arms lacing around my neck. Her lips part only slightly, and I grow bolder, using my tongue to explore her mouth. It's sloppy, but something in that kiss gives me something I've never had. Hope. Somehow kissing Quinn makes me feel as if someday, we might be doing this not in a dingy-ass apartment, with her having a black eye and my mom fucking some random guy for drugs. That may be, just maybe we can get through this hell together, possibly having this without all of that. We pull away, our eyes still clouded with lust and confusion, and my hand sweeps over her cheek as I hold it there. Five years is nothing, as long as we stick together. Promise? Promise. I'll always be here for you, Quinn, for whatever you need, whenever you need it. She smiles, and her forehead meets mine. I promise you the same, whatever and whenever.
I tuck her in my arms and give her my phone in one earbud as I tuck the other in my own ear, letting her browse through songs I've downloaded using one of the neighbor's Wi-Fi. Because fuck paying the bill for internet, too. Right, Mom? I close my eyes as Quinn selects a Janis Joplin playlist and settles into my arms. As long as I have Quinn, I'll be okay. Chapter 1. Logan. 18 years old. Eat! Jillian places a plate full of pancakes, eggs, and bacon in front of me before adding a bowl of cut fruit and oatmeal next to the overflowing plate. Oh, how things have changed in the last four years. Thanks, Jill. But seriously? You know I'm only one guy, right? My stepmom, which is still really fucking weird to say, but she's married to my father, sits down, sipping water from her glass, and giving me her best no-nonsense look. You're an 18-year-old boy, and I've seen you consume more food than that. I chuckle and pick up a piece of bacon, chomping on it. Jillian is actually great, and as far as stepmoms go, I lucked out. But someone making me breakfast is something I still can't get used to. Growing up, I was lucky if I could find an old Pop-Tart to gnaw on before walking to school. Now, I'm sitting in a kitchen bigger than the biggest apartment I ever lived in with my mom, with a hot three-course breakfast sitting in front of me with freshly fucking squeezed orange juice to wash it all down, as well as a brand new Mustang in the driveway for me to drive to my fancy rich kid school. Things have changed. For the better, most would say yes. Me? I'm not sure the price of being haunted by betrayal is worth any of it. But I can't say that to my pretty, kind stepmother, who actually gives a fuck. I mean, she gives all the fucks. This woman is determined to make sure I'm okay, and has been since day one. Jillian is, get this, a social worker. Twisted fate, right? I met her the same time I met my father. My real father, not some asshole fucking my mom for a semi-extended period. The guy who had just barely turned 18 and fucked my mom in a racing trailer once when she was in college, and then said, see you later. I mean, I'm sure most of us aren't conceived in candlelight, surrounded by rose petals or some shit like you see in those bullshit romantic movies that Jillian likes, but that's pretty shitty. Makes sense my life started off in a fucked up way, though. My mom never told me any of this. She never really told me much about my father. Philip, the racing Casanova himself, told me all of this over 14 years later. And the story gets way more twisted. Turns out, Philip was just starting his professional racing career, and an unplanned pregnancy kind of fucked up his image. Couldn't have that. Not for the Adamsons. Apparently, racing is in their DNA. Philip's dad, Mitch, is some kind of racing legend, and Philip and his brother Levi followed suit. Image was everything. So Mitch, who I've never met, but if I listen to most of his children other than my own father, that's not a bad thing took matters into his own hands when my mom showed up pregnant with his grandchild. Mitch decided to take the fall for young Philip and sign my birth certificate. Still with me? Yeah. Fucked. Up. I told ya. My mom went along with this because there was a big fat check in it for her every month, which we all know now went straight to her habit. Philip went on with his life, had a kick-ass career, and as far as I know, forgot I was ever born. But fate really is a motherfucker, and when I got into some shit, everything came to light. And for whatever reason, Philip stepped up. And he really did. Over the last four years, he's legally taken custody of me. There was even a DNA test to prove that he is, in fact, my real father. He then married Jillian, and she became my stepmother. I've met the rest of their crazy, fucked-up family. Levi, who I mentioned, is the oldest, and has now started managing younger racers, and has retired from racing. But not before he married his stepmom, who was apparently married to Mitch at one point, and is also, get this, Jillian's sister. Yeah, you just can't make that shit up. Some serious Jerry Springer shit. But they have kids now and seem happy. Leslie, the next in line of Mitch's spawn, is a badass sports reporter and married to Cash Phillips, another racer and former addict. Cash tried to help my mom, but alas, the addiction runs strong in that one, and she's a lost cause. Although he won't give up, and neither will Philip and Jillian. Then, in the middle, is Chris. 
who's the one I bonded with the quickest and was pretty much the only reason I didn't run for the hills. Chris is the only one who didn't choose a career in racing and instead has his own tattoo shop. The guy is a legend in his own right. People fly in from all over Kansas to get his ink on their skin. And since I happen to be fond of sketching and not half bad at it, he's been showing me the ropes at a shop. He thinks I have a gift. And although I'm inclined to call bullshit, even I have to admit, I'm not half bad. Philip is next in the succession of Adamson kids. And then the youngest is Evie. She works at the track in some promotion gig, but honestly, I haven't been around her much. Evie kind of steers clear of the rest for whatever reason. It's none of my business. They're all fucking insane. But for the most part, they've climbed into my cold, dark heart, and I do care about them. It doesn't stop me from feeling the numbing guilt seated deep in my soul, though. And I'm pretty sure nothing will. Still, because they're still trying after four years, I'm trying too. They definitely make it hard to forget I'm a miserable fucker. You gonna tell me why the big-ass breakfast? I quirk an eyebrow, just as Philip walks into the kitchen. Designer jeans, sneakers, that cost more than a month or two's rent back in the day, and a big happy grin, and grabs a cup of coffee. Morning, sunshine, he says brightly, and then turns to Jillian. And you too. She rolls her eyes at him, and tosses a grape from her fruit bowl at him. But she's smiling, because Jillian is always smiling these days. She turns back to me. I make you breakfast every day. Yeah, I know, but not always like this. I gesture to the monstrous amount of food in front of me, mischief swimming in my veins. I think you finally decided to tell me you broke down and let him impregnate you. Jillian nearly spits her water out, and Philip tosses a few grapes at me. Little shit. He's laughing, and Jillian looks shocked as she gapes at me with wide eyes. How did you know that? She cringes. And did you really have to word it that way? I take another bite and lean back in my chair, two of the four legs lifting from the marble floor. Yup, fucking gross, right? Philip walks over to the table and pushes the chair back to all four legs on the floor. Watch your mouth. I gawk at him. Fuck is an Adamson go-to word. I wouldn't be surprised if they invented it generations ago. And then I turn and look at Jillian, rolling my eyes. Jillian doesn't want me to use profanity. And Philip is pretty much her bitch. You guys are really terrible at keeping secrets. I've watched Philip baby you more than usual. That gets the finger from Philip from his spot behind Jillian before I laugh and continue. He's been rubbing your stomach instead of groping your ass. And you've been avoiding wine and jumping up at every meal to run to the bathroom. Doesn't take a genius. Jillian, being Jillian, laughs it off easily. I'm seriously a dick to her. Constantly challenging her rules, sneaking girls in and letting them stay the night, breaking curfew often, and she couldn't care less about me being a shithead. She just talks to me about why those rules are important, occasionally grounds me, and then moves on, continuing to love me. She's convinced there's good in me somewhere. Why? I have no idea. I'm sorry we didn't tell you sooner. I wasn't sure how to tell you. Why? I'm happy for you guys. I mean, if that's what you want. I shrug my shoulders, unsure why anyone would procreate on purpose. She smiles, looking down at her loose shirt, no doubt to hide the baby bump. It's just, I don't want you to... I know exactly where this is going, and it makes me uncomfortable as hell. Sometimes they forget who I was for the first 14 years of my life and try to go all full house on me. Look, I don't need the whole speech. I'm not a four-year-old who you need to reassure that mommy and daddy still love, even if they bring another kid in. Daddy is about to kick your ass, Philip growls. But yet again, it's playful. He would never fucking lay a hand on me, and somehow, I know it. I chuckle, and then look at Jillian. Seriously, I know you're not kicking me out as soon as this kid comes into the world. I'll have to beg you to let me go. But if you're happy, I'm happy. Jillian smiles and places her hand over mine on the table, her kind eyes almost too much to handle. She just cares so fucking much. Thank you. I am definitely happy to start filling up this ridiculously big house. And I've seen your baby pictures. I know somehow, even with Philip as the father, this kid is gonna be cute. The jab to Philip makes me laugh again, something I've definitely started doing a hell of a lot more. But then I turn to her, puzzled. You've seen my baby pictures? I can't imagine my mom, Jana, keeping anything. 
Jillian looks slightly guilty as she takes another sip of water. From your file, there was one. I nod, unsure why she looks so damn guilty. I know I have a file. So, why do you look like I kicked your puppy? She shrugs. I know you don't like to talk about the past. Philip is more of a go-with-the-flow kind of guy. Most of the men in my new life are. But the women, Jesus Christ, they love to dig. And she's right. I'm not a fucking fan of digging up the past. True. I stand up, leaving most of my breakfast untouched. Where are you going? Philip questions as he sits next to Jillian at the table. I'm getting an hour in at Chris's shop before school. I'll see you guys later. Congrats again. Wait. Jillian takes my hand before I can make my escape. I need to talk to you about something else. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go. I take a seat. What? Jana's back? Since losing custody of me, my mother has been in and out of fancy rehabs paid for by Philip and Jillian more times than I can count. Always leaving early, disappearing into thin air, and then showing up back here strung out and looking for another chance. Which they grant. And I seem to be the only one against that. And no matter how many times she begs to see me, I refuse. I want no part of it. She shakes her head. No, we still haven't heard anything from her. Good. What then? I study her, trying to figure out what she's getting at. Have you decided about college? Oh, fuck me, not today. I have two weeks left of high school, and Jillian has been trying like hell to get me to go to college since we met. She thinks I have some sort of brilliant mind or some shit. Jillian, don't take that tone with her. You know it's important. Philip, who went from high school straight to racing, pipes up, which screams hypocrisy, but I don't point it out. Jillian, I told you, I don't think college is for me. I get that. I do. I know that you want to be a tattoo artist, and believe me, I think you are incredibly gifted at that. But college is an incredible experience. It's one I had to make a deal with the devil himself to get, but I know I'm lucky to have gone. Mitch paid for her college. What she had to do for him in exchange for it, I don't ask, because I don't want to know. Look, I'm glad you liked college, and you kind of needed it for your line of work, but me? I place my hand on my chest. I don't. Think about it, please. Her eyes are too fucking much, all full of hope and pleading. I turn to look at Philip who knows I'm fucked. Okay, I'll think about it. She smiles brightly as she jumps up from the table and hugs my neck. Thank you. That's all I ask, and thankfully the colleges you are accepted to have agreed to hold your spot until June. I have a month to decide. I'm off. See you guys later. Home by 10. I hear Jillian as I walk out the front door. Things have really fucking changed. Chapter 2. Logan I hit the lock button on the keys of my two-year-old, sleek, black Mustang and step onto the sidewalk in front of my Uncle Chris's shop. I stare at the car Philip and Jillian bought for my 16th birthday. It's likely that my childhood friends' sweet 16s were completely forgotten by their foster parents. But me? I had a huge party at the country club, topped off with car keys being handed to me. Who the fuck am I? I try to shake it off and pull open the door to the shop, a bell dinging over my head when I do. Chris has done well for himself. The shop will be full soon, and I'm surprised no one is lined up at the door waiting. The shop is just a hole in the wall in downtown Kansas City, but it's fucking popular. You would think it would be flashy as hell, with a big-ass sign letting everyone know exactly what it is, but it doesn't even have a sign, just the address. That's Chris for you. Levi, Philip, and Leslie are flashy as fuck. They wear their privilege on their sleeves and flaunt the fuck out of it. But Chris is the more laid-back one. Maybe it's why I connected with him first. Years of hating anyone with money, envying them for seemingly having no struggle whatsoever, had left me bitter and resentful of my father's money. I'm working on it, but it's a fight every day. You're late. I smile when I hear Chris's voice before he appears from the back of the shop. Yeah, I know. I got stuck in a heart-to-heart -heart with Philip and Jillian. His fingers casually run through his hair as he chuckles lightly. Oh, fuck. His bright blue eyes, that resemble mine in an uncanny way, meet mine. They finally tell you? 
Chris and I have been joking for weeks about when Jillian and Philip were finally going to tell me they're having a kid. Yeah. He shakes his head, directing me back to the table in the lounge as we both take a seat, sketch pads and pencils in front of us. Christ, we've all been telling them you'd be fine. I laugh and pick up a pencil, absently sketching, dragging the dark lead over the creamy paper. I love that sound. Yeah, it was a little ridiculous. They care. They just don't want you to think they're trying to replace you or some shit. He nudges my arm. I knew you were more secure than that. I didn't think that, but anyway, that wasn't it. He chuckles again. Oh shit, what else? The C word. He stares at me, one eyebrow cocked, and I add, college. Ah, that C word. I roll my eyes as he watches my hand absently sketch. And? I shrug my shoulders. And nothing. I'm not going to college. Why waste their money on an education I don't need? He picks up a pencil of his own, but doesn't put it to the paper. Look, I didn't go to college, and I'm no hypocrite, but maybe you could get something from it. And Philip and Jillian have the money. It won't be putting them out. It's still a waste. Fuck that. I spent four years around preppy rich kids with trust funds and everything handed to them since birth. I think I'm good. He shakes his head, the disappointment palpable. You need to learn that money isn't necessarily a bad thing, kid. There are rich assholes, and there are poor assholes. Same goes for good people. And college isn't just for the rich. You're smart, kid. Maybe you would enjoy the experience. I know what I want to do, and it doesn't require a college education. He places a hand on my shoulder. Listen to me. You're my nephew. I'll train you whenever you want, be it now or four years from now. If you want to go to college and have that under your belt, tattoos will wait for you. You have an undeniable talent that isn't going anywhere. I'm not going. I just need to find a way to tell Jillian. He shrugs it off now and starts to draw on the paper in front of him. Nicely. That woman really cares about your ass. And it's crippling sometimes. I know. I care about her too. He nods his head in acknowledgement. You ready for graduation? Fuck, you are really talkative today. Chris is usually the strong, silent type, something I admire and understand, but today he is fucking chatty as hell. Listen, shithead, you have a lot of big changes coming up. I'm your uncle, I'm allowed to ask. I huff in defeat. Yes, I'm more than ready to graduate from that hellhole. That raises his eyebrow. Philip makes it sound like you're the king of the fucking castle there, like you rule the school. That's because I do. When I first moved in with Philip and started going there, I was in so many fucking fights. The first day, some asshole gave me shit about my raggedy-ass tennis shoes and wouldn't let up. They knew who my father was and couldn't understand why my shoes were literally falling apart. Philip begged me to change them. He bought me so many pairs of brand new name-brand shoes, but I wouldn't relent. It was the only thing I had left tying me to my old life, and there was no way I was letting rich pricks change me. My car keys jingle in my pocket as I shift in my seat. Well, at least not that year. Living with Philip, slowly but surely, I had begun to morph into someone more like them, and yet I'll always be an outsider. I'm also the guy the girls at school sought out so they could try to clean me up and change me. The guys think I give them some sort of badass edge by being near me, as if being in my presence gives them a leg up in life, unshelters them in some way. And I do fucking rule that school, but it isn't with victory. It's not a title I want or care about, and I'm ready to leave it behind. I just shrug with no real explanation, because that's all I need to do with Chris, who thankfully goes back to his normal, silent self, while we sketch quietly until the rest of the tattoo artists report to work. The growing popularity of the shop hasn't changed the amount of staff Chris has either, He trusts few people. There's Jay, a big son of a bitch, but who's usually joking around and is generally a happy guy. Then there's Ty, who's younger than Chris and Jay by, like, a decade, and is the playful one of the bunch. They call him Pretty Boy because of his boyish good looks, and they think it bothers him. I don't. I think he eats that shit up and uses tattooing more to get pussy than anything else. And then there's Frankie, who is badass. Seriously, this chick scares us all. She's the boss even if Chris owns the place, but Chris happily lets her run it. He just wants to sketch and tattoo. 
the business part isn't much for him, and he has a wife and kids at home who take up most of his time. Seriously, how the fuck can you drink that shit? Frankie stares at Ty's protein drink with disgust. Ty winks at her and gestures to his chest proudly. You know you want me, Frankie. He blows a kiss to her, and I'm pretty sure his balls are about to be removed, but she just rolls her eyes. Dream on, asshole. Jay grabs Ty around the neck and ruffles his hair playfully, easily five inches taller than Ty because, again, he's a big motherfucker. He dwarfs Ty, who is slightly taller than average. Ah, that's so fucking cute. Trying to bulk up and be more like me. He releases him. Never gonna happen. Ty fixes his hair, raising his middle finger, and Frankie again rolls her eyes at their childish antics. You both are fucking morons. This shop has become my home. It's where I spend most of my free time, and I'm ready to graduate so I can start working here full time. Now how the fuck can I break it to the woman that has been the only thing resembling a mother to me? Chapter 3. Logan. Holy shit, Logan! Blair's voice screeches in the air as her full fake tits bounce in front of me, her hips sending me into my own orgasm, even though her over-the-top theatrics in bed get on my nerves. She's fucking hot. I'm an 18-year-old guy, and she's riding my cock. I should care that her parents are downstairs, but I don't give a flying fuck. When we finish, she collapses on her back next to me, her right arm over her eyes. Fuck. I have no idea how you are so fucking good at sex already, but I'm really happy I found you. I dispose of the condom in the trash can next to her bed and pull my jeans up. Found me. Jesus, like I was a lost puppy that wandered up to her. She pursued me relentlessly from our freshman year until I finally gave in and fucked her at some bullshit party I didn't want to be at at the end of sophomore year. Blair represents everything I hate, all in one person. A privileged trust fund baby who has let daddy's money fund her perfect popular teenage persona. She's the reigning queen of high school with her designer clothes, shiny new car, manicured nails, and a boob job for her 16th birthday. She's a cliche. And I feed into it, the boy from the wrong side of the tracks. I'm the dirty boy she brings home to fuck her in her pink bedroom while her dad sits downstairs, working on his phone as she desperately tries to get his attention. Classic. And yet, I don't hate her. I should. Blair is a fucking bitch who treats most people like they're beneath her. But she doesn't try to change me. She doesn't want to clean me up. She isn't looking for a husband to better. Nah, she's using me as much as I'm using her. I'm a dick to ride and salt in the wound to her father for spending more time at work and with a mistress, who everyone knows about but never talks about, than at home with her and her equally vapid mother. I sit on the edge of her bed, wondering how long I need to stick around after coming this time, as she pulls her dress on over her head lazily and picks up her phone, glances at it, and laughs. What? Her fingers glide across her phone, sending a message before she drops the phone on her mattress and climbs to me, draping her arms around my neck. That was Melody, and guess what? She doesn't wait. She never does. She found her dream lover. I roll my eyes not remotely interested in their teenage love story bullshit. And again, Blair couldn't care less. She continues even if she knows I don't give a damn. She met this guy at a fucking football game this year. They had like this amazing time. She swears it was the best night of her life. This guy promised her the world, told her he's never felt that way about anyone before. Typical. And knowing Melody, she fell for it hook, line, and sinker. I yawn and pull my tea over my head as she continues. Anyway, the party ends, and she wakes up in this shitty place all alone. I think I was with you, and since you won't go to football games, yeah, I wasn't there. But I picked her up the next day. Man, this girl can fucking talk. So, what does this have to do with now? She stands up from her bed, walking over to the mirror above her dresser, picking up a hairbrush, and running it through her tangled locks. Chill out, dickhead, I'm getting there. She rolls her eyes at my reflection in the mirror, and then continues her ridiculous retelling. Anyway, Mel, being Mel, is totally obsessed and heartbroken. She can't believe he just left her there, all used and shit. So the bitch has been obsessed. She puts the brush down and grabs her lipstick, applying the red stain to her lips. Seriously, she goes to every game, she's been all over Facebook, she can't find him, until tonight. 
make it stop. I go ahead and ask the next question to speed this up. Where? Southwest High is having a big-ass party tonight. It's all over, and apparently everyone will be there. So we're going. Now she has my attention. My back straightens, and the dinner Jillian made earlier tonight threatens to come back up. Why the fuck would you guys want to go to a Southwest party? That's way too far over the other side of the tracks for your country club asses to go. She raises her manicured middle finger in the air as she turns around to face me. First of all, fuck you. Second of all, her dream guy was definitely from there. That's who our team got their asses handed to them by that night at the football game. Fuck. No, no, no. Southwest High is only a few blocks from the last apartment I lived in with my mom, and it's a fucking rough neighborhood. These two prisses will never be welcome down there. You two are fucking crazy. You realize that's down on truth, right? That's the real world, sweetie. Trust me, you two will be pissing in your designer dresses. Please drop this. She flops down on the bed next to me. Don't be so dramatic, Logan. They're high school students throwing a party at some abandoned old drive-in movie theater, whatever the fuck that is. I swallow. I know exactly where she is talking about. We used to ride our bikes there. The last place I saw Quinn. Tell her no. She laughs. Yeah, right. I turn and look at her, deadly serious. I mean it, Blair. She rolls her eyes and checks her phone again. She's on her way. And you know, Mel, when she's chasing the D, there's no stopping her. And I'm not letting her go alone. Then tell her not to go at all. Again, she's definitely going. If you're that worried, why don't you just go with us? She shrugs her shoulders and pouts her lips. They aren't going to do anything bad to us if we have one of them behind us. I'm not one of them anymore. And they damn sure won't want to see my face down there. She shrugs as she looks out her bedroom window when headlights shine through. Mel's here. You coming or not? Fuck. I can't let them go down there alone. Why? I have no fucking clue. Part of me wants them to be fed to the wolves, but I can't do it. I stand up, pissed off, and even if I don't want to admit it, slightly terrified as I stand next to Blair. Fine, we'll all go, but we don't stay long, just long enough for her to do a clean sweep and see that asshole is long gone. And we come back here to the land of parents, Mercedes, and Starbucks. Got it? She rolls her eyes exaggeratedly, and then nods. Whatever, you're so fucking boring now. What the hell happened to that wrong side of the tracks bad boy I started out fucking? Maybe all your designer perfume is killing that side of me. She ignores me, grabs my hand, and leads me downstairs and past her father, who doesn't acknowledge us before we walk outside. I guess Chris was kind of right. Bad parenting can certainly exist on both sides of the economic spectrum. Melody is busy adding more makeup to her already too made up face when we reach her new BMW convertible. Who the fuck needs a convertible in Kansas? I'm driving. Melody looks at me with irritation and tilts her head in Blair's direction. What the fuck, Blair? You invited your little boy toy to come along? Blair flips her long hair over her shoulder, unbothered. Listen, maybe he knows you're stud. You never know, and it can't hurt having him tag along. Jesus, why is this my life? I hit the button, unlocking my car and climb in not being able to take one more minute of Melody's whining. Not long after, both girls climb into my car with Mel in the back, her arms folded in a huff. You better not mess this up for me, Logan. I have to see him again. I start the car and pull out of the posh, well-manicured neighborhood. Melody, I don't get it. What about this guy has you so dick-whipped you're willing to go to the ghetto of KC to find him? It's a genuine question, I ask. These girls are groomed from day one to stay away from areas like the one we are driving toward. I wonder if they would notice if I drove them out to the country instead. Turn left here, Logan, Melody directs. Fucking GPS is on every fucking electronic device known to man now. And why the hell do you care? You don't strike me as romantic. I'm not. Exactly. So I'm not wasting our beautiful story on you. Lyric's story and mine is only for the true romantics. I glance over to Blair, who is laughing, before I catch Melody's completely serious expression in my rearview mirror. Lyric, are you shitting me? She shrugs. That's his name, asshole, and it's destiny. 
lyric, and melody. It's a match made in musical heaven. Bullshit. There's no way that's his real name. Fuck you, Logan. It is. Oh, yeah? Who introduced themselves first? Her eyebrows furrow. Why does it matter? Bingo, she did. Because it's a fake name. He's fairly quick-witted, though. I'll give him that. Fuck you, Logan. She glares at me, and Blair just shakes her head knowingly. But she's not going to argue with Mel. The number of coffee houses and restaurants starts to diminish and is replaced by run-down gas stations and dilapidated houses that should have been torn down years ago. But I'd bet money they have several people squatting in them. I watch Blair's face as she takes in the new area in the dark of the night. Still time to turn around. She scoffs. Please. Five minutes later, we're on the outskirts, far away from anything resembling what they're used to, and I turn down the dark gravel road leading out to the abandoned outdoor theater. The old screen that used to feature a different movie every summer weekend in the 70s and 80s is still there, but it's dark and torn by the elements, with large red letters spelling fuck across it in spray paint. It's exactly how I remember it. Cars parked all around, a bonfire in the middle. Cops don't bother coming out here. What the fuck do they care if a bunch of street kids and felons overdose on booze and drugs? It's far enough from anything that they don't really have to deal with it. I park my car, aware of all the eyes landing on the shiny black Mustang, far too new to fit in here. Fuck. Five minutes, I mean it. I bark the warning to both girls as they exit the car all three of us sticking out like sore thumbs in the tattered crowd that swarms us almost instantly. Really fucking epically bad idea. What's your lyric look like, Melody? You see him? I ask wearily, as all eyes remain on us in the car. I recognize a few faces, but I'm not sure they do right away. Melody, the fucking chwit, stares dreamily through the crowd. He's the most beautiful boy I've ever seen, with smooth mocha skin and sparkling green eyes. Of course, a perfect six-pack, and... I can't take any more of her romantic comedy rambling. Mel, shut the fuck up. Do you see him right in front of you? She huffs and looks through the crowd, and shakes her head, starting to walk forward. A husky fucker I don't recognize stops her, putting both hands on her shoulders. Where the fuck are you going, princess? Mel lifts an eyebrow, pushing his fat hand off her right shoulder with disgust, which is only going to get her in trouble down here. Bad fucking idea. Shit. What the hell was I thinking? Years living around yuppies has left me fucking stupid. I'm going to find my soulmate. That sends the crowd into a fit of laughter. The guy who still has a hold of her left shoulder gestures out into the mix of people. Here? You're fucking lost, sweetheart. My guess is your soulmate is more than likely at the mall or has blown his brains out from fucking boredom already. Mel gasps, offended, and I step next to her. You have anyone here named Lyric? He studies me, probably trying to decide if I'm high, and laughs again. I turn the mail. See? Not here. Let's go. I turn back toward my car, and then I'm stopped dead in my tracks, gasping for air, as I stare right into the darkest blue eyes I've ever seen. Quinn. Chapter 4. Logan. Logan? Her beautiful eyes study me with horror and a fury I've never seen in her eyes before. It sends a chill through my body, but I stand straight, staring directly into my past. Quinn. She looks different. Older, but still the same. Her once long, blonde hair has been cut to her shoulders, and she's wearing a blue beanie that matches her dark, stormy eyes that are now lined with black eyeliner. I've never seen Quinn wearing makeup, but it's not caked on. The eyeliner makes her large blue eyes stand out even more. She's wearing a plain white t-shirt, dark jeans, and of course, Converse tennis shoes that are more than likely stolen, whether by her or someone else, who knows. Fuck you. Her eyes narrow as she glares with hatred that cuts through me like a knife. I've spent so many nights over the last four years wondering if she hates me. Now I know. Two words and her demeanor told me everything. What the hell? You know her? I hear Blair's voice next to me, but I don't move. My eyes are glued on Quinn, who has started to take off, but I follow her, desperately seeking her out, fearful of letting her walk away without giving her some sort of explanation. I catch up quickly, a few feet away, and grab her elbow, turning her to face me. Quinn, 
I can explain. She yanks out of my hold. I don't want to hear it. She points back to the area where I left Melody and Blair. Get back in your fancy, ridiculous car and drive back to your new life. Quinn, I didn't have a choice. Her eyes narrow and her arms cross. Bull shit. It's true. I don't want to care. I'm not supposed to. I should be completely dead inside by now. But the way she's looking at me, like a traitor, rips out my insides. She walks away again, and again I follow, our shoes crunching the gravel below our feet. She spins around on one foot, halting my steps. I thought you were dead, or locked up, or in serious fucking trouble. I swallow the bile rising in my throat, and her eyes lock on mine. For six months, I thought the worst. I'm sorry. I don't say it. I can see she doesn't want to hear it. She folds her arms again, any trace of the girl I once knew long gone. I wasted so much time trying like hell to find you. Do you know how hard it is to get anyone to take a 14-year-old seriously? And then the chick at Family Services finally took pity on me. And you know what she told me, Logan? She moves forward, nearly standing on her tiptoes to force me to look her in the eyes. She's almost a foot shorter than me now. Quinn. She told me you were with your father. Your real father. Who I didn't even know you knew because you never told me. I didn't know him. Not yet. She rolls her eyes, and I see the bitter cold in them. I don't care. Fuck. She really doesn't. She points over at Melody and Blair. Blair looks pissed off and confused. You didn't even come here to explain and find us. You came here to find someone for little Miss Priss. I didn't know you'd be here, but you fucking are, so let me explain. No. Her eyes say the same answer. There's no question swimming in her expression, no wondering under the surface. No part of her wants to hear anything from me. Headlights shine through the entrance, causing us all to turn as a 30-year-old rusty car pulls up, its loud exhaust commanding attention before the car parks and shuts off. Quinn steps back away from me, her eyes showing concern, or possibly fear, when two large bodies climb out of the car and start walking toward me. I recognize Reese first. Fuck. He got big. But so did I. A lot can change in four teenage years. He looks fucking angry and different. Nothing like the once scrawny street kid he once was, with a playful disdain for the world. Now it's darker. There's anger and full-blown hatred in his eyes as he stalks toward me. Before he makes it to me, I notice Melody running in our direction. Lyric! What the fuck? No way Reese is her dream guy. For one thing, he's fucking pale. Dude needs some sun, not mocha or whatever bullshit color she used to describe him. And I don't see him promising anyone the world. Well, not just anyone. Definitely not someone like Mel. I swallow hard and look at Quinn. The memory of the last time I saw them both twisting my stomach in knots. And then watch as Melody wraps her arms around not Reese's neck, but the guy behind him. Sean. Fuck. Of course it's Sean. He was always the nice one. The romantic. But his green eyes go cold as soon as she grabs him. And he takes her wrists in his hands, removing himself from her grip. Do I know you? Melody looks stunned as she gazes up at him. It's me, Melody. We had that night together in October. Sean laughs. But it's not a happy, kind laughter. It's menacing and cold. A lot has changed. That's so unlike the kid I knew. October? Are you fucking kidding me? I don't even know who I was with last night, and you're coming here and talking about October? It's May, sweetheart. I see the tears shimmering in Melody's eyes, and even I'm shocked at how pissed I am as I walk up to where Sean, Reese, and Melody stand. Blair joins the group at the same time I do. You don't have to be a fucking dick about it. Sean's eyes meet mine, recognition hitting. Logan? Reese glares at me as his sight lands behind me, directly on Quinn. I nod my head. Yeah, it's me. And what the hell happened to you? You were never an asshole to women before. Sean chuckles, anger mixing with the laughter as he touches his chest with his hand. What the hell happened to me? You're joking, right? What the hell happened to you? He stares at my Mustang. You fucking sellout. Come here and judge us in your $200 jeans and $30,000 car. Shame washes over me, and I hope it doesn't show. What the fuck are you doing here? 
Reese finally pulls his gaze from Quinn and looks at me. Melody is nearly sobbing. Lyric, you told me. Sean raises his hands in the air to silence her. I don't know who the fuck Lyric is. If he's half as fucking good looking as me, I get why you're obsessed, but I'm not him. Blair wraps an arm around Melody's neck. Come on, girl. We don't need these dipshits. Melody sniffles. But he told me he never felt like this before. I see a flash in Sean's eyes. It was subtle, and I doubt anyone else picked up on it. But I know in my gut that Melody is telling the truth. Why don't you all get the fuck out of here and go where you belong? Reese eyes me as he walks the Quinn, wrapping an arm around her. My heart clenches in my chest. He's marking his territory, letting me know what's his. Quinn. Her face shows me how lost she is. But she leans into him. So many questions run through my head, but I'm beyond outnumbered. Fights with preppy rich kids at my fancy high school are child's play compared to throwing down here. I chance one last glance at Quinn as I unlock my car and walk with Mel and Blair, climbing inside and driving away in total defeat. You know them? Blair asks as I drive down the dark road. No. And it's the truth. I have no idea who any of those people are anymore. I lost the right to know them a long time ago. Chapter 5 Quinn Logan. I struggle to control my rapid heartbeat as I watch the shiny new Mustang leave the old, run-down drive-in movie theater. I didn't recognize Logan at first. Last time I saw him, he was skinny and lanky, wearing tattered clothes. The boy, no, the man, in front of me tonight was a foot taller than me and had filled out a lot. His t-shirt was clean and crisp and clung on to his sculpted muscles. His blonde hair was perfectly styled and tousled perfectly. His jawline is cut, and though he's always been handsome, he's morphed into a gorgeous man. He looks so different, but his eyes haven't changed. I see blue that cuts through me like a knife. They were the same, but there was darkness in them. Regret. But I didn't want to hear his explanation. Fuck his excuses. There's no excuse for leaving us behind, especially for his fancy new life with his new car, new clothes, and fucking rich bitch girlfriend with fake tits and even more fake attitude. Hope he enjoys going to the mall and listening to the newest pop album. Motherfucker. I can feel Reese's cold eyes on me, studying me. I need to keep myself calm. Logan was the last person I thought I'd see tonight. It's been four years since he vanished. One moment, we were all each other had, and the next, he was gone. Reese punches Sean's arm, and it's not playful. What the fuck did I tell you about fucking those country club bitches? Nothing good can come from that shit. Sean looks pissed off as he shrugs his shoulders, playing it off, but I saw the way he looked at that girl. Something seemed different than his usual shit. It's like his own twisted game, fucking rich girls and then ghosting them. Like a big fuck you to society, but I think that little uppity dumbass got under his skin. Fuck off, Reese. And with that, Sean takes off to join the rest of the party, leaving me alone with Reese, who's glaring at me with fury and suspicion, sending a chill through me as the alcohol on his breath wafts through the air between us. Fuck. I hate when he drinks. Reese is a broken kid like the rest of us. His mom dropped him off at a fire station when he was three, and it was nothing but shitty foster homes after that. But his story isn't unique. That's what we all know. You would think the fact that most of us come from addicts who fucked up their entire lives and ours would keep us all far away from any substances. But the sad truth is it's the only thing that silences the pain of being abandoned like trash. He grabs my arms and starts pulling me toward the old cement bathrooms, shoving me inside. Stop, you're hurting me. I yank away from him and my back scrapes against the stone wall. Did you fuck him? Jesus Christ. Who? Logan. He punches the wall, not even flinching, and I stare at his busted knuckles before my gaze moves to his dilated pupils. You're not just drunk, you're fucking high, aren't you? What the fuck did you take? He cages me in, his hands on either side of my head as my back rests against the wall, and I try not to show fear. 
Reese can be a good guy, but when he's fucked up, he's the worst. That's none of your business. Answer the fucking question. I shake my head and try to push him away from me, but he has my body caged in and there's nowhere to go. No, of course not. Bullshit, Quinn. I saw you two together. You saw us talking for one fucking minute. Back up, splash some water on your face, and pull your head out of your ass. Logan was here for all of five minutes. His eyes are rimmed in red. It's more than likely been days since he slept, and that, mixed with the drugs and alcohol, is a deadly combination. Bullshit, I know you fucked him. You're high. I'm not doing this. I try to pull away again, and I'm met with a deafening slap against my cheek. I stare at him, my face throbbing. Fuck you, asshole. I lift my knee as hard as I can, connecting with his balls, causing him to grunt and stumble back. I run for the door, but he's faster as his hand grabs my hair and pulls me back, his fist connecting with my right eye. Fuck! I scream the word, stopping the sob from coming out. I learned a long time ago not to cry, because no one cares about your tears. Not really. My own mother didn't give a fuck, why would any man? There was a time where I thought it would all be okay. I thought I had five years of hell, and then I would escape. I had Sean, Reese, and Logan, and we would make it. How fucking stupid and naive. Logan left, living the high life and not giving a flying fuck about any of us. Reese and I started dating, and he started drinking and using. Sean started fucking everything that moved and had a trust fund, and everything was lost. Gone were the four friends who had each other's backs, and reality set in. After that, it was every man and woman for themselves. Chapter 6 Logan You heading to Chris's? It's early. Fuck. Philip is up way earlier than normal this morning. I spin on one foot and look at my father, who's sipping coffee out on the porch of our house. Yeah, couldn't sleep. Thought I'd go early. The first part isn't a lie. I haven't been able to stop thinking about Quinn since I saw her Friday night. My entire weekend was consumed by her, the lost look in her eyes, and the anger she spewed. Jillian's gonna be upset you didn't get breakfast. I rest against the ledge of the porch. She really doesn't have to make me breakfast every day. She's pregnant and has a full-time job. He grins. Yeah, but that's not going to slow her down. I didn't think it would. He walks to stand next to me staring up at the sky. You sure you're okay with the whole baby thing? I nod. Of course, I think it's great. Now you have her trapped. She has to put up with your ass. I joke, and he nudges my shoulder with his. Little shit. I chuckle, amused by the back and forth with my father. It's still hard for me to call him dad. Usually I resort to calling him by his name, which doesn't seem to bother him. I gotta get going. He ignores that. You make a decision about college yet? Fuck. What is with everyone being so damn talkative all of a sudden? No. Liar. His blue eyes meet mine. I sigh. I'm not going. There's nothing wrong with a college education. Fuck, you could even go for a year. Your generation, it's like you need the transition year. I'm not really like most of the kids my age. He nods at that not arguing with me. That's true, but maybe this is your chance to have that, the innocence you didn't get growing up. Just be a kid and have fun. I grasp his shoulder and try my best to talk to him without sarcasm or bitterness. You gave me four years of that, and I'm grateful, but I'm ready to start life. He swallows. There's something in his eyes I can't figure out, and he clears his throat. Okay, keep thinking about it, you have time. I nod, agreeing yet again only to pacify them until the time comes when I have to break Jillian's heart. I unlock my car and head off to where I had actually intended to go this morning before school. I may have used the fact that Jillian is a social worker to my advantage last night and hacked into the system to find out the address of Quinn's current foster family. I had to. I have to make sure she is okay. I pull up in front of the small white house with dirt building up on the siding, and a rotted wooden porch in bad need of repair, and turn off the engine. My heart is racing as I climb out of the car and walk carefully up the stairs, 
lifting my hand to knock, just as the door opens and Quinn flies out. What the hell are you doing here? I raise my hands and surrender as she closes the door quietly behind her, and I notice that her face is swollen and bruised. Fuck. Fucking fuck. She's still being abused. Quinn, I just needed to make sure you're okay. I realize how fucking stupid that sounds coming out of my mouth as I stare at her gorgeous face with a split lip and a black eye. Clearly, you're not. She scoffs angrily, crossing her arms over her chest, anger radiating from her. You came to make sure I'm okay? Four fucking years have gone by without so much as a fucking phone call, and now you stop by to make sure I'm okay. Are you fucking delusional? Searing guilt spreads through my chest. I'm sorry I didn't fucking call. No, don't you dare. You don't get to come here and apologize. There is no absolution here for you. Look, if you would just let me explain. Fuck your explanation. Her eyes meet mine, cold and dead. I don't need you, Logan. I stopped needing you four years ago. I'm 18 in two days. I'm graduating and I'm getting the fuck out of here without needing one damn thing from anyone. So fuck off. I'm sorry. Tell someone who gives a damn. I don't want to hear it. She opens the door and walks back inside, shutting down any hope I had of making anything right again. But the nine feeling stays in my gut. I drive back to the burbs and groan when I see Blair's car parked in front of the house. Fuck me. I climb out of my car and walk to hers, rapping on the window. She rolls the window down, her white sunglasses taking up most of her face, her hair straightened and silky. What the fuck are you doing here? She lifts her sunglasses, resting them on top of her head. You're such a fucking dick. She shrugs. Thank God you have a big one. I roll my eyes, but then smirk. And I know how to use it. She bites her bottom lip, and after the morning I've had, it's enticing. That's why I'm here. Thought I could get a quick fuck in before school. Damn, this is why I keep her around. I look back at the large, clean, and new house in front of me. Nah, Philip and Jillian are home. I don't think they would appreciate that too much. Fuck it, we can go park somewhere. I need to get off. Damn, that's tempting. I could use the release myself. Quinn's blue eyes flash in my mind, and I try to shake the memory of them burning with disdain. It's the last week of school. We should probably just go. She rolls her eyes and starts her car. Whatever, loser. See you later. I step back, and she backs out of the drive, waving out the window as she leaves. Blair is fucking easy. Quinn is anything but. What is with the desire to make my life even harder? Chapter 7 Quinn Damn it! My ankle twists as I hit the ground after climbing out of the window of my shitty bedroom. I was trying to be quiet and not wake up the other two girls who are fast asleep, but by being too careful, I fucked up and landed weird. Oh well, fuck them. I'm 18 and I'm out of here. I swing my heavy backpack full of the few clothes I own and pick up the trash bag containing the rest of my life. Walking toward my bike, I gasp when I see Logan standing outside of a new truck far too nice for this neighborhood. He's leaning against it, fucker probably owns it too, and his ankles crossed casually. Not a care in the world. Why the fuck are you here? I'm going to have to kill him. Seriously, this is getting to stalker status. He pushes off the truck and walks to me, far too confident for a guy who is about to get kneed in the balls. Happy birthday. Go fuck yourself. It's not witty, but I'm not putting any effort into dealing with him. I pick my bike up from where it's leaning against the old house, fighting the urge to flip off the home I've known for the last year. Good riddance. He takes the trash bag out of my hand as I'm trying to figure out how to balance it all. Let me give you a ride. Fuck you. I glare up at him, stupefied. What the hell is his deal? How did you even know I'd be out here? He looks at the watch on his wrist, one I'm certain costs more than all my possessions put together. It's midnight on your 18th birthday. We always said this is what we would do. Right, and then you fucking moved in with the perfect family and forgot about all that shit. He swallows what seems like pain, but it can't be that. If he cared, he would have come back years ago. I never forgot about you. Bullshit. 
I sigh and take the bag back from him. I don't need your fucking help. Stay away from me. Quinn, I have no idea where you're going, but it's going to take you ten times as long on your bike this late at night. Please don't make me follow your ass the whole way there. I look up at the full moon and the few stars and the cloudy night sky, and then back at him, my voice hoarse and tired from all the years of bullshit. Why do you care, huh? Why are you all of a sudden back? I don't know. The honesty in his answer cools my temper momentarily. Besides, he's right. It's going to take me forever on my bike. Fine, you can give me a ride, and then stay the hell away from me. He lifts my bike, placing it into the back of the truck, and I do the same with my bags before we climb into the pristine truck. Mustang and a brand new pickup? He starts it up and shakes his head. Nah, I borrowed this from my father. You tell him why? He shakes his head again, starting down the quiet street. No, I didn't have to. Fucking unbelievable. It sounds like he has a good relationship with his real father. I stare out the window, unable to look at him. Is your graduation Saturday? I turn back at his question. Yes. Mine too. I'm not interested in small talk. Cool, I'll talk and you listen. I hate his cool demeanor and want to smack his too perfect face, but just roll my eyes instead. They arrested me. I was in a shitty fucking mood and got in a dumbass fight at a bar. One minute I was in jail, facing a juvie stint, and the next, I'm being introduced to my real father and thrust into a whole new life. I don't want to hear it, and I don't. I'll never forget the fear I felt as I searched the city on my bike, praying he was okay, fearing the worst. And I'll definitely never forget the sting of betrayal when I found out he was fine. More than fine. I didn't mean to hurt you, Quinn, but I was fucking angry, and then I was trying to get used to this world. Oh, poor baby, I glare at him. You had to get used to going to big fancy country club dinners and wearing designer labels, you poor thing. I'm a bitter bitch, I know this, but seriously, fuck him. It was a lot to process, and I'm sorry, but I knew you were doing just fine without me. His eyes grow dark as he grips the steering wheel and stares furiously out the windshield. What the fuck are you talking about? We reach a stoplight and he turns to look at me, cold and dark. Reese. The light turns green and we move forward, his eyes on the street. Fuck you. You left, not me. You left before I did. I stare at him, but he doesn't take his eyes off the road as I try to figure out what the hell he's talking about. But none of it matters. It's in the past. You're with Reese and 18, out on your own. And you're living with a perfect family, 18, and probably starting at some ridiculously expensive college in the fall. He shrugs as I instruct him where to turn. Nah, college isn't for me. Didn't get accepted? Why am I talking to him? I don't care. I got into three schools. Well, I'm sure your parents can afford it. Shut up, Quinn. Don't let him win. Yeah, they have a college fund for me, but I'm not going to take it. You mean you could go to college, but you're not? Why? Because of stupid fucking pride? You loved school. Not anymore. And I don't need a college education for what I want to do. So I'm not wasting the money. I don't care how much they have. He parks in front of the rundown apartment building that houses the studio apartment I'm moving into with Reese and Sean. They've lived there for a few months, and I'm joining now that I'm finally out of the system. I can't believe one of us has a chance to go to college and he doesn't want it. Spoiled fucking brat. What about you, going to college? I scoff at that. <laughs> yeah, right, as if I could ever afford college. For whatever reason, I don't climb out of the truck. There are scholarships and student loans. My grades are fine, but they aren't good enough for scholarships and you have to pay loans back. I should go. I don't owe him any of this information. So then what, after graduation? I shrug, staring at the one and only streetlight working on this street. Waitress, I've been working at Smiley's Coffee Shop since I was 16, but I landed a job at the Fifth Street Bar now that I'm 18. That place is shady as fuck. Why am I telling him all of this? I hate him. I shrug. No shadier than I'm already used to, and as long as they pay me, I don't give a fuck. And then what?
I turn my head to look at him, frustrated by his line of questioning, but something inside me yearns to have our talks back. No, he left. You cannot trust him because he's dropped it gorgeous and flashes that ridiculous smile at you. Be smart and stop thinking with your dumbass heart. The pep talk doesn't help. Survival, Logan. I'll survive. I shrug. Or I won't. Fate's, Fate's a, a motherfucker. motherfucker. We say it in unison, our eyes locking. Look, I have no idea why you're here, but if you think I'm going to be your summer fling, you're sorely mistaken. I mean, I'm sure the rich bitches you're banging are boring as fuck, but it's not happening. He shrugs with a cocky smirk. They aren't too bad. I roll my eyes and he laughs, which pisses me off because it's a beautiful fucking sound. I used to work hard to make that sound come out of him. Logan was always serious, and I made it my job to make him chuckle. His voice is quiet now. I got you a present. I don't want it. It's nearly a whisper, and I'm worried I'm losing my edge. He reaches into the back seat and brings a beautiful acoustic guitar with a red bow around the bass. Tears fill my eyes, but I don't accept it. I've always loved music, and I cherished the guitar the boy stole from me until the day my foster father smashed it against the wall. When Logan left, I broke into his mom's apartment and took it home with me. It lasted two weeks. I shake my head, my fingers itching to grab it. I don't play anymore. His right eyebrow lifts. You love to play. Loved. I'm nowhere near the same girl you left behind, and I don't need your fucking parents' money. I didn't buy it with their money. I used the money I earned working at my uncle's tattoo shop. God, you reek of privilege. You get that, right? I don't want it. His brow furrows, and I'd feel bad if I had a soul. Fine. He runs his fingers through his tousled hair. Reese looked fucking out of it the other night. He stares out the window to the dilapidated apartment building. He's fine. I sigh softly. We're all fine. I climb out of the truck, and he follows, his body standing before mine. I'm not here for a cheap hookup. I swallow the cry I feel in my throat, staring up at my former best friend and dying a little more inside. Have a great graduation, Logan. I'm sure you'll have a badass party, get a new car, and pat on the back from your new daddy. Enjoy it and forget about us. It doesn't seem like it was all that hard for you before. I grab both bags from the truck, and he places my bike on the sidewalk, our hands briefly touching as I take the bike's handlebars from him. Our eyes meet, and I see the sorrow in his. It was. I shake my head, not letting him in. I can't. Thanks for the ride. I use the bike lock to secure my bike against the building and grab the bags, turning my back on Logan and walking up to my new home. He has to take the hint this time. I can't afford to let him back in my life after the carnage he inflicted last time. Chapter 8. Logan A few days later, I'm staring at the massive number of people crammed into our backyard. And by massive, I mean fucking massive. Not only are all of the Adamsons here, even Evie, and all the tattoo artists from the shop, but Jillian invited her boss, Brooke Monroe, and her entire family. Truth be told, Brooke is more than just her boss and mentor, really. They have become great friends, and the families are close as hell, but still. Brooke and Dylan, her husband, have three kids of their own. Not to mention Dylan has four younger siblings, all with kids and significant others. And they're all here. I keep thinking about my last encounter with Quinn. Part of me is still shocked she finally gave in and let me give her a ride to where I'm sure she's staying with Reese and maybe Sean. For whatever reason, I was desperate to have her hear me out. And there was a brief moment where it felt like old times. And that moment was the most alive I felt in a long time. Not that I'm not grateful for everything I have now. I am. But this still feels unreal to me, and I'm not sure if that feeling will ever go away. My Aunt Leslie hooks her arm around my neck and pulls me to her side. I'm so fucking proud of you, kid. I knew you could do it. Her man, Cash, chuckles happily and nods his head in my direction. Never had any doubt. Philip stands next to him, cautiously looking me over. You okay with your mom not showing up? Yeah, Philip. It's fucking awesome. I grip my teeth. 
He cares. Don't be an asshole. And he's asking around cash because he's been trying to get my mom sober too. They have to stop that shit. More like relieved. And I really am. I didn't want her showing up, tripping over people's feet, pale and skinny, making a scene. I mean, the woman puked in a trash can during my kindergarten graduation. Wasn't looking forward to the repeat of that epic fiasco. Philip and Leslie share a look that annoys the fuck out of me, but I brush it off. They care. Reminding myself of that fact doesn't make it any better. I stare at the finely dressed people and fight a groan. The party is catered, there's a big-ass cake, and fucking twinkle lights in the trees above the lighted underground pool. This is exactly the graduation party Quinn described. We eat, and then it's time for presents. Presents I don't need, that I don't even really want. But I know that makes me look like a dick, so I smile and say thank you with each gift. And I'm trying. I'm really fucking fighting my inner demons tonight. I didn't earn any of this shit. All I did was go to the high school Philip paid for and enrolled me in. That's it. It's Chris's turn, and I unwrap the small metal sign with my name engraved on it. I look at him wondering what the fuck this is for. For my bedroom door or something? He chuckles. I think you're old enough to figure out which one is your bedroom. Amy, his wife, laughs and nudges his arm to make Chris finally tell me what it's for. It's for your station at the shop, for this summer and beyond, if that's what you want. I smile now. A real smile spreads over my face as Frankie pats my back. Welcome, kid. You've made it now. I watch Jillian's face, and although I can see she's happy, I also see the disappointment there. Fuck. Thanks, Chris. That's awesome. He nods, his eyes moving from Jillian to me. And it'll hold your spot for you if you decide to go to college for a bit. I see Jillian's small smile form on her lips and feel suffocated, but nod my head in agreement and force a smile. Thanks. This is awesome. Philip stands up and claps his hands together. All right, this was fun and all, but it's time for my present. His older brother Levi rolls his eyes. Always got to show off. Fuck yeah, I do. My kid is graduated from high school. Who knew that was ever going to happen? Everyone laughs, and he leads us to the garage. Damn it. Not another car. Philip, the Mustang you got me works just fine. It has like 10,000 miles on it. He laughs and hits the button, lifting the metal door. Please, it's way more fun than a car. I look into the garage and see a shiny new motorcycle, like the ones he races. Red and black, sleek and the fucker screams fast. I rub the back of my neck, trying to find the words. You bought me a bike? Fuck. I thought he had finally gotten over the fact that I have no interest in racing. He told me his father, Mitch, had always given Chris a really hard time about not going into the family business, and that he would never do that. Yeah, and lessons with your old man. I stare at him, confused. Look, maybe your next kid will be into this, but it's really not my thing. He rolls his eyes at me, but brushes it off easily, because that's just Philip. Look, I know this isn't going to be your career, but it helps blow off steam. Trust me for once, kid. Levi and Cash, both racers, agree with exaggerated nods. I guess it can't hurt. Thank you, Philip. Could be fun, I guess. Chris pats my shoulder. I even enjoy it from time to time. Helps clear your head. Guess they all see me as close to an explosion or some shit. Really, I think they have been waiting for that since I moved in. But I've stayed fairly calm. The night I got arrested and ended up here, I pretty much put my destructive ways to bed. Hanging my hat up at 14. Fuck, I'm not normal. We eat cake and talk about my future a little more. Everyone giving their silent nudge, trying to send me to college. And I try like hell to keep my mind off Quinn. More than likely, her graduation party is just the small group of friends hanging out at the drive-in, if they even do that. It's probably just another night in their world, nothing to really celebrate. But the more I try to not think about what she's doing at this exact moment, the more obsessed I become. Chapter 9. Quinn Want some? I shake my head, looking at the whiskey bottle in Sean's hand as he sits down next to me on the stairs in the dank stairwell of our apartment building. The party going on is to celebrate our graduation. And you would think someone would complain, considering the party has filtered from our apartment out into the hallway. But nah, 
no one here cares. I'm a high school graduate with no future. Other than to turn into my mother, of course, which, by the way, is my number one fear, even if I don't admit it to anyone. Who the fuck would have thought we'd all be high school graduates? Sean muses as he lifts the bottle to his lips. <laughs> Not me. I mean, even Reese. He nudges my shoulder. Of course, that had a fuckload to do with you. I shrug my shoulders. I still haven't forgiven Reese for that shit the other day, but I haven't not forgiven him either. Things with Reese are fucked up. They always have been. Part of me cares for him, and the other part hates him. Of course, you paid for it. I turn to face Sean, shocked by the seriousness on his face. Sean is rarely serious. We don't talk about my relationship with Reese. We just don't. Sean? He shakes his head. Come on, Quinn. I'm not fucking blind. I know what's going on, and that shit needs to stop. I mean, fuck, he's twice your size. That fucker could kill you. I swallow the bile, rising and burning my throat, uncertain if it would be such a bad thing. Not that I'm suicidal per se, more indifferent. What am I supposed to do? Leave him. He gestures back toward the apartment. Fuck, anything but move in with him. I don't have anywhere else to go. His green eyes meet mine, desperation swimming in them. Reese is like my brother, and I'll always have his back. But you're like my little sister, and I'll be damned if I'll let him kill you. Save up, Quinn, and get the fuck out. He can be so good. He nods his head, knowing exactly what I mean. Reese wasn't always like this, but he has dark secrets, a fucking awful childhood, and addiction in his blood. It's an impossible combination that no one can possibly understand unless they are right there in the thick of it. Until they've walked in his shoes, they can't say shit. And yet, does that mean I have to let him use me as a punching bag? Because he stayed and Logan didn't? My mom didn't. I don't even know who the fuck my dad is. Multiple foster parents promised to take care of me only to toss me back when they'd had enough. He's been hitting the shit too fucking hard lately. It's become a fucked up, drugged up Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde situation. It's true. I never know which version I'm going to get. I can't just leave him, Sean. Well, you can't stay with him either. I take the bottle from his hand and take a small sip, letting the whiskey burn on its way down and then hand it back. So that chick with Logan the other night, <laughs> what the hell was that about? Nice. He chuckles at my deflection and takes a sip of the bottle. It wasn't about anything, same old. I shake my head. Nah, I saw the way you looked at her. I think someone finally got under your skin. Fuck that, you know love is for suckers. I shrug, inclined to agree. Still, I think she left quite an impression. I watch the same expression swim through his eyes as the other day and smile, shaking my head, basking in being right. He doesn't even argue with me and instead redirects the conversation back to me. By the way, how the fuck is it that Logan's back and we haven't talked about that? Logan isn't back. He just brought your lover to come find you. He nudges my shoulder and makes a disgusted face. Never say lover again. She's just some chick I've fucked. And you haven't seen Logan since then? I study his face. I don't think he would ever betray me, Reese's best friend or not. I do think of him as a brother. But if Reese finds out I let Logan give me a ride the other night, I really could be dead sooner than later. No. The lie tastes bitter, but I can't risk it. Besides, nothing happened. I stand up on the top stair. Gotta get to work. Thankfully, he drops the subject because I'm not sure I could continue to lie if he pushed. I can't believe you're working on graduation night. I untie the hoodie from around my waist and pull it on over my head. It's Saturday night, best night for tips. And even if I can't leave Reese, it's good to have money put aside for a rainy day. Aren't they all rainy days? Maybe we'll get a little sunshine someday. I hear his soft laughter as I make my way outside and walk the four blocks to my new job. The night drags on, and my shift is long. At the end of the night, I can't wait to go home and go to bed, even though I'm certain the party is still going. I walk out the door, waving goodbye to my boss, and nearly lose my shit when I see that black fucking Mustang from the other night. No way. I knock on the tinted window, which immediately rolls down, and I'm staring into Logan's beautiful blue eyes.
You know stalking is a criminal offense, right? He shrugs. Worth it. And besides, it's not exactly stalking. You told me where you work, and since it's a bar, I figured you'd be working on their busiest night. Reasonable deduction. I roll my eyes and cross my arms, not wanting to listen to any more of his fucked up logic. Pretty sure that's exactly what stalkers say. Leave me alone, Logan. I'm not playing a cute little game of chase me. I'm dead serious. Leave me alone. I start walking and hear his car shut off and the door slam as he jogs up behind me. I pivot to look at him, frustration coursing through my veins. Get back in your car. Do you realize how fast it could be stolen down here? So then let me give you a ride home because I'm not letting you walk alone this late at night. I shake my head at the irony of that. You were gone for four goddamn years and I survived. Trust me, I'll be just fine. I'd be more worried about you and all that fancy shit you're wearing than me. I turn to leave and he catches my arm gently. Quinn. My eyes meet his at the pleading in his voice. Please give me a chance to explain. Why now? My voice doesn't sound nearly as pissed off as I want it to. You went for four years without so much as a phone call. Why the hell are you so fucking obsessed now? He looks down at me, his eyes full of emotion. He's always had a hard time hiding that because of his eyes. The rest of his face, rock solid. But his eyes, they hold all of his thoughts. Valid question. I fold my arms over my chest. I know. I don't even know the exact answer, but I think it's because... He clears his throat. I've been in this crazy limbo since I was arrested, somewhere between my old life and my new one, not fitting into either one, but when I saw you at that party. He stops, and for once, I don't want him to. What? What the hell changed? I haven't felt that alive in four years. I mean, yeah, it was clear you hated me, but I'd been in limbo for four years thinking about you and wondering, and then there you were. And then talking to you on your birthday, it felt almost like old times. Why didn't you just call if you were really thinking about me? He sighs heavily and sits down on one of the rusty old metal benches lining the street. The night I got arrested, I had detention at school and then was heading out to meet you, Sean, and Reese at the drive-in. I take a seat next to him, the metal cool from the night air against my bare thighs as my shorts ride up. I'm not above wearing a slutty shirt and short shorts to make extra tips, so sue me. You never showed. I stopped at my mom's apartment first. I don't have a good feeling about this. Her boyfriend, or the guy she had been fucking for a couple weeks, was on top of her, beating the living hell out of her. I hear the strain in his voice as he relives that night, and part of me feels his pain. I grabbed him and beat the fuck out of him. Of course, he got in some good hits himself. And you know what my mom did? There's no telling when it comes to Jana. She pulled me off him and screamed in my face, told me that I ruined everything for her, that I was the biggest mistake she ever made, like I ruined her fucking life. No matter how many counselors talk to you and tell you that addiction is ugly, and that's not really the person saying those things, you still can't believe it that someone who's supposed to love you could ever bring themselves to spew that kind of hatred. It makes me glad my mom died before I could form a memory of her. Sounds like her. He nods his head, shaking it off, but his eyes yet again give him away. I told her to fuck off and good riddance if he killed her. Then I grabbed his bottle of whiskey and chugged the fucker before hopping on my bike and heading out of there, determined never to go back. Why didn't you come to find us? Why go to a fucking bar? I'll never forget reading his arrest report and seeing he was picked up at a bar for underage drinking and starting a fight. Logan never fought, unless it was absolutely necessary. He certainly never started fights. He's lost in thought for a moment, and I can't help but think he's leaving out a big part of this story before he shrugs his large shoulders. It doesn't matter now. That night is in the past, Quinn, and I can't take back any of the shit I did. He swallows and faces me. But I'm so fucking sorry. Don't fall for it, Quinn. What do you want from me? His voice is hoarse and quiet. The street is nearly empty because most people are home in their beds fast asleep at this time of night. Why don't you play music anymore?
I close my eyes tightly. I've always loved music. It was the only thing that kept me semi-sane. I just don't. His hand covers my own, forcing my eyes to snap open. Quinn? My gaze meets his. Music requires soul, and I'm convinced I don't have one anymore. It's the most honest I've ever allowed myself to be, and it hurts deeply as he squeezes my hand lightly with his. You do. You're the most soulful person I've ever met. A lot has changed. It doesn't have to. I'm here now. I shake my head and stand up. For how long? You go off to college in the fall? I'm not falling for it again, Logan. I don't trust you, and I don't think I ever can. I'm not going to college. I'm staying right here. Just give me a chance. He stands from the bench, and I feel like I'm fighting for air. For what? What the hell do you want from me? I don't know. I just want my friend back. I scoff angrily. I didn't leave. You did. And now you just want to come back in my life like nothing happened. He places his hand over his heart. No, a lot has happened. We can't ignore that, but maybe that's okay. We're fucking young, Quinn. We have a lot of years left to fuck up. It's too much. He places a folded up piece of paper in my hand. That's my number and my address. Just think about it. For whatever reason, I accept it and let him give me a ride home. I can't forgive him for adding to the long list of people who have left me behind. But for whatever reason, maybe he was meant to come back into my life. Fate is still a motherfucker. Chapter 10. Logan. Fuck yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Philip reminds me of a kid on Christmas as he jumps in the air, fucking ecstatic out on the track, pointing at me. Tell me you didn't have fun. I climb off the bike and shake my head at his antics, but I can't stop the smile on my face. The guy loves racing. And even I have to admit, flying around the track, not having anything to hold me back, it was exhilarating. It wasn't bad. He grins, knowing exactly how I feel, and wraps an arm around my shoulder, walking back to the empty stands. Add in a roaring crowd, and there's nothing better. He shrugs. I mean, fucking is pretty close, but there's just something about the track during a race. I shake my head as we rest against the cement barrier between the stands and the track. You know you're supposed to be my father, right? He laughs. You're not a kid anymore. I think a father and son can talk about sex. And definitely about racing. I laugh. Your dad talk about that shit with you? He grins. Hell yeah, he did. He chuckles. Maybe a little too much, but that was just Mitch. It's like you had a totally different father from all the others. He puffs out a reserved breath. Yeah, maybe I did. Chris was never interested in knowing Mitch. Evie moved away with my mom when she was really little, so she never got to know him. Leslie, well, she was close to him, but always called him on his bullshit. And Levi. He shakes his head with a smile. Well, turns out he had a whole other reason to hate our father. Yeah, the whole your dad fucked his current wife thing could get in the way, I suppose. He nods his head, running his hand through his now sweaty hair. It's fucking hot out here, and the sun is brutal. Yeah, you know. I hated Levi for years when I thought he and Natalie were going behind Mitch's back. But you know, it took a long time for me to figure out there's always more to the story. And there was a hell of a lot more to their story. They'd loved each other since they were your age. So how did she end up with Mitch? Circumstance and a shitty fucking childhood I wouldn't wish on anyone. I watch his Adam's apple bob in his throat as his eyes meet mine. Mitch was my hero but he did a lot of shitty things, and fucked up a lot. Like paying my mom off. Philip looks pained. Yes, but that was more my mistake. This is the most we've ever talked about this, and I try to shrug it off. You were young. I wasn't that fucking young. I was just a selfish prick, and if I could go back and do it differently, I would. His eyes are full of resentment. I would fucking raise you and probably make every mistake in the book but I would have made sure you were safe. I don't want to think about my life if he had stepped up. Would it have been any better? He was a young hotshot racer with a fucked up childhood of his own. His mom had an untreated bipolar disorder, and his father was a piece of work, whether he saw it or not. And even though they're both dead now, 
they were alive long enough to wreak havoc on all their children. I wouldn't have met Quinn. Would that be a good thing or a bad thing? I think back to our conversation the other night outside the bar. It's been a couple of weeks, and I haven't heard a peep from her. I've decided the ball is in her court. I tried to give her as much of an explanation as I'm willing to give, and I made it known that I'm here now. The rest is up to her. I can't push her into a friendship, no matter how desperate I've become for that since I saw her again, her voice haunting my dreams, wondering why the hell she's convinced she doesn't have a soul. Her singing with her guitar was enough to fill the soulless with hers. To me, that means she has an abundance. I smile. Life never knowing Quinn isn't worth a damn, even if she hates me for all eternity. You're here now. That's what matters. He smiles and wraps an arm around me again. I'm so fucking glad you got into that bar fight four years ago. I can't help the smile on my own face. Nice parenting. He laughs again. Let's go grab something to eat. Okay, I have a shift tonight at Chris's, but I have a couple hours. Maybe letting Philip in isn't the worst thing in the world. He's not a bad guy, that's for damn sure. And he fucking cares. Something I've never had before. He looks slightly guilty, and I know there's more he wants to talk about before we head to his car. What's up? He doesn't beat around the bush. Jana's back. Christ. I run my hand through my own matted hair. No. He unzips his jumpsuit. I know she isn't your favorite person, but she did give you life and all. Fuck her. Philip, you have to stop helping her. He swallows hard and steps out of the jumpsuit, leaving him in a t-shirt and jeans. I can't. Look, kid, she's your mom. She brought you into my life, and I can't just give up on her. Is she sober? He swallows tightly again, and I shake my head, unzipping the jumpsuit he gave me and walking toward the car. Fuck. He walks to the car with me. She wants to be. Yeah, she always says that. I grab the passenger side handle, then turn to face him. You're a smart guy. You know this is a waste of fucking money. This is what, her tenth time? Sometimes it takes a lot. Fuck that. She's a lost cause. People thought that about my mother, too. His eyes are deadly serious. Including me. And none of us forced her to get help. And then she fucking overdosed. Who the hell knows? Maybe rehab or treatment never would have helped, but we didn't even fucking try. Don't you want a shot at having a relationship with your mom? No, I don't want that. Logan. I brush him off and open the door, climbing in and slamming the door like a child. I don't fucking care. I will never trust that woman again. Fuck Jana. The time away from her has been a blessing, and every time she comes back, it's nothing but a curse. Chapter 11 Quinn I'm tired after a long shift at the bar, but I managed 50 bucks in tips, which really isn't bad at that dump. I'm ready to crash. But of course, life has other things in store for me. I open the door, and there's Reese, sitting on the couch, liquor bottles, pills, and God knows what else spread all over. But that's not different from every other night. The girl straddling his lap, riding his dick? Yeah, that's a little different. Fuck my life. Really? I should probably care a little more than I do. Honestly, we haven't always been exclusive. Our relationship is toxic as hell, but he's never rubbed it in my face quite like this before. He barely moves, his head tipping in my direction, a distant look in his eyes. Your fucking Logan thought I might as well fuck this chick. The busty blonde on his lap is clearly high out of her mind and doesn't even stop. Fuck you, Reese. I walk out the door, slamming it behind, and bump into Sean. What's going on? I'm beyond tired, and not just physically. I'm leaving. I start toward the stairs and look over my shoulder. I'll be back later. I don't have a permanent place to go, and I know it. He nods his head and walks into the apartment. As I disappear down the stairs, knowing where I'm headed is a very bad idea, but not caring. I head straight to the bus station and hop on the bus, taking me to the Burbs as close to Logan's address as I can get, because even if it's after midnight, it's still hot as fuck tonight. How can I go to him after everything?
I haven't been able to stop thinking about him since that night outside the bar. I'm still pissed, but maybe I get it a little. If he would have come back to our neighborhood while living with his rich father, we would have given him so much shit. He would have had an even harder time adjusting to his new life. The jealousy spewing from us would have feasted on his chance. Selfish or not, maybe I would have done the same. I hop off the bus and walk until I find his street. Every house out here looks the exact same, from the manicured lawn to the white siding and attached garages. This is so stupid. Jesus, he's probably doing the same thing Reese is right now, minus the drugs. I stand in front of the massive house matching the address he wrote on the crumpled piece of paper. I don't even know which bedroom is his. Jesus, this place is huge. You should see the inside. Fuck! I jump back and gasp at the sound from behind me, turning. I shit you not, at first I thought it was Logan, but it's a slightly older version of Logan. I mean, they could be twins if they weren't 20 years apart. This has to be his real dad. He laughs. You stalking me? Because I'm happily married. He holds up his left ring finger, the small diamond sparkling in the moonlight on the gold band. No. I shake my head stupidly. L Logan. Fuck, Quinn. Could you be more pathetic? I mean, I'm looking for Logan. He chuckles at that and nods his head proudly, looking up at the darkened house. He might be asleep. He works for my brother, and that fucker makes him wake up early. I'm sorry, it's late, and this was really stupid. I turn to run back to the bus station. He waves that off easily, a cool, confident demeanor, and now I know where Logan got it. Nah, he's relatively young, he can wake his ass up at midnight. I gawk at him with uncertainty. You're his father? He nods and gestures for me to walk up to the house with him. And I notice a car, more than likely his car service or Uber, pull away from the house. Jesus, how long was I staring up at the house? And how out of it was I that I didn't hear the car pull up? Yeah, I am. I was out of town for a race and the flight was fucking late. Why my agent books me the cheapest fucking flight, I'm not fucking sure. He unlocks the front door. But that's my other brother, and he's a dick, so... I can't help the laugh that bubbles up in my throat. <laughs> you definitely don't talk like a parent. Well, parents I've seen on TV. I don't really know what the fuck real parents are like. He shrugs. Yeah, well, I wasn't raised right. I smile. Who was? He nods his head to the staircase. I could wake him up and give him a warning, but it's more fun to let you do it. And as much as I hate to admit it, I'm wiped out and going to bed. His room is the first one on the left up there. I nod my head, unsure as to why he trusts me. But I guess I don't look that menacing. Still, I could be a fucking insane axe murderer. Thanks. No problem, Quinn. My eyes bulge embarrassingly from my head. How do you know my name? He shakes his head as if I'm a silly child. I'm psychic. What? He chuckles and rolls his eyes at me. The kid has your picture in his room. I asked him your name a long time ago, and that's what he told me. He smiles. It was still a risk because he is my son and therefore a little shit and could have made it up. He has a picture of me? His dad just laughs again. <laughs> nice to meet you, Quinn. He walks off down the hall to what I'm assuming is his bedroom. Fuck, that was weird. This is a bad idea. I walk up the stairs quietly and stand in front of the first door I come to. I take a deep breath and turn the handle slowly, walking into the dark bedroom that, even in the small amount of moonlight filtering in from the window, I can tell is bigger than my apartment. Okay, you can do this, Quinn. My heart is racing as I close the door behind me and approach the bed. Logan, I whisper, thankful he seems to be alone and asleep. Logan gasps and shoots up from his lying position in the bed, sitting straight up, turning the lamp next to his bed on, staring up at me in confusion. Quinn, what are you doing here? I need to talk to you. I look at his disheveled blonde hair, tousled on top of his head, and my eyes momentarily roam lower and down his bare, filled-out chest. Fuck. Long gone is the scrawny body I'm used to. It's clear he works out and often. 
His pec muscles are well-defined along with his sinewy arms. His stomach is flat except for the well-defined ridges of his toned abs. Fuck me. He has a couple of tattoos now, one on his right bicep, two on each pec, and I know I've been staring far too long. The dark blue sheet is covering the rest of him, and I'm thankful because my mouth is already watering. My eyes finally meet his again. Don't get any ideas. He lifts his legs up, resting each elbow on his knees, still covered by the sheet and laughing. Oh man, if you could have been in my dreams just now, you'd know the idea is already there. I study his face. Is he fucking serious? He just laughs and ruffles his hair with his hand. I'm kidding. I was actually dreaming about being in a college classroom, and my father was there revving up his motorcycle. His playful blue eyes meet mine. That's not weird, right? I smile and try to swallow some of the saliva built up from ogling him earlier. Now, as long as you weren't naked, then that would be fucked up. He laughs and leans back against his wooden headboard. Why are you here? I have no fucking idea. He nods his head unbothered. Bad night? I nod. Walked in on Reese fucking some random chick. Damn. He doesn't look shocked, but he's not being a total dick, so I sit on the edge of his bed, keeping my distance. Yeah. You okay? I nod. I don't know. I mean, it's not the first time. I shrug. It is the first time I've seen it in person, though. So you're just cool with him fucking someone else? Aren't you two together? Oddly enough, he doesn't sound judgmental, more curious. I don't really know what we are. He looks confused now. You've never discussed rules or boundaries and shit? I laugh at that and look around his pristine bedroom. His bed is a king-sized with two bedside tables that perfectly match his headboard. There's a large flat screen mounted to the wall in front of the bed, a large dresser, again, that matches the other furniture, and a large walk-in closet with the door open and packed full of shoes and clothes. We really do live in two different worlds. Hey, there were people in the old neighborhood that were in committed relationships. A laugh escapes my mouth. Who? He thinks about it and then snaps his fingers. That old bus driver, Mr. Shannon. He was fucking loyal to his wife. I smile, thinking about her picture tucked into the sun visor on the old rickety bus. Oh yeah, my smile fades. She died last year. Damn, he shakes his head. Still, they were married for fucking ever. I nod in agreement. True, but Reese and I aren't like that. Just fuck buddies then? My heart aches, thinking about Reese, but not with jealousy like it should. I don't know. I mean, he always tells everyone I'm his girl. I scoff. Possessive asshole. His eyes darken as he studies me. You seem really fucking calm about him screwing someone else. I sigh and lay back onto his bed, looking up at the clean painted white ceiling. It's not that big of a deal. Most guys cheat. I turn to look up at him. You telling me you didn't fuck around a little on Miss Huge Boobs? He laughs at that. Blair? God, even her name sounds pretentious. I guess. I mean, I don't, not really, but we aren't officially dating either. But you don't fuck anyone beside her? He smirks. Why, Quinn? Thinking about getting back at Reese? I roll my eyes and turn away from him, afraid my face will give away the fact that the thought makes my lower belly quiver and my thighs clench just thinking about it. I've got to get a grip. This is utterly ridiculous. Only in your dreams, motorcycle boy. I hear him laugh and shuffle as he lays down across the bed, right next to me, and I'm afraid to move. I definitely look over to see what he's wearing, or not wearing. We haven't laid like this in over four years. It's tattoo, boy. I'll leave the racing up to my dad and maybe his future spawn. Is that why you don't want to go to college? You want a tattoo for a living? I feel his large shoulders shrug next to me. Yeah, I think so. I'm not half bad, and it's a pretty cool way to make a living. I nod my head. I can see that. I'm not sure getting paid for something I love is that great of an idea, though.
Now I turned to face him, keeping my eyes only on his face. What? That's the dream, isn't it? I would kill to make money writing songs. But I only think that, never dare say it out loud. I don't know. I think with art, getting paid for it will always feel like selling out. <laughs> well, cha-ching, because if I ever had a chance at it, I would be cashing in. That pulls more laughter from him, and I bask in the manly, beautiful sound. You think so? I know so. He rolls to his stomach, reaching for something, and I try like hell to pull my eyes off his perfectly toned ass in his black boxer briefs. I look back up at the ceiling as he lifts the brand new guitar he tried to give me on my birthday from the floor, rolling back over and holding it up above us. You still fucking love music, don't you? I stare up at the beautiful guitar, my heart aching and my fingers twitching at my sides, dying to play it. I can't. Toughen up, buttercup, and do what makes you happy. I should run far away from here. This is a dangerous path. But he's right. When have I ever shied away from danger? Chapter 12 Logan Quinn Foster is in my bedroom after all these years, and I'm fighting the urge to pinch myself and make sure this isn't a fucking dream. But I know it's not. This is real. She's really here. She had a shitty night and came straight to me, and it feels like old times. She sits up on my bed, folding her legs underneath her and holding the guitar, letting it rest on her lap as I sit up, staring at her, awestruck. Her fingers flex, and she looks afraid, something I've never seen from her. I can't do this. No. I place my hand over my bare chest, where my heart is pounding. I can't play that fucking guitar. No matter how many times you tried to teach me. I point at her. You, you can play any fucking guitar ever put in front of you. Her voice is low as she shakes her head, her blonde hair falling over her face as she tilts her head in defeat. I haven't played in years. I brush the hair out of her eyes and tuck it behind her ear. Doesn't matter. You can. And if you suck, I'm the only one who will know. She sucks in a great big breath of air and then slowly lets it out through her parted full lips, her fingers strumming the guitar tentatively at first. And I recognize the song almost instantly as I watch her magical fingers command the music to come from the instrument. The first line from Patience pours into the air, her soft, raspy voice filling the empty space in my soul. The old Guns N' Roses song was always one of her favorites, and my eyes are locked on hers, totally unwavering. Both of us lost in our own little world as her fingers glide along the strings and her classic, soulful voice fills my bedroom. And as she reaches the last note, my lips are compelled to touch hers. A force that is completely unstoppable moves me as our mouths meld together, the guitar between our bodies. My hand grasps the side of her beautiful face. This is totally different from our first kiss. Now we both know what we're doing. I groan when she removes the guitar from between us placing it gently on the floor and pulling my body onto hers. Her much smaller body lays below mine as I use one arm to make sure I'm not completely crushing her. Her fingers grip my hair, pulling me into a deeper kiss. Our tongues explore each other's mouths as my hand smooths over the skin of her flat stomach under her tank top. Her legs spread for me to rest between them, and I devour her mouth with my own. But it's over nearly as quickly as it started. Her hand comes between us and rests on my chest, easy me back. Logan. Her voice is hoarse, and as I remove my lips from hers, I'm silently pleading with her not to stop. Quinn, I can't do this. I don't move. The feeling of her small frame under mine is too phenomenal. Why? Because of Reese? Fuck that asshole. No, because of us. Because of our fucking history. Her hand shoves me back, and I roll off her. Because you left. My hand runs through my hair, gripping it with frustration. Quinn, I told you, I'm fucking sorry about that. She sits up, pulling her shirt down and rolling her pretty eyes. Because your dick is hard. No, I told you sorry when it was almost entirely flaccid. She cringes and then laughs. That word is fucking disgusting. I smirk, glad I got the reaction I intended. She stands from the bed, and I feel a sense of panic as I jump up. Where are you going? She shrugs. I guess back to my apartment with Reese and Sean. 
Gotta face him sometime. I'm sure he and that chick are done by now. Don't go. I raise my hands in surrender as her head tilts to the left in question. I'll keep my hands to myself. Just stay here tonight. It's late. You sure? I nod my head and gesture back toward my king-sized bed. We can even put pillows between our ridiculously hot bodies if you want. Her bottom lip pokes out, deep in thought, as she nods her head with a yes, approaching me with caution. This never happened. Technically, I'm with Reese. The asshole who was balls deep in some random chick earlier. Yes, that asshole. My hand wraps around her back as I pull her closer to me. This kiss wasn't fucking cheating. You told me yourself you guys never had that exclusive talk, and it doesn't sound like he gives a flying fuck. He would flip his shit if he knew I was here with you. And even if the kiss was fucking bland as hell, trust me, he would, in fact, give a fuck. Her attempt at downplaying our kiss is totally lost on me. I can feel how rapidly her heart is beating as her chest is pressed against mine, and I can hear the ragged breaths from her lungs. I smirk knowingly, looking down at her beautiful face. Oh, really? Bland, huh? I felt you trembling under me. I heard the need in your soft whimpers. And I know for a fact, your panties are soaked. Her eyes are full of defiance as she lifts her chin. You're wrong. Worst kiss since the first one with you. My hand moves to her stomach, sliding down to the top button of her jeans. And I see the flicker of need brewing in her blue eyes as I pop the top button, sliding my hand down in her jeans, over her silky panties, and between her legs. I was definitely right. She soaked for me, which pulls a groan from my throat, as I feel just how much her body at least wants mine. Right. Your panties are drenched because of a bland and boring kiss. I'm sure you were thinking about Reese the whole time, right? She pushes my hand away angrily. Right. Keep telling yourself that, Quinn. I lean in so close I can smell her shampoo and crave her lips again. The moment my lips touched yours, you wouldn't have even remembered that prick's name. Her eyes close, and I see pain in her expression. Please, just stop. I want to force her to admit that he means nothing to her, that she wanted to continue to kiss me. But even I'm not that much of an asshole. You take my bed, I'll go to the guest room. I don't give her the opportunity to argue, and grab my favorite pillow from the bed, exiting my room. At least for tonight, I know she's safe. Even if I'm fucked. Chapter 13 Quinn Holy shit. I'm a fucking dumbass. I kissed him. What the ever-loving fuck is wrong with me? Yeah, he's hot. Yes, he was once my friend. But then he fucking left. And now he and I are so fucking different. I open my eyes and glance around at Exhibit A, his beautiful bedroom that he has all to himself, and this ridiculously comfortable bed. I groan as I force my tired body to sit up and stretch my arms upward, trying not to notice that my t-shirt smells like him after sleeping in his bed all night. Why couldn't that kiss have been bland and boring? My God, my body has never been that on fire. Which is so fucking dangerous. Reese is Reese, a friend who turned into someone to spend time with, occasionally get off with, but the feelings are crushing. If he leaves, fine. If he fucks around, fine. But Logan? I've never been more crushed in my life than when he disappeared, and there's no way I can go through that again, especially after that kiss. That kiss that consumed my entire soul, it took over all my rational thoughts. I have to get out of here. I climb from the bed and pull my hair into a ponytail as I open the bedroom window. Thank God there's an easy ledge to climb out and I can hop down. I shimmy down the side of the massive home and drop to the ground, trying my best not to look back. I rush to the bus stop and finally make it back to the apartment on my side of town. My heart and limbs are heavy as I climb the stairs, trying desperately to forget last night. And when I unlock the door and push it open, my body is instantly thrust against the wall, my head making contact with a sickening thump. Fuck! I glare into Reese's red-rimmed eyes. Did you fuck him? God damn it. He is so fucking high. Get off me, Reese.
His hands dig into my biceps, and I can already feel a bruise forming, his hot breath assaulting my face. Did you fuck him, Quinn? I know you fucking did. I use my hand to push against his hard chest, but he doesn't budge. Back up, Reese. You're hurting my arms. He only squeezes them tighter. I had to wait two fucking years for you to finally let me in your pants, and then he comes back and your fucking legs spread for him instantly. Let go of her. Both our heads snap to the left at the deep baritone voice next to us. Logan, shit. Reese doesn't move. Fuck off, you sellout motherfucker. This is between me and Quinn. No. Logan takes another step in our direction. I'm definitely involved now. Take your fucking hands off her before I send you through that fucking window. Logan nods toward the large window of the apartment, and Reese finally releases me, moving toward Logan. What the fuck are you doing here? Didn't you get enough of her last night? Thankfully and surprisingly, Logan doesn't play into his bullshit. What the hell happened to you, man? I cringe as Reese's eyes snap to me, and I shake my head before he looks back at Logan. Don't you fucking dare come back here and judge us, pretty boy. It's really fucking obvious how easy you've had it since you left. So your life is so hard that you toss Quinn around? You want to turn into your fucking father, is that it? He shoves Logan's chest, sending him back a foot or two. Fuck you. His father was locked up for beating the shit out of his mom on more than one occasion, something we know from social workers' files and public records. Logan shoves him back with his own powerful nudge. Fuck you. Who the hell are you? I never thought I'd see you lay a hand on any chick, let alone Quinn. What are you doing, huh? Coming here to whisk her away to your perfect life? She won't fit in there. Quinn isn't a fucking sellout like you. Well, she sure as fuck isn't staying here with your strung out, abusive ass. Logan turns to me. Pack your shit. I'm incredibly torn. At the moment, I don't want anything to do with either of these assholes acting like they own me, but no part of me wants to stay here and face the wrath of Reese. I move slowly toward the single bed in the studio apartment, grabbing the black duffel bag tucked under it and placing a few clothes in it. You can't go with him, Quinn. Reese takes a step toward me, which makes me jump slightly preparing myself, but Logan steps in front of him, blocking his way. Don't fucking move. The men stand mere feet away from each other, hate-filled eyes locked in a challenge with each other until I'm finished packing and walk to stand next to Logan's side. Reese's eyes move from Logan to me. He left you once. You know damn well he'll leave you again, Quinn. Don't be fucking stupid. What? She should stay here and let you beat the shit out of her? Reese ignores Logan entirely. Think about it, Quinn. In September, when he goes off to college to a whole new bunch of rich bitches, what do you think will happen? You think he's going to take you with him? I swallow the bitter taste of jealousy, but try to remain unaffected. You need to get help, Reese. I turn to look at Logan. I don't know if I can do this. Logan looks completely stunned by my confession. And okay, maybe it's fucked up, but how can I leave Reese behind? That's exactly what Logan did to me, what all of our mothers did, what everyone has done. Logan places both of his hands gently on my shoulders, totally disregarding Reese altogether. Let me ask you something. That day I came to your foster home and you were all beat up? He what? <laughs> you goddamn slut. I hear Reese growl, and I cringe. Logan demands my attention as one hand grazes my cheek, forcing me to look at him. Was that him? A tear falls down my cheek, and even I'm shocked by it. It's been so long since I'd last cried. Angry sobs catch in my throat as my head nods and I whisper my answer. Yes. This is fucking bullshit. Reese grabs my hand, and Logan shoves him backward in a fury. You're <laughs> really fucking lucky I do have a family I care about now, and maybe even a future, or you'd be fucking dead. His hand grips Reese's shirt as he slams him against the wall. Stay the fuck away from her, or I won't give a fuck, and you will be. He shoves him off and takes my hand in his, leading me out of the apartment, shutting the door behind us. When we get to the bottom stair, I crumple. My ass meets the step, and my head flies into my hands as I let tears fall. I feel Logan sit next to me and drape one arm over my shoulder.
Quinn, it's going to be okay. You don't need him. I look up at him, certain I'm a fucking mess, but trying not to care as I stare at his perfect features. He needs me. It's not your job to take care of him, Quinn. We were all supposed to take care of each other, remember? He swallows guilt in his eyes. I know, but things have changed and you can't be his fucking punching bag. You deserve better than that. <laughs> Says who? He places a hand over his heart. Me. I shake my head and wipe away my tears, sucking it up and sitting up straight. He's had it worse than all of us. Oh, what? He was in foster care when he was young. He had shitty parents. I mean, come on, Quinn. He was abused. He stares at me, his eyes searching mine. Weren't we all? I shake my head, my throat aching from holding back the sobs. Not just physically. I watch Logan's throat bob as he swallows and looks back up the stairs. He told you that? I nod. He was really fucking drunk, but he was crying, and I know he was telling the truth. Fuck. He stands and tugs at his hair and then leans down in front of me, his eyes asking me to focus only on him. His abuse doesn't give him the right to abuse you. You aren't his victim, Quinn. I nod my head and straighten my back. I'm nobody's victim. Then come with me. I have to know you're safe, and then maybe we can figure out a plan to help Reese, but only if I know you're okay. I stand and he rises at the same time. Okay, but I meant what I said. I won't be your summer fling. Reese's words ring in my head, and I know even if he was being an asshole and trying to hurt me, there was truth in it. Logan has a bright future, and it's foolish to think I'll have anything to do with it. Friends, Quinn. We're friends. He holds out his hand for me to take, which I do as I follow him out to his car. Maybe I need to take a cue from Logan and start thinking about myself. Chapter 14 Logan Words can't even begin to explain the rage I felt when I saw Quinn's small body caged against the wall by Reese's much larger one, his fingers digging into her perfect flesh. I could have killed the motherfucker. I thought very seriously about it. And then to hear that this wasn't the first time he'd put his hands on her. I'm still in shock that I didn't ram his head through the wall. But I guess that's what having a family behind you does. It makes you think. Four years ago, I had nothing to lose. Today, I knew I'd have a lot on the line if I were to go to jail or even prison. I couldn't do it. But I also meant what I said. The prick better stay away from Quinn. I can't believe she was holding this secret for him. I understand the feeling of obligation. It was us four against the world, and then I fucking left. They were all she had. Bile rises in my throat as I unlock the front door of Jillian and Philip's house and lead Quinn into the living room. I'll be right back. You hang out here, okay? She nods her head as she takes a tentative seat on the sofa, and I walk into the kitchen where Philip and Jillian are standing by the coffee maker their usual morning small talk taking place. It's still early, and I had a feeling they'd be home. When I woke up and went to check on Quinn and discovered she'd bolted, I'd never been more scared in my life. I have no idea why, but I knew I had to find her. I didn't give an explanation as I ran out of the house, leaving Philip and Jillian to assume I was heading to Chris's even earlier than normal. Fuck, I need to text Chris. I clear my throat and grab Jillian and Philip's attention instantly. Jillian starts toward me, already sensing something is up. Logan? I thought you went to Chris's. I shake my head. Something came up. I need to talk to you guys. Oh, fuck. You got some chick pregnant? I turn to look at Philip, who looks genuinely freaked the fuck out. What? No. I told you, I know how to wrap my shit. I'm not you. He shrugs and grabs his cup of coffee. So what then? Does this have to do with Quinn coming here last night? Recognition hits. You let her in. I guess I forgot to ask that. Yeah, we had a nice chat. Jillian laughs at that and sips her orange juice. Does this have something to do with her? I nod and take a seat at the kitchen table. Yeah, she's in trouble. Before Philip can say anything, I add, 
And no, she's not pregnant. She just needs a place to stay. Jillian sits across from me. Where are her parents? Her mom is dead, and she never knew her father. I met her in foster care. She just aged out, but she was living with an abusive shithead, and I'll be damned if I'll let her stay there. Philip and Jillian share a look, and thankfully, Jillian is the one to ask the question on both of their minds, because, Lord knows if Philip phrased it, it would be crude as fuck. Are you guys just friends? I nod my head, although after that kiss last night, I don't want to be just friends. Yes, I've known her since I was a kid. I know Jillian is one for detail, so I add, I can pay rent for her if need be, but she's working two jobs now and saving money. Maybe just a few months to help her get on her feet and out of that life. I swallow my pride as I look my father in the eye. I need this. Philip nods his head, his bottom lip puffed down as his shoulders shrug, and he sits next to Jillian, who places a hand over mine. Of course. God knows we have plenty of room. I'm all for helping this girl out. Thank fuck. Thank you, both. I nod to the living room and stand up. Don't embarrass me. I think Philip already took care of that. Jillian smiles as they follow me into the living room to meet Quinn. Quinn stands, and my chest clenches when I see the uncertainty in her once confident eyes. What she told me about Reese doesn't change how I feel. That fucker had no right to put his hands on her. Quinn, this is my stepmom, Jillian, and my father, Philip, who I guess you met last night. She smiles and nods her head, holding her hand out to shake Philip's, but gets pulled into a hug by Jillian when she tries the same thing with her. I smile, shaking my head. They said you can stay here while you figure shit out. Quinn looks surprised by that and then turns to Jillian. Just a couple days. Jillian brushes this off, and I think she has the urge to hug her again. No, sweetie. We were thinking more like a few months. Rent-free. So you can save up and then go to college or whatever you want to do. Quinn ignores the college part. You guys don't have to do this. Part of me wants to shake the fuck out of her, but that would be hypocritical. I still don't accept their generosity most of the time. Quinn, they want to. Philip nods. We do. We have a big house, and only one and a half kids so far. Quinn's eyebrow quirks up, and I fill her in. Jillian's knocked up. Jillian rolls her eyes, placing her hand on her belly, and then wrapping an arm around Quinn. I am, and I can't wait, but we still have plenty of room. The only thing is, even though Logan assures me you two are just friends, Quinn and I share a brief look that I hope they don't catch as Jillian continues. You're young, and it makes me nervous to have teenagers of the opposite sex in bedrooms right next to each other. Yeah, I mean, we have to make it a little challenging for you. Philip adds with a wink, and I think Quinn's cheeks turn pink. Nothing will happen between Logan and me, Quinn assures them, and for some reason, the statement pisses me off. Jillian gestures out the sliding glass doors of the living room. We have a beautiful, newly decorated guest house. It has a bedroom, a private bath, and even a kitchen. Although you're welcome to join us anytime. Or Logan can move out there, and you can have his room. No, the guest house is totally fine. Thank you so much. Quinn swings the duffel bag over her shoulder. I really don't know what to say, but I appreciate this. Jillian smiles. We're happy to do it. And don't worry, the backyard is fully fenced in and the guest house has a security system. It's completely safe. I smile sadly. If Jillian had any idea the world Quinn comes from and the things she's already seen, she would know that this gated community doesn't scare Quinn in the slightest. Thank you. I'll take you to your new home, I offer, starting to take the bag from her shoulder, but Jillian stops me. You had better get your ass to Chris's shop before he reams you for being late. I'll show Quinn around. What about work? I'm not sure I'm ready for Quinn to be questioned by Jillian. She shrugs, smiling warmly at Quinn. I can go in a little late. I look over at Quinn. You okay? She nods her head like I'm crazy, and I give in and take off to go get my ass chewed by Chris because I'm already late. Though, it's worth it to know Quinn is in good hands and out of abusive ones for the first time in her life. Chapter 15 Quinn
My jaw still hasn't come back up from the floor as I look around the guest house that's the size of a regular home. Okay, maybe not that big, but it's insane. There's a full kitchen, a living room fully furnished with a sofa, two chairs, a big-ass flat-screen television, and even a pool table. It has a separate bedroom with a huge bathroom that has a tub with jets and a separate shower. I turn to look at Logan's beautiful stepmother, Jillian. Her smile almost contagious, and I bet she grew up in a loving home with two parents who cherished her, probably like the old sitcoms Logan and I used to watch where everyone talked about their mundane problems around the dinner table, and everything was fixed for that week in a matter of minutes. Are you sure you want a teenager living here? It's shiny and perfect. She smiles brightly and gives a small laugh as she sits on the edge of the smooth, silky, plum-colored comforter on the perfectly made bed. Of course. I told Philip there was no need for a guest house in the first place. She smiles and looks around, shaking her head. Literally everyone we know lives here, but he insisted, and now it's finally going to get some use. I place my bag on the bed, still feeling uneasy about the whole situation, but I don't have anywhere else to go. Even if I agreed to a few months, I'm still playing everything by ear. I can't imagine taking advantage of their kindness for more than a week. I look around at the beautiful room, complete with matching bedside tables and a dresser, and another TV. I don't fit in here. I look at the black duffel bag I haphazardly shoved a few of my belongings into this morning. It's dirty and tattered in stark contrast to everything surrounding it. Thank you for letting me stay. Jillian doesn't move from her spot on the bed, tucking a strand of blonde hair behind her ear. Her pretty eyes meet my own. I know this is probably really strange, and believe me, I know trust is earned, but I want you to know that you can talk to me. Jesus, she was definitely raised with good, wholesome parents. Who talks like that? Thanks. I have no idea what to say to that, and honestly, I'm hoping she'll leave me here to get settled. I know she has to get to work. It's probably rude to say that out loud, though. She pats the bed next to her, and I stare blankly. Oh, shit. What is happening? Please sit with me for a moment. Oh, shit. I sit on the other corner of the bed, keeping some space, unsure about what this talk is going to be about. Okay. She doesn't look at me like I'm a freak, and her voice is calm and her smile is kind. Logan said that he met you when he was in foster care. I nod dumbly. How long were you in the system? I don't want to be rude. Normally, if anyone asks me these questions, I would tell them to fuck off. But there's something about Jillian, and I can see how Logan was sucked into this world. Who wouldn't want to live here? Since I was two, my mom was a junkie who overdosed, and I doubt she even knew my father. I'm sorry. I shrug it off. I don't remember her. She nods. It's hard when the people that should love us the most let us down. I study her pretty face. It's as if she speaks from experience. Logan said you're a social worker, so I guess you see kids like us all the time. She nods. Yes, I work for family services. She smiles fondly as she absently rubs her belly. And I had an amazing social worker who never gave up on me. I knew I wanted to do the same thing. I stare at her in confusion. You had a social worker? What the hell? She nods in confirmation. I did. I, um... She pauses briefly, and I see a flash of pain in her eyes. My childhood wasn't easy. I grew up with a very abusive uncle, and my mother was also an addict. Holy shit, I didn't see that coming. She seems so normal. But when things got really bad, I went into foster care. Wow, I'm sorry. I stare out the window of the bedroom looking at a glistening underground pool. Jesus, are there any sober parents anymore? She laughs at that. <laughs> Trust me, Quinn. I know it's hard to believe, but there are good people in the world. I was lucky enough to be adopted by an amazing foster family, and they showed me so much good. You were adopted out of foster care? She nods. Yeah, which I know is almost unheard of. I was so rebellious. I hated the system and fought every foster parent I had. My social worker could have easily written me off, but she didn't. She fought for me, and I'm so grateful to her.
Huh. Logan said there are good social workers out there, but I didn't believe him. She smiles. Well, I definitely try. Who knew? Anyway, I know it's a big change, and this is vastly different from what you know, but I want to help you. I can tell it's important to Logan, and it's important to me. No wonder Logan stayed here. Jillian actually does get it, which is rare for adults. It's different for sure. Do you need anything? I shake my head. I'm going to try my hardest not to be a dick, but I'm not sure just how much help I can really accept. No, thank you. I'm good. I stand from the bed. I actually have to get to my job. She nods her head, standing up. Logan mentioned you work two jobs. Will you be going to both today? I nod, not used to anyone keeping tabs on me. Yes. How are you getting there? I'll take the bus. There's a bus stop not too far from your house. She looks troubled by this. No, don't be silly. I'll take you there on my way to work. What time is your shift over? No, you really don't have to do that. I'm more than capable of taking the bus. I think she'll back down, but surprises me yet again. Believe me, I know this is a huge change for you, but you're living under my roof, and the only thing I'm going to ask is that I know you're safe. She shrugs. Annoying, I know, but we'll figure it out. Today, I'll take you to work, and then I'll ask Logan to pick you up and take you to your other job, but no bus. Is she for real? Maybe she was a street kid once, but I'm pretty sure years of living in the burbs has softened her. The bus isn't really that bad. Okay. Do I really have a choice? My shift ends at five today. Perfect. It'll be no problem for Logan to pick you up then. She pulls me into another hug that I try not to fight. I'm really not a hugger. It's going to be okay, Quinn. Trust me. And for the first time in a very long time, I actually want to give my trust to someone. But that shit isn't easy. Chapter 16 Logan I pull up at Smiley's Cafe and park just as I see Quinn walking out the glass door. Not surprisingly, she looks irritated, grabbing the door handle and climbing in. I really could have taken the bus. I laughed when Jillian sent me a text to pick up Quinn at five and knew she had already lost a battle with my stepmom, but she'll live. It beats the hell out of living with an abusive drug addict, right? I don't think that's going to happen while you're living with Philip and Jillian. She's a real pain in the ass, you know? There's no anger and barely even any irritation in her voice, and I know Jillian has already gotten to her. It happens really fucking fast and unexpectedly with Jillian. Yeah, I know. I back out of the parking spot and head toward the house. What time does your shift start at the bar? Not till nine. Cool. You can experience the oh-so-brutal family dinner. She turns to look at me, annoyance swimming on her face now with one eyebrow quirked. This is so fucking bizarre. Tell me about it. Was it like this when you moved in? I think back to when I first moved in with Philip. He was even younger and even less mature then. He had no fucking clue what he was doing, and we ate pizza pretty much every night for a while there. Nah, Jillian was just my caseworker then. They weren't a thing. But as soon as they started dating, yeah, pretty much. I merge onto the interstate that's fucking crawling at this time of day. She grill you? Kind of, but mostly she told me about her story. Ah, yeah, kind of hard to believe she's like us, right? Quinn nods her head as she stares out the window. She's so fucking normal. Maybe now, but she has a dark past. Jillian doesn't hide from her past at all. She's told me everything about growing up. She had an abusive uncle who killed her younger sister, and then she went into foster care, and her older sister, Natalie, married my grandfather, Mitch. Apparently, they didn't talk for a long time, but Jillian and Nat are pretty close these days. Jillian may seem bright and shiny, but she has a dark fucking past, which, in my own fucked up way, made it a hell of a lot easier to connect with her. Yeah, I know. I wonder what they talked about, but I don't push. But there's something bugging the hell out of me. How long was it going on, Quinn? She pries her gaze from the window, and I feel her turn to look at me. What? With Reese. How long was he fucking hitting you? I see her roll her eyes at me from my peripheral vision, 
and she looks back out the window. Don't after-school special me, Logan. I laugh at that, and finally make it to the exit, creeping off the side ramp and turning at the stoplight. Fuck, Quinn. You're only 18, not 30. And I don't think they even have after-school specials anymore. Everything is on YouTube, fucker. I chuckle and continue to fight traffic in the crowded streets. I'm serious. I want to know. She huffs, but doesn't look in my direction. Why? It doesn't change a fucking thing. Curiosity, then. Fuck, this is taking forever. She gestures towards the car stopped in front of us at the long stoplight, and then turns to look at me. I don't know. We started dating at the beginning of our sophomore year. Is she lying about that? I don't question her on it yet, and let her continue, glad she's actually talking to me. Everything was great. He was great. She shrugs. He was really fucking there for me after... She swallows, and I feel the familiar guilt take over as the light turns green and I make it to Jillian and Phillip's quiet street, parking in the driveway. After you left, she finishes, and I don't say a word as I leave the car on and turn to listen. And then I started to smell alcohol on his breath more and more, and I walked up on him shooting up out of the drive-in, and it was like something snapped. My hands smooth over my jean-clad thighs, and I fight my fists from clenching. How bad? She shrugs. Usually just shoves and slaps. Never ended up in the hospital or anything, and he never remembers it. It's like he blacks out and someone else takes over. That's still no fucking excuse. Reese was always a fucking asshole, a tough kid like all of us, but I swear to God, I never thought he would hurt Quinn. We all loved her since day fucking one. I'm not making excuses for him, Logan, but he had it worse. I still can't bring myself to ask exactly what happened to Reese. So what, Quinn? You were just going to stay there and let him black out and fucking hurt you over and over. Maybe even kill you. I'm not trying to victim blame here, but Quinn is strong. It's unfathomable to me that she stayed with him. I'm not you, Logan. I don't fucking bail. Her eyes are cold when they meet mine with anger, and I have to admit, that stings. I didn't have a fucking choice. She grabs the door handle and opens the door, flying out of the car, and I follow after turning the engine off. I catch up to her at the front door. I don't think she has a key yet. She stands there, arms crossed and angry. Bullshit! We all have choices! Her hand raises as she gestures at the house. I get why you stayed. Believe me, I do. This life, it's fucking great. But you could have fucking called. You could have checked in. But you didn't want to. Her hand points at my chest. You didn't want to. Admit it. Have some fucking balls and admit this life was far too enticing. Fine. I raise my hands in frustration and surrender. I didn't want to go back to that life. Who the fuck would? She nods in satisfaction, as if we've had some sort of breakthrough. Finally. Don't, Quinn. I thought you were doing just fucking fine without me. You say you didn't start dating Reese until your sophomore year, but when did you start fucking him? What the hell are you talking about? Before I can answer her, two cars pull up, one next to mine and one right behind mine. I recognize the one parked behind my car as Jillian's, and she climbs out. Philip climbs out of the other car, a four-door Honda that's a few years old, and they both walk up to us. Jillian looks concerned as she approaches, and I try to cool down, knowing just how intuitive she is. What's going on? Philip looks only slightly concerned, standing next to her. Yeah, this conversation doesn't look all that friendly. Quinn isn't one to give too much away and shakes it off. No big deal. They don't believe us, but I changed the subject, pointing back at the charcoal gray Honda. Whose car? Philip and Jillian share a look, and Philip holds out the keys to Quinn. All yours, kiddo. Quinn doesn't move, and her pretty eyes bug out of her head, which honestly, I would find comical as fuck if I wasn't still worked up from our conversation. She holds up her right hand, essentially stopping him, and shakes her head. No. She turns to Jillian. You bought me a car? Jillian doesn't answer, but Philip does. It's used. No big deal. We just don't want you riding the bus by yourself. He nudges my shoulder. And we didn't want you to have to rely on this little shit the whole time you live here. Quinn shakes her head again, clearly uncomfortable, and I know exactly what she's feeling. I can't accept a car. 
The bus is totally fine. She looks at me for help, but I don't say a word. Maybe it's petty. Okay, it's petty as fuck, but I don't give a shit right now. What? I'm not a fan of you riding the bus either, Quinn. You know I can handle myself. Jillian takes Quinn's hand in her own, using her soft voice to lull her into comfort. Damn, she's good. The point is, you shouldn't have to handle yourself. I know how dangerous the world can be. And if it being your car makes you uneasy, then it can be ours that you're using for now. I mean, we've been meaning to get a backup car anyway, you know, just in case. She's really fucking good. Quinn is still completely against the idea, but I can tell she's going to give in. She's had to fight her whole life. Maybe she understands that this isn't worth the fight. Jillian has something about her that makes you realize she's genuine and actually cares. Philip holds the keys out to Quinn again, and she reluctantly takes them. Thank you for letting me use your car. Philip just grins. Say what you want about my father. He is really good at brushing off other people's attitudes. No problem. We're going to order dinner. Why don't you guys go get settled? Quinn takes the opportunity to exit as soon as Jillian unlocks the front door, but Jillian and Philip both block my way into the house. What was that about, kid? Philip folds his arms, not letting me cross the threshold. It was nothing. A discussion among old friends. Listen to me. I know this is weird coming from me. Philip uncrosses his arms and places one on my shoulder. But don't be a fucking dick. This is a huge change. And I know you know exactly what she's going through. I nod, unable to argue, but still feeling the same jealousy I did when I was 14 years old. How much of Quinn's story am I missing? Chapter 17 Quinn Fuck Logan. What the hell does he mean he thought I was just fine without him? I was completely crushed, and that asshole thought I was fine? He's insane. Along with his parents, they let me move in, and now I'm using their car? Who does that? I stare out the glass doors of the guest house as rain pours down from the sky. It's late, and I just got back from my second job. The tips were shit tonight, and it was so dead I couldn't wait to leave, even if it meant coming back here. I have my driver's license from driver's education in high school, but have never had a car to drive. There was something freeing about being behind the wheel, but also terrifying because it's not my car. This life is only borrowed, and I need to keep that in mind. Dinner was so awkward tonight. Logan didn't say one word to me, and Jillian and Philip did their best to keep the small talk flowing, but I wasn't into it either. I couldn't wait to get out of there and bolted as soon as I could. I jump when I see an image flash in front of the glass doors until I realize it's Logan. He's in a t-shirt and gray joggers, and it looks like he's getting drenched as he knocks on the glass. Part of me wants to leave him locked out, but I also know him and know he will stand out there all night. I walk to the door and flip the lock, barely prying it open. What? We need to finish our talk. No, we don't. He doesn't move. Quinn, I was a dick. I get it, but you're living here now. You can't avoid me. That's definitely not true. I'm a great avoider, and I live out here. Not in there. Still, I sigh and move out of the way so he can walk inside, which of course he does. He's not entirely soaked, but his blonde, shaggy hair is pretty wet. Fat raindrops slide down the side of his face, and he doesn't flinch. Thanks for letting me in. Don't get too comfortable. I plan to kick you out pretty soon. It's late. He doesn't fight me, but he does sit down on the sofa. I realize I had no right to be jealous of you and Reese. I take a seat next to him, totally confused. What are you talking about? When were you jealous? His fingers glide through his wet hair, and I know he's trying to play it cool, yet I can see the nervousness in his eyes. I saw you guys. Saw us what? His large shoulders shrug upward. That night I was arrested. I saw you. My heart attacks my chest with ravenous thumps, and eyes widen when the recognition hits. Logan. He raises a hand to silence me. It doesn't matter. It's not like you were mine, Quinn. I had no reason to fly off the fucking handle and start that bar fight, but I did. Oh my god, that's why he got into that fight? Logan always knew how to handle himself, but starting a fight never sounded like him. Logan, 
I don't know what you saw, but... He interrupts me again. I saw his lips on yours. He shakes his head as if he's trying to shake off the memory. But like I said, I had no fucking claim to you. Thinking back, you were just as much his. I didn't sleep with him for a while. He nods his head, running his fingers through his hair again, looking out the large glass doors. Yeah, I caught something about you making him wait. And yet you still accused me of being a slut. I pause, fighting with myself, trying to decide if I should tell him. I was waiting for you. He looks back at me, question in his eyes. What do you mean? The words are hard to say. You were my first kiss. I wanted you to be my first everything. He swallows with a pained expression on his face. His voice is hoarse. Everything? I nod, slightly embarrassed. Everything, I confirm, and then try to shake it off. His tone today when he asked when I had started fucking Reese rings in my head as he groans loudly. I was a dick, a jealous dick. I'm not sure what you saw that night, but when Reese kissed me, it wasn't returned. I wasn't into him then. He leans forward, his elbows resting on his knees. You weren't? God, boys are stupid. No, I was completely into you. Fuck. He drops his arms and sits up straight, facing me. I really fucked everything up. I shake my head and look around the gorgeous guest house. No, you really didn't. Logan, look at the life you had. You wouldn't have any of this if... If what? We would have started dating? That's where I thought we were headed, and then he disappeared. If you wouldn't have gotten arrested that night. I was so pissed off, Quinn. My mom. Then I thought you and Reese were together. I was so fucking angry. I let my pride get the better of me. That's why I didn't call. And then too much time went by, and I was sure you hated me. I did. I fold my arms over the plain white t-shirt I wear to bed. He doesn't look surprised, and I nudge his arms with mine. But I don't know. I don't now. Not really. That brings a small smile to his lips. I'll try not to be a jealous fucker anymore. Sounds good. I swallow nervously and tuck my blonde hair behind my ear. What about Reese? What about him? You said we would try to help him. His hands smooth along his sweats and he looks exasperated. How can you still be worried about him, Quinn? He beat the shit out of you. That should be unforgivable. When the hell did you become so black and white? Right and wrong with no fucking gray area? He's an addict, Logan. And when the hell did you become a martyr? I stand up, angry all over again. No one has ever made me go back and forth between anger and happiness faster than Logan Davis. Just because I'm taking a little vacation to the burbs doesn't mean I'm forgetting about my old life. He stands up, dwarfing my small frame. Like me. Yes, like you. You ran, and that's fine. But that's not me, and you damn sure know it. You really think he's going to accept any kind of help? I don't know, but I have to try. He raises his hands in front of him, his fingers curling, frustration on his face. Fuck, you are so damn stubborn. I'm not the only one. He shakes his head and drops his arms to his sides. Okay, we'll try to help Reese. Just don't go back there without me, okay? He'll never talk to me with you. That's the deal, Quinn. I look up at him, knowing he's my match when it comes to being hard-headed. Fine. Soon? He nods. Soon. He sits back down on the couch, kicking his bare, wet feet up on the coffee table. Guess we aren't finished talking. I sit down next to him, probably a little closer than I should, as he wraps an arm over my shoulder. It doesn't feel like a cheesy move. It feels like old times. Except his scent has changed slightly. Manly cologne mixed with a summer rain. And it's admittedly fucking delicious. Tattoos, huh? He grins proudly. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Who did yours? My uncle. He turns to look at me, his handsome face, far too close. And I have to fight the urge to bite his puffy bottom lip. Maybe I should get up and sit across the room. This urge isn't normal. You have any? 
I feel his heated gaze slide over my body and fight the urge to hide. No, I've never been passionate enough about anything to have it permanently scrawled on my body. He tilts his head in disbelief. Come on, Quinn, that's not true. You used to love music. Seriously, what happened? My throat tightens. You left and things just changed. My foster father at the time smashed my guitar and I just realized how fucking stupid it was. It wasn't stupid. I still hear your voice in my head. You used to help us all sleep with your songs. You used to make everything so much better. You did that. With music. I'll never forget the night Sean's grandma died and we all sat in a circle in Logan's mom's apartment. I sang to him while he leaned on my shoulder, and I smoothed his hair until he fell asleep. We were a family. We were all we had. Drop it, please. I played a song for you the other day. He grins. When you're ready to have that guitar, it's yours. And it's not doing a damn thing laying on my bedroom floor. I smile and roll my eyes, feigning annoyance. I'll think about it. He nods his head, looking as if he won the fight as he stands up. I fucked up four years ago, and I've been fucking sorry for it every single day. I didn't forget about any of you. I couldn't. I tried. I know your instinct is to bail. I look up at him from my spot on the couch, not arguing. Don't. He whispers it and then gives a quick wave before slipping outside into the rain and disappearing into the house. How does he still know me so well? Chapter 18. Logan. I can't believe I agree to this shit. I pull open the door to the apartment building Quinn was staying with Reese and Sean and try not to focus on Quinn's ass and her shorts as she climbs the stairs. At least she kept her word and came to me before she came here. We reach the apartment and she turns to me, taking a deep breath. He really won't like that you're here. I don't fucking care. And I mean it. The moment he laid a hand on Quinn, he lost any bit of caring for me. Fuck him. She rolls her pretty eyes, lined in black, and knocks on the door. Moments later, Reese, shirtless and very clearly high as fuck, opens the door in a rage. What the fuck are you doing here, Quinn? He turns his glare on me. And with him? I want to talk to you, Reese. What's the matter, Quinn? Pretty boy can't get you off, so you come running back? Yeah, that makes sense, dipshit, since she brought me with her. Fucker. Reese glares at me, leaning in. And why did she bring you, huh? She won't give it up until you come back here and help the man she actually wants? You thought we'd been fucking this whole time, and that's why you're so pissed? I guess the shit you're on makes it pretty fucking hard to keep shit straight. He growls low in his throat, ready to attack, and Quinn just huffs, moving between us. Stop. I'm not here to referee your dumbass egos. You need help, and I think I found a program that will help you. Fuck your rehab, Quinn. Jillian gave Quinn several sources and places that will work with people on fees, but I knew he wouldn't take any help. You need to deal with the shit that happened. He starts to lunge at her, and I push past her, shoving him backward before he can touch her. Keep your fucking hands to yourself. I don't know what the fuck she told you, but it's all bullshit. I look into his weary red eyes, and all I see is pain. No, it's not. She wants to help you, and you should take it. Fuck you, Logan. Reese, you can't live like this. You're going to end up dead. I'm already dead, Quinn. His cold eyes meet hers. Stop trying to save the unsavable. It's insane. He shoves me backward and over the threshold, slamming the door. Quinn, defeated, slides down the wall, putting her knees up to her chest, her hands gripping her hair. I kneel down in front of her. You can't force someone to get help. I can't just leave him here. Her need to save him guts me, but I fight it. That fucker saying he's the man she really wants got under my skin. You don't have a choice. He doesn't want help. What's going on? I turn around to see Sean standing behind us with a couple of grocery bags in his hands. Quinn stands, smoothing her shorts. I found a treatment place for Reese. Sean smiles already knowing how the conversation went. Reese doesn't want sobriety, but he needs it. Sean just waves her off. You got out, Quinn. Don't look back. Fucking run as far away from here as you can. She looks destroyed by his statement, but I'm grateful he's on my side. 
He's like a brother to you. How can you not care? Sean walks over to the door, covering his heart with his hand. I'm still here, and I'm not going anywhere. I do care. But you have a shot to get out. Fucking take it. Quinn is furious, but she doesn't say a word, just flies down the stairs, leaving us behind. Sean sighs as he watches her leave and then turns to me. Take care of her. I nod. I'll try. I look at the wooden door. What the hell happened to him? Life? I nod, knowing what he means and hating it. I pull out the crumpled paper with the rehab information and hand it to him. They'll work with low income. He laughs at that, both of us knowing it's never going to happen. Thanks. I start toward the stairs and then turn with a smirk. Lyric, huh? He chuckles slightly. It worked, didn't it? I laugh and place my hands in my pockets. I mean, not much doesn't with Melody. I still have no idea what happened between them, but I see the same look he had the night she hugged him flash briefly on his face. If I didn't know better, I would say that airhead has him fucked up. He flips me off and goes into his apartment. I don't think he harbors the same hatred for me as Reese. Sean has always been a go-with-the-flow kind of guy and doesn't let much bother him. I kind of miss that fucker. I turn and walk down the stairs, meeting Quinn outside. She's leaning against my car, arms crossed, in all attitude. You should have let me come alone. That wasn't going to happen, and it wouldn't have mattered. Bullshit, Logan. He needs help. I unlock the door and walk around to the driver's side. You gotta leave it up to him, Quinn. You know that. I never believed that rock-bottom bullshit. It's all rock-fucking-bottom for us. She huffs and yanks my door open, climbing in the car. She's a real pain in the ass, this one. I look up to the sky, fighting a guttural yell up at the heavens, and climb in, starting the car. Where now? She ignores my question completely. He's going to die. I should care about her statement, and maybe deep down I do. But another fucking part of me, a much darker part, doesn't. Addicts are people I should probably have the deepest sympathy for. But at the end of the day, they're who I resent the most in this world. And he hurt Quinn over and over, allowing his addiction to take over and put his hands on the girl we all vowed to protect. I drive toward Jillian and Philip's house, and we both remain silent as she sulks. And I wonder why the fuck she cares so damn much. And I realize I'm really not keeping my promise about not being a jealous dick. Because jealousy is all I feel. Chapter 19. Logan. Not bad. I stare at the sketch before me, a memorial for a lady who lost her son. She came into the shop, telling us the story of her son in his short 20 years on this planet, and Chris trusted me with the design. I'll make sure it's perfect. My door creaks, and I can't fight my excitement as I watch it open. Quinn? It's late, and we haven't talked for a few days since the mess with Reese but I've been waiting for her. A black heel steps inside my room, and my eyebrow quirks with intrigue, but then I realize it's Blair sneaking into my room, not Quinn. Fuck, I completely forgot about Blair. I really am an asshole. Blair, what are you doing here? You know Jillian doesn't want me to have chicks over this late. She rolls her eyes and closes the door behind her. Whatever, she didn't even hear me come in. I'm really starting to regret giving her the security code and showing her that the side door is usually unlocked. Fucking suburbs. Everyone feels safe. Of course, when I told her that, all I could think about was the nice ways Blair liked to wake me up. What's up? She steps out of her shoes and walks toward my bed, shrugging her petite shoulders, biting her bottom lip. I haven't seen you since graduation. Where the fuck have you been? Busy. She rolls her eyes, lowering the thin strap of her pink sundress. Too busy to fuck? That's new. Look, a lot happened, and things are really fucking complicated now. Again, her eyes roll, as she places a knee on my bed, stalking her prey. I don't care about complicated. You know, easy has always been my thing. Exactly why she was so appealing. She climbs on the bed, her body meeting mine, as her lips find my neck. Seriously, my head's kind of fucked up right now. Her mouth trickles lower down my bare chest. I really should stop her. I'm really not interested in what's in your head. Christ, 
I mean, what 18-year-old guy doesn't want to hear that? She raises her head, her long blonde hair tickling my chest as her eyes lock on mine. Look, it's been a while, and I'm horny, and here. What's the holdup? She's right. I mean, Quinn living in Philip and Jillian's guest house really shouldn't stop me from fucking Blair. She's so busy worrying about Reese that she definitely isn't thinking about me. Her lips find mine, and for a moment, I let myself get lost, my fingers sliding through her silky hair. There's a familiarity in kissing her, almost a comfort in the ease which she allows me into her body without making me work for it. And then I hear a slight gasp and Quinn's voice. Shit, I'm sorry. And then the click of my bedroom door. Oh, fuck. Blair pulls back, and my head leans against the headboard. Who the hell was that? I lift Blair's body off mine and roll off the bed, offering no explanation. I'll be back. I rush out into the hall and down the stairs, catching up with Quinn in the kitchen as she's trying to make her exit. Quinn, wait. She spins on bare feet and looks at me, horrified. Her large white t-shirt she must wear to bed only lands at her mid-thigh, and truth be told, drives me insane with want. Why the hell are you following me? Looks like you had something better upstairs. Her cold glare tips up toward the ceiling, and then her eyes meet mine. Jealous, Quinn? She folds her arms over her chest. Of course not. You can do whatever the hell you want. I walk closer to her. What were you doing in my room? I wasn't looking for the same thing as Miss Fake Boobs, I promise. My eyes rum down her small body to her bare legs and back up to her pretty face. Sure sounds like jealousy, Quinn. You're wrong. Then what were you doing? She huffs and grabs the handle to the door. Don't worry about it. I'll talk to you when you aren't busy. She slides the door open and walks out into the dark night, slamming it closed. Fuck. What the hell did you do this time? I hear my father's voice behind me and turn around. His hair is tousled, and he's only wearing a black pair of sweatpants. It's late, but something tells me he wasn't sleeping. Fuck, that's really not an image I want in my head. Nothing. What are you doing out here? Jillian heard a noise and insisted I check it out. What the hell kind of teenage angst are we dealing with? It's nothing. Right. He places a hand on my shoulder. Do I need to tell you again? I wasn't being a dick. I didn't do shit to her. I didn't, right? He laughs at that as he starts back toward his bedroom. Trust me, kid. If she's that pissed, you did something. Let me know if you want to talk about it. I stare out the window and see the light flick on in the guest house, and then quickly turn off. I have no idea what to do, so I head back upstairs and decide to put out that fire first. Blair is sitting on the edge of my bed when I walk back into my room, her legs crossed casually. What the hell was that about? She doesn't look pissed in the slightest, more like bored. That would be the complication I was talking about. Who is she? Her manicured right eyebrow raises, but she seems fairly indifferent. An old friend. She's staying in the guest house while she gets back on her feet. Friend or lover? I take a seat next to Blair. Friend. We were 14 the last time I saw her. We've been friends forever. She turns to face me, her full red painted lips near mine. Didn't seem like a friend the way she flew out of here. Yeah, that has me messed up. Why was she coming up to my room this late at night? I don't know. She bites her bottom lip. And I have to admit, even if our personalities don't mesh, I am insanely attracted to her. So, is this happening tonight or not? I look out my window. For what? I have no idea. The answer isn't out there. Not tonight. Are you seriously turning me down because of a friend? She looks amused, like she knows something I don't. I'm just not in the mood, and I have to finish a sketch. She looks surprised but brushes it off, standing up and slipping into her heels. Your fucking loss. She leaves, and I lay back on my bed, covering my eyes with my hands and groaning. What the fuck is happening to me? Chapter 20 Quinn What the hell is wrong with me? I shouldn't care that Logan had the fake-ass, fully-primped chick in his room last night, but I do. 
I can't think about anything else. What it would be like to feel him underneath my body. I know what his lips feel like on mine, and that thought sends a full, excited shiver through me. Stop, Quinn, that's a dangerous road. Why can't I just listen to my instincts? I've relied on my instincts my entire life. I come back from the bar and try my best to be as quiet as I can, sneaking through the big-ass house and out to the backyard and putting my key in the lock of the guest house, but stop when I look down. No way. Sitting right outside the glass door is a white piece of paper and a package of goldfish crackers. I pick them up and read the note. Quinn, I was a dick. Again. I guess I never totally took your advice and toughened up. I'm sorry, Logan. Holy shit. I smile, holding the snack I gave him when we first met, and the note in my trembling hands. I'll never forget the first time I saw him, shivering and skinny, crying in the corner, missing his mom. I was drawn to him. I needed to help him. I may have only been four years old, but it's a memory that'll never escape me. Instead of unlocking the door to the guest house, I make my way back into the main house, creeping quietly up the stairs. Please let him be alone this time. I push open his door slowly, seeing it's pitch black in the room, and take a deep breath. Logan. I whisper into the dark. I hear him groan softly and the outline of him in bed stirring. Logan. I whisper louder. Quinn? I nod and walk inside the room carefully as he sits up on the bed, turning the lamp on his nightstand on, gloriously shirtless. It's insane how muscular his body is now, cut and defined, but tall and lanky, different from Reese's stocky muscles. Both nice, I can't lie. He nods to the package in my hand. You found my present. I grin. Nice touch. I'm usually pretty hungry after a shift. He pats the bed next to him, the covers still covering his lap. Well, let's break them open. I'm starving. I take a seat and pull the package open, taking a few out and offering him some. He takes a handful and we eat in silence for a moment, my mind going through all the years we had together, sharing this exact snack. I'm sorry I freaked out last night. He shrugs, swallowing a mouthful of the orange crackers. I'm sorry you had to see that. It shouldn't have bothered me. Why did it? The candidness of his question makes me swallow hard and think about feelings I don't want to face. I don't know. I stand up and walk to his dresser. It's strange seeing you like this. He stays put on the bed. Like what? My fingers glide over the picture he has of Reese, Sean, him, and me from our seventh grade field trip to the Kansas City Zoo. We got in so much trouble because we snuck off from our class group and went on our own little tour. Detention for the next week was fucking worth it. We had a blast, just the four of us. We always did. Groan. I turn and face him. You were a boy when you left, and now you're this man. I roll my eyes when he smirks, and a full-on whore from what I can tell. He chuckles easily at that, not letting it bug him, which is different too. Not much bothered him when we were younger, but the laugh is different. He was the quiet, serious one, but now it's clear he has a light in his life he never had before. First of all, he takes another handful of crackers in his hand. I don't get paid for my services, so if anything, I'm a slut. He puts the crackers in his mouth, chewing and swallowing before shrugging his big, toned shoulders. Second of all, I pretty much only fuck around with Blair, so I'm not even a slut. I'm a fucking choir boy compared to most guys our age. I turn back to look at the mirror with pictures all around it. A picture of him with Blair, all dressed up, grabs my attention. She looks posh and beautiful, her makeup and hair perfected, and I'm sure it took hours to achieve that look. Her short black dress shows off her tanned, toned body and full boobs. Logan looks handsome in a black tux and bow tie, although slightly uncomfortable and irritated, as Blair leans into him for the perfect picture moment. You took her to prom? Yeah, mostly for Jillian. She wanted me to have a normal childhood so fucking bad. I smile at that and join him on the bed. Sounds like her. Yeah, it wasn't so bad.
I turned to look back at the picture of Blair, who is the complete opposite of me and everyone we grew up with. Spoiled little rich girl. Why her? He shrugs and leans back against his headboard. Blair? I nod and look over at him. A mistake, because I can't stop my eyes from dragging up the muscles of his ripped stomach and then smile when I see his right peck tattoo, just the word tough in gothic letters. Yes, she's just so fucking polished, prim and proper, and fucking fake. He chuckles at that, not arguing. I don't know. He lifts one arm, tucking it behind his head, causing his bicep to flex. God, I'm turning into a perv, gawking at him like an idiot. Actually, maybe I do. He looks up at the ceiling, a thoughtful look on his gorgeous face, his throat pulled tight. Everything has been so fucking hard since day one in my life. And Blair? She's just... I finish for him. Easy. His eyes meet mine. Yeah, totally uncomplicated. Doesn't want anything from me, but my dick. Nice image, Logan. You really believe that? He nods his head emphatically. Yeah, trust me. She doesn't want to talk. She doesn't make me do shit with the exception of prom and going to find Sean for Mel. I mean, hell, last night after you walked in on us, she barely asked for any fucking explanation at all, because she simply doesn't care. That's hard to believe. God knows I would question the fuck out of him if the situation were reversed. Maybe she is just an airhead, slutty girl craving his dick. I fight the urge to scan over his lap at that thought. Does she fuck other guys? He shrugs. We don't really talk about it, Quinn. She's free to do whatever she wants, and so am I. But you don't. He leans forward, his face a lot closer to mine now. I haven't wanted to. She doesn't force me to talk. She doesn't try to change me. His hand sweeps my hair out of my face. She doesn't frustrate or confuse the shit out of me. There's an unspoken, like you do, in his voice that makes me actually gulp as his hand freezes in place on my cheek. Are you in love with Reese? My heart clenches tightly in my chest at his question, one I don't have an answer to. I don't know. My voice is raspy and raw with emotion because I truly don't. I definitely care about Reese, even if I shouldn't. He was there for me, and he's been through so much, Logan. He's been hurt and damaged, just like us, but far worse. That's not really an answer, Quinn. His tone isn't harsh, and his voice is low and husky as he watches me. It's the only one I have, I'll always care for him, and I know you don't understand that, but I can't help it. It wasn't all bad with him. He nods his head as if he does understand. Why did you come to my room last night? My head turns to the other side of the bed, to the beautiful golden acoustic guitar. I came in to take my guitar. He smiles, and his hand falls to his lap. Good. I don't know if I'll play it. He reaches across the bed, picks it up, and hands it to me. It's yours, whether it only sits there, which would be a fucking tragedy, or you play it every free second. It's yours. I take it from him, loving the way it feels in my hands, the weight of it resting against my lap. Thank you. You have a gift. Don't let it go to waste just because life is hard. I smile and hold the now-empty cracker packet and the note to my heart. I'll try my best. Good night, Logan. Good night, Quinn. I take my guitar, note, and empty package and walk back to the guest house, placing the guitar next to my bed and laying down to go to sleep. I pray that someday I'll get my love of music back and will indeed toughen up. Chapter 21 Logan Wow. This is so unbelievably perfect. The woman looks at me with fat tears in her eyes and then stares at her fresh tattoo. Her son was a soldier who lost his life overseas, and the memorial to him turned out even better than the sketch. I'm glad you're happy with it. Her glossy eyes meet mine as she places a hand over her heart. Ricky would love it. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. The wrist tattoo is small, but she wanted it there so she could always see it when she needed to. It's unfair that she's a mother who actually wanted to be a mother, 
and then lost her son. The world is full of bullshit irony. She hugs me tightly and then walks to our new receptionist, Kat, to make her payment. Chris finally broke down and recently hired someone to answer the phones and take payments. They used to handle it themselves, but now that I'm working toward getting my license, Chris figured it was time. Kat's cool, though, 20 and a total badass with black hair and ripped jeans. She fits right in. The satisfied customer leaves, and Chris walks over, gripping my shoulder. Not bad, kid. Thanks, Chris. I feel a sense of pride at his approval. He takes a seat next to his customer and nods his head to me as he starts on his own masterpiece. So, Philip says you have a shitload of teen angst going on at his place now. I should be used to the open conversations around here. Nothing is off the table, and I think the customers come here for the possible juicy stories as much as the art. Ty's ears perk up as he works on a guy in his 40s, getting his first tattoo. Oh, say it isn't so. What's the matter, kid? Can't decide who to take to prom? Prom was a month ago, asshole. I start to clean my station and look over at Chris. No angst, just an old friend that came back. A lady friend? Jay asks from his station, raising his eyebrows playfully. You fuckers need a life. Chris laughs. Philip said you had a screaming match in his kitchen the other night. Fucked up his chance at getting laid. My nose crinkles at that image. No one wants to think about their parents fucking, and that's exactly what Jillian and Philip are to me now. Good. They all laugh at that, and Frankie ruffles my hair. A friend from the past. Finally. Something interesting. I shake it off. It's nothing. She really is a friend. One that makes my cock hard just thinking about her soft lips. And there's no drama. Then why the screaming match? Chris asks. It was nothing. Philip is a fucking drama queen. That gets a laugh from everyone. Ty, of course, won't let the conversation die. What about that hot blonde that comes in here sometimes? With the fake tits? He would notice her tits. Blair. Right, that one. What about her? We still hang out. Fucking player. Jay chuckles, but there's a strange sense of pride from him. Probably because he's the epitome of a player. Fucker will never settle down. You're one to talk. Frankie, of course, calls him out. The bell to the front door dings, and Morgan, Jay's younger sister, walks in, having a chat with Kat and I watch Ty's eyes follow her before he turns to me. Never fuck around with two women at once, man. That shit never works. I raise my right eyebrow at him. No from experience? Jay looks over at Ty, eyeing him, and then looks at his little sister, who he's fiercely fucking protective over. I mean, the guy will rip your eyes out for even looking in her direction. Ty laughs it off and shakes his head. Fuck no. I'm just smart enough to know better. It seems like there's a message to Jay in his words, but who the fuck knows? Jay goes back to his work of art, and Ty cracks his neck, taking one last glance at Morgan. There's nothing going on with Quinn, and Blair is a fuck buddy. Fuck buddies rarely work out, kid. Chris offers advice from his station. It's working just fine. He laughs at that. Be careful. You taking one of them to Levi's tomorrow? Fuck, I forgot about dinner at Levi's. Usually we have a big family dinner every Friday, but lately everyone's been busy and it's been a few weeks. I don't know. Bring them both. It's been a while since we've had some good old-fashioned drama at dinner. Could use the entertainment. I flip my uncle off and grab my sketchbook and head to the break room. Quinn and I have been on good terms since I left her that note, but I'm not sure she's ready to be exposed to my entire family. But there's a part of me that really wants her in that world with me. Chapter 22. Quinn. Seriously? Do they all own mansions? I stare up at the big-ass house in front of me, manicured lawn, four-car garage, a striking resemblance to Philip and Jillian's. I wonder if they have a teenager staying in their guest house. I can't believe you talked me into this. I walk beside Logan and behind Philip and Jillian, who approach the door first. You'll be fine. He whispers as a beautiful brunette opens the door and hugs Jillian. Oh my god, I've missed you, little sis, the woman says to Jillian as she squeezes her tight. Jillian laughs happily as she hugs her back. 
It hasn't even been a month. The woman finally releases her. I know, but we went for years without seeing each other. We have to do better. Jillian agrees, and I wonder why they went without seeing each other. But this must be the sister that was married to Logan's grandfather and then married his uncle. Fucked up, but she looks so normal. Although drop dead gorgeous. A tattooed man with blue eyes walks behind her, wrapping his arm around her and nodding to Philip. You're fucking late as usual, shithead. Must be his brother. Levi? I think that's what Logan said in the quick rundown of his family. I'm never going to be able to keep them all straight. Logan. The guy looks behind Philip and Jillian at us. Who's your friend? Logan rolls his eyes at the man I'm assuming is his uncle. Levi and Natalie, this is my friend, Quinn. Quinn, this is one set of my aunts and uncles. Levi holds a hand out for me to shake, and I do, and then he winks. We're the best ones. Dream on, fucker. We all know that's me. Philip laughs as he pushes past Levi and walks inside. Natalie and Jillian just roll their eyes and smile, letting Logan and I walk in. There are young kids flying through the room, chasing each other and giggling, and the dining room is full as we walk inside. The house is huge and the furniture is nice, but somehow not pretentious. Everyone is wearing jeans and casual attire, and the food is home-cooked and smells delicious. A man with icy blue eyes and also a lot of tattoos walks up, smiling at Logan. Jesus, how do you tell them all apart? Has to be the other brother. I'm assuming this is Quinn. Logan nods his head as a gorgeous, tattooed woman walks up and stands next to the man. Yes, Quinn, this is my Uncle Chris and his wife Amy. A young blonde boy runs by making a car noise and Chris laughs. That's Wyatt, one of our sons. I smile and nod my head politely, glad that they aren't all dressed up like the fancy country club fuckers I expected them to be. I fit in well with my ripped jeans and black tank top I had to wear because I'm heading to the bar for my shift after dinner. Another stunning blonde walks up with blue eyes that match the rest, full of attitude and confidence. Logan brought a girl to dinner, no fucking way. Logan shakes it off. This is Quinn, Leslie, and we're friends. He turns to me. This is my Aunt Leslie. He looks around. I don't see Evie here. Evie's the youngest sister from what I remember. Logan said she's kind of antisocial. A man walks up behind Leslie, grabbing her hips and staying behind her. You know she never makes it to this stuff, and we did the friend thing for a while. Yeah, we are actually friends, Cash. The drop-dead gorgeous man behind Logan's Aunt Leslie just chuckles at that. This is Leslie's husband, Cash Phillips. I've heard his name before. Honestly, it's hard not to know who the famous racer is. Cash Phillips and the Adamson boys go hand in hand. I don't follow racing, but I know who they are. Along with Shriller the Thriller, Michael Monroe, and Tate Pearson. They're all local racing celebrities, and their fucking faces are posted all over the city. Okay, now that we've all embarrassed Logan enough, let's eat, Amy announces, and I'm so fucking grateful for that as we take a seat. The food tastes as good as it smells, and we dig in for a few moments of silence before Leslie starts a conversation. So, how do you two know each other? You go to school together? Logan wipes his mouth with a cloth napkin. We did, when I lived with my mom. We were in foster care together. I notice the uncomfortable shift in the room and try not to laugh. This group doesn't seem like anything would make them uncomfortable. Wow, so you go way back. The beautiful woman muses as she feeds the toddler sitting on her lap. Yeah, we do. I answer awkwardly. What was Logan like when he was a kid? Was he silent and broody like he is now? His uncle Levi asks as he takes a drink of his water. I laugh at that because he's always been the quiet one, but he seems a lot less broody now than he was. He was always quiet, I guess. Logan just shakes his head at his uncle. Chris shoots his brother a look. There's nothing wrong with not running your mouth constantly. That's because Logan is exactly like you were, Philip fires back. You assholes are going to scare her off, Amy laughs, sipping her wine. It's actually really entertaining, sitting back and absorbing the Adamsons. There's something else. After dinner, I escape to the backyard for a moment while they all convene in the kitchen for cake and wine. I hear the sliding glass door and feel Logan behind me before he even speaks. Too much? I shake my head, gazing up at the night sky, basking in the warmth of the summer. 
You remember when we were little kids and we used to daydream about having a big family dinner with lots of people and good food? Yeah, and then when we got older, we decided we would have to make our own families. I smile and turn to look at him. I'm so happy you have that. I fought it hard at first. My nose scrunches as I stare through the glass door at his beautiful family. Why? I felt guilty as fuck that I had that. His throat bobs. And you guys didn't. I always felt like you were different from us in some way. I gesture at the kitchen. And I was right. You had this waiting for you. They're amazing, and it's obvious they really care about you and each other. They didn't always have that. He smiles. I mean, they had money, but not the parents and the dinners and stuff. Yeah, I noticed no grandparents. They died, but still, from what I gather, they were shit. So they made their own families. I smile at that, and I notice the way he's looking at me. Intense, with need and hunger that gives me goosebumps. And when he starts to lean in for a kiss, I don't stop it. Of course, fate has a different plan, and the door whooshes open, making us both step back. His uncle Levi is grinning when he asks, Did I interrupt something? Logan runs his finger through his hair, playing it cool. No, what's up? Dessert, he addresses Logan. You know what you should do is blow it off and take her for a ride on your new bike. My right eyebrow quirks. You have a motorcycle? Logan shrugs with a cocky grin I now know he got from all the men in his family. Turns out your description of graduation was pretty much dead on, except I got a motorcycle instead of a car. I can't help the laugh. <laughs> Spoiled fucker. Sounds like a good time though, right? Levi adds, mischievous grin in place. Logan turns to me for the answer. Um, I actually have to get to work. I drove separately and I really should head out soon. That's too bad. You're young, play hooky. Logan laughs, his smile bright and beautiful. <laughs> Levi, you're such a bad fucking influence. Doesn't bother Levi in the slightest. Yeah, yeah, you kids have fun, dessert is ready. He walks back inside and Logan turns back to me. You want cake before you go? Nah, I'm stuffed. I'll see you later. Yeah, be safe. I wave and walk out of the gate and walk to the car parked in front. All those years I spent hating him were wasted because now that I see him with his family, I could never hate him for it. Chapter 23, Logan Quinn fit right in with my family. Not that I should be shocked. She's cool as fuck, and honestly, so are they. They seemed to really like her, and of course they grilled the shit out of me after she left. But my mind was on almost kissing her, before my uncle so kindly cock-blocked me. Fuck, I wanted to kiss her. I smile when I see headlights from the front yard and hear the car door close. Waiting outside the guest house for her to come home is probably desperate as fuck. But what the hell. Quinn walks through the back door and smiles when she sees me standing in front of her door. Creeper? I couldn't sleep. Thought you might want to go for a ride. She bites her bottom lip, her right hand grabbing her left elbow her bare knee peeking out from a hole in her jeans. She looks sexy as fuck in tattered jeans and a plain black tank. Quinn doesn't have to try at all to be sexy as hell. Her blonde hair rests at her shoulders, and her only makeup is that black eyeliner. On your motorcycle. I mean, for starters. Her eyes roll, but she laughs. That sexy, raspy laugh I fucking dream about. Motorcycle. Yes, I guess. I'll take it. I direct her toward the garage, where my bike is parked out front. You sure you know how to drive this thing? I grab a helmet for her, placing it on her head. I've been taking lessons from Philip, Levi, and Cash. I'm good. I tug my helmet on and straddle the bike, gesturing for her to climb on. You aren't scared, are you, Quinn? Of course, the challenge works. It always has with her. Fuck no. But if you kill me, I will haunt the shit out of you. I laugh at that as she climbs up behind me, her arms wrapped around my waist. And I start it up and take off slowly down the road, heading to the outskirts of town. All I feel as I shift the bike and speed up is Quinn, her body pressed against mine. And it's fucking great. The summer air breezes over us as we take the country highway. She leans into me, and I can feel her excitement. 
There are no words, but we don't need them. When I pull back into Philip and Jillian's drive, we remove our helmets, but neither of us move off the bike. I turn back to look at her, blonde hair messy and fucking gorgeous, her eyes huge with excitement. Holy shit, that was fun. You sound surprised. My lips quirk upward. I am. I always thought motorcycles were fucking stupid, but I get it now. I laugh at that. Yeah, Philip tried for years to get me to try it, but now that I have, I'm addicted. Don't tell him, though. He'll think I want to race. She smiles at that, and in that moment she seems free, freer than I've ever seen her, unencumbered from the worry no 18-year-old should have. I climb off the bike, taking her helmet and mine, letting them fall to the ground before my hand slides through her locks, gripping her head. I stare into her eyes, seeing my childhood friend, but also the woman she is now. Strong, jaded, sexy, smart, and fucking fierce. This was fun. I nod my head and swallow, my lips meeting hers, holding on to her. Her hands grip my sides as she balances on the bike, turned at an awkward angle, but unbothered. We engage in a kiss that fucks with my head even more. I know it's probably a bad decision, but again, what the fuck ever. This kiss, it's worth any pain heading my way. Her teeth nip my bottom lip before kissing me again, our tongues tangling, my body wanting more, but my head being smart enough to know not to rush it. When I pull back, I'm staring into her beautiful eyes, and I see the confusion in them, but I also see the want. Good night, Quinn. Fuck. I really meant to say, Guest house or my room? But I can't. Not with Quinn. Whatever is happening with us, I don't want to fuck it up. She smiles at that, running her hand over the small amount of stubble on my chin. Good night, Logan. I help her off the bike and watch as she walks to the backyard, punching in the code and disappearing. Maybe she'll be just as addicted to writing as I am, and will feel up for it tomorrow. Although, I'm not sure I'll have that much self-control tomorrow. I'm afraid I'm becoming equally addicted to Quinn. Chapter 24 Quinn I kissed Logan. Again. And I loved every second of it. Riding his motorcycle, holding on to his hard body, it was a euphoric experience, and I still haven't come back down from the high. I have no idea what's going on with Logan and me, but I can't deny the excitement I feel about figuring it out. Okay, so we'll be gone for a few days, but you can reach us on our cell phones anytime. Jillian is going through her purse that's sitting on the kitchen counter, frantically making sure she has her ID and passports. Philip is forcing her to go on an island vacation. And Jillian is a total workaholic, so I know taking the few days off from work is killing her, but I think it's sweet. He wants her to relax. We'll be fine, Jillian. Logan assures her, his eyes on me, and I see a spark in them that is ready to ignite us both. I nod my head in agreement. Have a great time. She smiles and places the purse over her shoulder, grabbing Logan's face in both hands and kissing his cheek. Stay out of trouble. I will. She gives him a big squeeze and then releases him, only to pull me into a big hug. Take care of him for me? Her sweet voice whispers. No problem. Have fun. She pulls back and smiles at me. I'll try, but call if you need anything at all. We assure her again, and Philip hugs Logan and waves by to me before gathering their bags and walking out to the car, picking them up. Logan shakes his head with a bewildered smile on his face as he watches them take off. I'm not sure if he can believe how much he cares for them, but I see it. I have to get to work. I grab the keys to the car off the table beside the door. Okay, I'll see you later, Quinn. There's a smoldering look in his eyes and a hidden promise of something I'm unsure of, but I can't wait to find out. My shift drags on, and I find myself checking the clock nonstop, unable to stop thinking about that kiss with Logan and what sort of surprise he might have for me. When I leave the back door... I'm stunned who's waiting for me outside and gasp when I see Reese. He looks tired and worn, but oddly clean. His eyes look clearer than I've seen them in a long time as he leans against his car. 
What are you doing here, Reese? I wanted to talk to you. I jingle the keys in my hand nervously. About what? He takes a tentative step closer to me, and my heart rate picks up with apprehension I don't want to feel when he's near me. There was a time that he made me feel so safe. I'm clean. I've heard that before. He nods his head, not arguing with me. I know, and it's only been a few days. His crooked smile makes my heart ache, reminiscent of the good times with him. Detox was a bitch. I take a step toward him. Did you go to a clinic? Nah. His fingers slide through his hair. Just tufted it out in the apartment. Sean kept an eye on me. You could have died from withdrawal. I've seen him coming off the shit a couple of times, and it's no joke. Convulsions, throwing up, begging for death. I was fine, Quinn. Why are you here? He stands right in front of me now, his hand sweeping over my cheek sweetly. I miss you. I don't remember what I did to make you leave, but Sean told me it was bad. I'm so fucking sorry. And I know he is. I see it deep in his eyes. I know. Come home. I can't. I take a deep breath, knowing how badly it hurts him that I left. Reese, I don't know how long you'll be sober, and I can't let you hurt me anymore. Go and get treatment, and then we can talk. I watch as he swallows, the pain evident. I can't. Yes, you can. They have payment plans, and he interrupts me. It's not the money. I already knew that. They'll make me talk about shit that needs to stay buried. His hand still rests on my cheek, and I mimic the gesture on the other side of his face with my own hand. Maybe the problem is it isn't buried as deep as you think. It's just under the surface, and it's haunting you. Going and talking about my fucking feelings won't make it go away, Quinn. It's always going to be there. They can help you handle it. No. He growls, but keeps his voice quiet as his forehead rests against mine. I love you, Quinn. I always have, and I'll do anything I can to stay sober, but I won't fucking go to rehab. A tear slides down my cheek as his other hand grasps my face, holding me against him. He's never told me that before, that he loves me. We never said it, but maybe we felt it. I love you too, Reese. What the hell is going on? Reese's eyes close with irritation, and I turn hastily to see Logan standing nearby with an angry scowl on his face. Oh, shit. Logan, what are you doing here? Apparently, I'm witnessing a reconciliation. How fucking great for me. Fuck you, Logan. Reese turns to face Logan, and I see the fight in both men's eyes. This is not good. Logan looks only at me, his eyes swimming with confusion. What the fuck, Quinn? Let me guess, he promised he would never do it again, and he's clean and sober, right? It's none of your fucking business, dipshit. Reese growls. Logan ignores him, stepping closer to me. You're smarter than this, Quinn. I don't like his tone. The challenge in his words pissing me off. He's sober. For now. I know he's right. The odds of him staying clean are low, but I won't say that in front of Reese. What are you doing here? He huffs with irritation and is stuck in disbelief. I don't fucking know. Apparently, I'm a fucking idiot, Quinn. I can feel Reese's gaze on us, and I've never been so conflicted in my life. The agony inside me is crushing. I don't know what to say, and Logan just shakes his head looking back at Reese. You fucking hurt her, you're dead. Don't make promises you can't keep, pretty boy. Logan doesn't even look at me as he takes off down the alley. I turn to face Reese, and he walks toward me, no anger in his eyes, but I'm still terrified of what he's going to say. You don't belong with him, Quinn. He'll fuck you, and then when he's bored, that'll be it. You're a fucking conquest, a challenge, something out of the ordinary. I shake my head, but I know deep inside that's been my biggest holdback with Logan. Reese continues. He bails. It's what he does, and when he's through with you, he'll toss you to the side with no problem like you meant nothing because you don't. Not to him. Reese, stop. I'm begging him, feeling the sobs catching in my throat, unable to handle the reality. I allowed myself to get caught up in Logan's world. His hands grasp my shoulders lightly, and then he uses one finger to tip my chin up to look at him. You know I'm right. He was never really one of us, and now, 
fuck, he's definitely one of them. Them, meaning the privileged, happy, shiny people with real, caring parents. The world we dreamed about when we were young, abandoned kids, and the ones we grew up to despise. We were all so close. And then he left. I see the darkness in his eyes at his own statement. It hurt him deeper than he'll ever admit when Logan left. I know, but he didn't really have a choice. You don't really believe that, Quinn. I've never been more confused, and the confusion angers me. I've always been certain, strong, but this is making me weak. His lips press against my forehead. I love you. I've loved you since the first time I saw you. His eyes meet mine. I've fucked up, massively, but I never left and I never will. Come home. I swallow, fighting to steady my breathing and not cry. I will always be your friend, but I can't come back until I know you're getting help. He takes a step back from me. The option is always on the table. For you, not him. You can always come back. My hand moves over my heart and I close my eyes, letting his words sink in as he walks to his car and drives off. Have I just been lost in a fantasy with Logan? Fooling myself? Chapter 25 Logan She's back with Reese. I heard her tell him she fucking loved him. She loves him. What the fuck? What the hell was I? Just a distraction while she waited for him to clean up? She isn't that fucking stupid, is she? She has to know he'll relapse. Quinn has been around addicts. She's seen my mom relapse over and over. Addicts only care about themselves. I take another drink from the whiskey bottle in my hand and glare at the guest house from my seat on the lounge chair by the pool. I haven't seen her, but I know she's here because the car is parked outside. Thank God Philip and Jillian are out of the country because day drinking outside would be a huge no-no for Jillian. Nice. Starting a little early, huh? I turn and see Blair through my glossed-over eyes. She's wearing a pink sundress and heels, her blonde hair piled on her head. I take another drink and grunt, but don't form actual words. She doesn't care because she's Blair. She just takes a seat in the chair next to me, her legs over the side, feet planted, her elbows resting on her tan thighs as she leans forward. What the hell is going on with you? My eyes don't leave the glass doors of the guest house. I thought we didn't talk. We just fuck. Her bare shoulders shrug. True, and I like that, for sure. But whatever is going on seems to be messing with our fucking. I silently take another drink, knowing I should stop because things are already blurry. It's because of her, isn't it? I know she's talking about Quinn. Your little friend from the past? I nod, tired of words, my head spinning. She rolls her eyes as she climbs into my chair, her thigh straddling my lap as she takes the bottle from my hand and places it on the table beside me. Look, you don't like complicated, Logan, and neither do I. We may have grown up differently, but we're the same. Complicated isn't fucking worth it. It only brings misery. My eyes meet hers, and for the first time, I see depth in them. Or maybe it's the whiskey. I know. She's right. 100% right. Complicated only brings pain. There's never been a truer statement. It's why I stayed here. It's why I never went to find Quinn or check in. I couldn't handle seeing her with Reese and seeing them last night. The familiarity of their touch. Him telling her he loved her and her returning it. It cut through me with searing pain. Pain I don't want to fucking feel. Leave the past in the past. Her lips seek mine, and I breathe in her expensive perfume. It almost makes me gag, but I don't fight her kiss. Easy. She makes everything so fucking easy. My hands run up her back as her lips attack mine, and I try to lose myself. To go into the easy world with Blair. To forget all the bullshit. Because she didn't give me fucking grief after I blew her off the other night. She didn't lecture me for hours or try to make me say I'd only be hers. She's not in love with someone else, but if she was, I wouldn't care. Her hands move over my bare stomach as she pulls back looking into my eyes, and mine look past her to the guest house 
and into the icy eyes of Quinn. She looks pissed, but I'm willing to bet she's not as angry as me. It's spiteful, it's wrong, but I don't fucking care. I lift Blair off my lap and climb up from the chair, wrapping my arms around her waist and pulling her into another deep kiss. Only for Quinn's benefit. I see her back as she walks away from the door, and I take Blair's hand, leading her inside to my room. Because fuck complicated. My whole life has been complicated. I'm going for easy now. Chapter 26 Quinn I clutch my chest, fighting my heart from breaking in half. Fuck! Seeing Blair on Logan's lap was bad enough, but it was the fuck you kiss that about killed me, and then him leading her into the house and more than likely to his bed. What the hell was I thinking? Reese was right. He was so fucking right. Logan's first instinct is to bail, and he didn't even wait to fuck me and get bored. He ran right back to that pretentious bitch. He's in his room fucking her right now, a day after he kissed me on his bike. I got lost in this world of shiny, happy people, fooling myself to believe maybe I could be one of them someday, thinking things were possible that have never been possible for someone like me. Maybe even hoping to save up and go to college. Maybe playing the guitar again and writing music. Who the hell am I? Hope is dangerous. I learned that early on, and still, I stupidly let myself dream. I grab my black duffel bag from under the bed, wiping away pathetic tears from my face, and start throwing all my shit into it. Fuck this. I never belonged here. Everything here is an illusion. And I fucking fell for it. Never again. I zip the bag, grab the guitar next to the bed, and walk out the door. I lock it behind me, going into the main house and into the kitchen. I search around for a notepad and scribble a quick apology to Jillian, leaving the keys to the car and the house next to it. I walk up the stairs, fighting the bile from rising when I hear that fake bitch moaning from outside Logan's door. Fuck him. I lean the guitar against the wall next to his bedroom door and say a silent goodbye to all of this before taking off toward the bus stop. I was so fucking stupid to believe all of his bullshit. He left me behind once. How could I think he wouldn't do it again? How could I kiss him and talk to him about the old days and believe all of his bullshit? His kiss was soft, but his betrayal has a hard edge. Chapter 27 Logan I take a quick pull from the lit joint in my fingers and hold the smoke in, praying it will take away even an ounce of pain before letting smoke pour out from my lips and up toward the sky. Quinn is gone. After Blair left, I blacked out for a bit, and when I came to and walked out of my room, I saw that fucking guitar and knew it was over. That we both put the nails in the coffin of whatever the fuck we might have had and said goodbye. I stare up at the stars in the sky and then hear the glass door sliding open. Quinn? I turn toward the door, afraid I'm just high and imagining things. Logan, what the hell is going on? Jillian rushes over to me, Philip right behind her. I sit up, but don't bother to hide the joint. Even if she didn't see it, she smells it. What are you guys doing here? You're supposed to be gone for a few days. Jillian takes a seat in the chair next to me. We ended up not going. I had a bad feeling. Philip's eyes darken as he takes the joint from me and stubs it out on the table. What the fuck is going on? He turns to his wife, eyes wide. And are you a fucking psychic? She ignores that, not in the mood to joke around, I guess. What's going on? Her eyes scan the table, where the now extinguished joint lays next to a whiskey bottle. Her worried eyes meet mine. Where's Quinn? With her boyfriend. There's a coldness in my voice I almost don't recognize. Her what? Reese. I answer, his name tasting bitter on my tongue. The addict. She almost whispers her question, and I could see how much she cares for Quinn, even having only known her a short time. That's the one, I shrug. But you know, he's been sober for like a day, so it was time for her to go back. Her sad gaze meets mine, tears in her eyes. Oh, Logan, I am so sorry. I glare at her, warring against the misery and rage deep inside. Don't look at me like that. I can't fucking stand to see the pity. 
It's not pity, Logan. Yes, it is. She shakes her head and wipes a tear from her face. Maybe we can talk to her and convince her to come back. Stop. I yell a little louder than I mean to, and Philip gives me a warning glare. But I'm too fucking high, drunk, and pissed to care. You can't fucking fix this. You can't fix everything by adopting it and giving it a warm fucking bed and a hug, pretending like nothing bad ever happened. It doesn't work like that. Logan, shut the fuck up now. Philip glares, and I know he's pissed. Something I don't see from him often. You guys have this perfect life, and you love to throw money at underprivileged kids. They donate a lot of shit to programs for foster kids. I know they've done a lot of good, and I'm being a total dick. You let Quinn move in here, a complete stranger with no questions. And then you pat yourselves on the back, thinking you made it all better. That you're fucking saints. It doesn't stop the pain. Jillian stands, the tears on her face hurting me more than I ever thought anything could. She purses her lips and sniffles, composing herself. I'm sorry she left. When you're ready to talk, I'll be here. She gives Philip's arm a squeeze as she walks away from us and into the house, head down with defeat. Fuck. That's definitely not what I meant to do. Philip stands with his arms crossed, not moving, his glare almost haunting. Feel better? I shake my head. No. He looks at the table littered with my sins. That's a great fucking look for a child of an addict. You're one to talk, I bite back. His father was an alcoholic by most accounts, and his mother had been self-medicating for her mental health, but she died of an overdose. But it's no secret that the Adamson boys knew how to party back in the day. He just shakes his head and takes a seat. You get one pass. Most people are dead to me if they hurt Jillian. But you're my son, so you get one chance. I nod, feeling like shit for the way I talk to her. I'll apologize. Damn straight you will. He nods to the table. And no more of this shit. I roll my eyes. The first time I tried alcohol, I was fucking scared pissless that I'd end up just like my mom. But also a part of me didn't care. And then it seemed like I could handle it. It's never something I craved or couldn't get enough of. But I've never touched any of the hard shit. Because, who the fuck knows? Janice jeans could be strong. He sighs, looking up at the sky. Jillian really cares about Quinn. I know we didn't know her for long, but when Jillian has a feeling about someone, there's no changing it. I nod, knowing how much Jillian cared, and even how much my father did. He places a hand on my shoulder. I don't know what happened, but I'm guessing whatever it is hurts like a motherfucker. I nod my head, unable to deny that. Yeah. It does. Hang in there. I ran away from love for so fucking long, I avoided it like the plague. Until Jillian. I nod my head, understanding that wholeheartedly. She's too fucking complicated. I just want easy. He chuckles at that. I've definitely done easy. I give him a look, and he laughs when he remembers he is in fact my father, and my mom is in that easy category. Shit. Sorry. I shrug it off. Probably the only time Jana has been described as easy. He never talks about my mom. He told me how I was conceived and the events that led to him being out of my life, but no real details, and nothing current. Look, easy is fine and good now, but trust me, it gets old. How could not having your heart shattered to a million pieces get old? He ruffles my hair like I'm fucking adorable and it pisses me off, but doesn't bug him one bit. You'll see. In the end, pain is worth every second of finding the person you were meant to love and making them yours. I scoff. Fuck, Jillian has really turned you into a pussy. They all do, man. He laughs again and stands up. You'll see. He gestures toward the table again. Clean this shit up and drag your ass to bed. I agree, and he walks inside. I watch him comfort Jillian in the kitchen, his arms around her. Fuck love. They may have found it, but I don't want any part of it. Chapter 28 Quinn 
I walk outside of Smiley's after a long shift, fucking drained from the last week. Reese and Sean took me back with open arms, and things have pretty much gone back to normal, with the exception of Reese using. He's actually remained sober for a full week, which is pretty remarkable for him and the fact that he cut it out cold turkey. But I made it clear we aren't dating again until I can trust him. If that's even possible. I look around for his car, but stop when I see Jillian climbing out of hers. I think my heart just stopped. I knew she was a pain in the ass, but I thought after a few days passed after she and Philip were supposed to be back in town that maybe she was just going to let it slide. I walk over to her, horrified that I wasn't able to fully push her away. Or maybe I did, and she's here to tell me to fuck off. Jillian? She smiles, puffs out what seems like a relieved breath, and hugs me close to her chest. Holy shit, she is such a hugger. Maybe it's the pregnancy hormones. Are you okay? I nod, pulling away as politely as I can. I'm fine. She leaves her hands on my shoulders, taking inventory. Good. What are you doing here? Your note was sweet, but left too much to the imagination. I'm staying at my old place and working two jobs still. Not much has changed, but I'm really okay. That's good. I'm glad. She looks slightly nervous. The old place? I nod, knowing what she's getting at. I'm okay. And Reese? Is he okay? Yes, he's doing really well. Going on a week sober. She smiles, but it's slight. That's great. She sweeps a piece of hair that's fallen down from her professional bun out of her eyes. Logan won't give up any details, but he's miserable. Good. I somehow keep from saying that. I'm sure he'll find comfort somewhere. I'm glad you are doing okay, but if you ever aren't, please call me, or stop by, or whatever. Just let me know. I'll always be here for you, sweetie. I can't help myself. Why? She doesn't look at me like the freak I am. Because you remind me so much of me when I was your age. I felt so unworthy of love, but I wasn't, and neither are you. A cry catches in my throat at her kind and honest words that reach deep into my soul. Thank you for everything. She smiles and hugs me again. The room is there for you if you need it. I nod, but I think we both know I'll never be back. She squeezes me tightly and then gets in her car and leaves just as Reese and Sean pull up. I wipe a rogue tear from my cheek and climb in the front seat next to Reese. Who the fuck was that? I turn to study his eyes and see they're still clear, but there's jealousy in them. Logan's stepmom? Was Logan with her? Damn, man, you need to calm the fuck down. Sean settles into his seat in the back of the car. No, it was just Jillian. What the fuck does she want? Reese pulls out of the parking space and starts down the road. To check on me. There's no reason to lie, even if anything Logan related makes Reese uncomfortable. He shrugs it off, but I can see the anger in his eyes. You're off tonight, right? I nod, not having to work at the bar tonight. Yeah, I'm free for the night. Let's go to the drive-in, catch up with old friends. It's been a while. I study him again, wondering if he can hang out there without being tempted. I don't know. Quinn, I can be around them. I'm not going to fuck up. You have to try to trust me. I want to. I really, really want to. Okay. Sean cheers from the back seat. I know he's missed it, but we've both been keeping Reese away from anything that could lead to a backslide. We make our way to the outskirts of town and out to our old hangout, where the party has already begun, because it's never-ending. All the lost kids in one place, our own personal Neverland. Reese parks and we all climb out, walking over to greet Alec and Randy, two guys that were a few years ahead of us in school, but grew up in the system too. Alec and Reese shared a foster home for a few months once. What's up, man? Alec greets Reese with a fist bump and gives me a nod. I look around at the alcohol and joints exchanging hands all over the place. This was a shitty idea. Reese, we shouldn't stay long. He shrugs off my words but holds my body close to his. I'm okay. I'm uneasy, but I agree to stay. And it's actually really nice. It feels like old times. The good ones. We talk shit and joke around with the friends we've known most of our lives. Some even tease Sean about being lyric to Blair's preppy friend. And after a couple hours, we pile back in Reese's car and head home.
all three of us totally sober. Who knows, maybe Reese will beat the odds. Although I hate to even think it for fear of hope. Maybe it will actually be okay. Chapter 29 Logan What the hell is going on with you? Chris knocks my feet down off the table I had them propped up on in the break room, and I look up at him, pissed, taking my headphones out. Right now, my uncle is being a dick. He just laughs it off and takes a seat next to me. It's been a month since Quinn left, and you have been a little broody asshole since. I'm sketching while I wait for my next customer. I didn't do shit. Bullshit. I apologized to Jillian the morning after my blow-up. But when she wanted to talk about what happened, I retreated to my bedroom and haven't been out much since, except to go to work. What did I do this time? You're just not yourself, kid. I'll work on it. I put my headphones back in and go back to sketching. He just shakes his head as he gets up and goes back into the main shop. I know I'm being an asshole and pushing everyone away. I'm in a funk, and I'm pissed all the time. The thought of Quinn still being at Reese's kills me but I won't admit it out loud. Good riddance. When I get home, the smell of a home-cooked meal hits my nostrils, and I'm drawn to the kitchen. Jillian and Philip are waiting for me at the table, and Philip pushes my chair out with his foot. Sit. Fuck. I huff, but do as I'm told and sit down. A plate of fried chicken and mashed potatoes in front of me. You guys want to tell me I'm being a prick too? Philip grins. Chris? I nod, and he laughs. Jillian shakes her head. No, I understand why you're upset. It was pretty apparent how much you cared for Quinn, and I know it hurts that she's with someone else. I try not to puke thinking about it. I'm fine. Plenty of chicks in this world. Right. Well, we miss you. I relent. I miss you guys, too. We found out what we're having today. Her voice brightens. I take a bite of mashed potatoes, even though I'm not remotely hungry, after thinking about Quinn and Reese yet again. What? You're going to have a little brother. Another Adamson man in the world, huh? Philip looks so fucking proud. The dude is beaming. Hell yeah. There can't ever be enough of them. I laugh at that and turn to Jillian. That's great. I'm happy for you guys. And I am. Even if I have no fucking idea how to show it. I was thinking maybe you could help Philip paint the nursery this weekend? Yeah, I can do that. I smile, trying like fucking hell to be normal. To sit here at this nice dinner table with my parents and talk about run-of-the-mill shit. But I know there's a darkness brewing deep inside of me. Something I know they both fear. Something that scares even me. Let's be honest. I had a fucked up childhood. And when I first moved here, I was quiet and got into fights at school with a lot of rich, entitled pricks. Every single day is a fight. I stop myself from screaming at the top of my lungs. I stop myself from drowning in self-pity. I stop myself from hunting Quinn down and beating the living shit out of Reese. Every fucking day is a battle. Chapter 30 Quinn no, no, this isn't happening. I stare at Reese in horror. He's laying on the bathroom floor on his stomach with his head turned so I can see his eyes are closed. His body is lifeless, and I drop down on a knee next to him. Please. I feel for his pulse, and my own heart doesn't continue to beat again until I feel that his is still beating. Oh, thank God. It's weak, but it's still there. I dial 911 and then flip him over, praying that he can wait until they get there. I look at the needle on the ground next to him. How the hell did this happen? He was clean. He was fucking clean. A month. He just got his one-month chip at the meetings we talked him into going to. We had all been hanging out, and it felt like old times again. I still watched him like a hawk out at the drive-in, but he was doing well. Sean walks in and runs over to us when he realizes what's going on, kneeling down next to Reese. Reese? He looks at me with horror and fear. What the fuck, Quinn? What happened? I shake my head. I don't know. I have no idea. I just got home from work and found him like this. Sean grabs Reese's face in his hands. 
Reese, wake the fuck up. You can't do this, man. He's out cold, but there's a pulse. I called an ambulance. Sean nods, but I see how numb he is. Fuck, this can't be happening. He was doing so well. Paramedics fly inside the already open door. They rush to Reese and clear Sean and me away. I back up and see an opened envelope on the table by the door. I pick it up and gasp, covering my mouth. What is it? Sean asks as he walks closer to me. My eyes skim the letter from the Nashville Music Academy. An acceptance letter. Oh, shit. I look over at Reese as the paramedics work on him. What is that, Quinn? I hand it to him. I applied as a fucking joke. I submitted this stupid song, and I guess they liked it. I look at Reese. It's not a scholarship or anything. It's not like I can actually go. Sean reads the letter, his left hand on his chin, and then he looks over at Reese. Fuck, man. A tear slides down my cheek. I never in a million years thought they would even give me the time of day. My grades are shit. Your songs are golden. I'm so sorry, Sean. He pulls me into a tight hug pressed against his chest. That's the stupidest thing to ever be sorry for. This is fucking amazing, Quinn. His chin rests on top of my head. If this sent him over the edge, then he was already fucking there. I sob into his chest, no more words worth speaking, and then we follow the ambulance to the hospital and wait. And wait some more until finally a doctor comes out to tell us that Reese has made it and will be okay, but we need to get him help. We both nod numbly, everyone in the conversation knowing how hopeless that task is. When Reese wakes, I'm next to his bed and his voice cracks when he looks up at me. Quinn, what were you trying to do, Reese? I keep my voice calm, but it's hard not to cry, seeing him in the hospital bed looking worn and broken. Escape? Through death? He shrugs. Any way possible. Where's Sean? He'll be back. He went to get us something to eat. You've been out for a while. His fingers massage his temple slowly before he drops his arm next to his side. I feel like shit. Yeah, that would be because of the copious amount of drugs in your system. He takes my hand in his. You're leaving me. No, I'm not. I take my hand away and walk over to the window. It was just a stupid joke. How is you getting accepted to college a joke? I look out the window at the busy street below, at all the cars driving along, and I wonder what kind of people are occupying them. There's no way I can pay for college, especially that one. It's out of state, and it's not a community school. So we'll figure out a way. I smile and walk back over to the bed, surprised that he wants me to go. I belong here. He shakes his head, dark circles under his once bright eyes. No one belongs here, but especially not you. Don't say that. I'm not going anywhere. And why the fuck didn't you talk to me first? He lifts his arm, which I can see is difficult to do, and runs his fingers through his hair. I was already slipping, Quinn. I had some vodka at the party the other night. I smoked a blunt last night. I'm not meant to be sober. I shake my head in disbelief. No, I was watching you. I'm an addict. I'm really good at hiding it. My head shakes from side to side slowly, tears forming in my eyes. No. Quinn, this is me. He places a hand over his heart. I don't want sobriety. I don't want to have my fucking mind clear so I can think about all the shit that's happened. I don't want it. So you just want to fucking die? Because that's what's going to happen. If it does, it does. No. I throw my body onto his, hugging his shoulders and begging him not to think this way. I can't live in a world without you, Reese. None of us can. I know I'm hurting him, but he doesn't ask me to leave. I'm fucking broken, Quinn. I told you not to try and save the unsavable. You remember saying that? I think it all the time, but yeah, I remember telling you that. Please try. For me, please try. He kisses the top of my head, and I see a tear slide down his cheek when I look up at him. My heart is shredded. Please, Reese. He doesn't say anything. He just holds on to me as I sob like a maniac into his chest. Fucking hope. 
Chapter 31 Logan Okay, we have to talk, and I know you hate talking, but we're going to do it anyway. Damn, I was so close to getting out the door. I sigh and take a seat at the kitchen table with Jillian. I really am late to the shop. It will only take a minute, she smiles, and I can handle Chris. I laugh at that, and it's genuine. I'm fucking trying. The last week hasn't been too bad, and I've managed to keep the brooding to a lower level. I really don't want to let my family down. Even if that shit with Quinn crushed me, I've learned I'm resilient. What's up, Jillian? Today's the day you have to let the colleges know if you are going in the fall. And I need to know. Fuck, is that today? I've been avoiding this shit like crazy, living in denial, afraid of the day I have to smash Jillian's dreams. I'm not going, Jillian. She sucks in a deep breath and lets it out slowly. Logan, are you absolutely sure? Philip walks in and sits next to her. Sorry I'm late. She's fighting tears, and I swear to God I want to die. Lighting her down is killing me. Maybe I should just fucking go. Logan has decided not to go to college. Philip doesn't look surprised at all as he places a hand over hers. Okay? He turns to look at me. You sure? And on my head, giving him a man-to-man look that I know he understands. Yes. Okay. No college, but the money's there if you want to in a year or whatever. I shake my head and hate myself even more, unable to look at Jillian. I'm never going. Going to college is a fucking waste of money. I meet Jillian's eyes. For me. Education is never a waste. It would be for me. I keep my voice low and respectful and swallow, trying to gather the courage for the next part, a plan I'd formed in my head a month ago. But not for Quinn. Both of their eyes snap to me in shock. I haven't spoken her name since she left. They share a look, and then Jillian approaches the subject with caution. Quinn. Look, she wouldn't waste the money. She would do something great with it. And if it's just going to sit there, maybe it should go to her. That's incredibly selfless. Her hand covers mine. But maybe we can figure it out for you both. I shake my head again and see Philip smile at his wife's stubbornness. Jillian, I only want to get my tattoo license and work with Chris. That's my dream. Quinn, she doesn't know it, or she doesn't allow herself to know it, but she has a great fucking talent that shouldn't die because her parents were shit and the system is flawed. I definitely agree with that part. So, then help her. I have no idea why I still want to help Quinn. Part of me hates her, and Reese. But maybe I'm thinking about that little girl in the foster home who approached a lost, crying boy. She deserves a shot. They share another look, and then Philip digs an envelope out of his back pocket and hands it to me. It was always yours. You can do whatever you want with it, kid. I take the envelope in my trembling hands. I don't think she'll take it from me. Jillian smiles and stands, kissing the top of my head. Make her. She won't take it from anyone else. Philip stands, smiling knowingly, and walks out, leaving me to stare at the fucking envelope. Shit. Trying to get Quinn to do something she doesn't want to is like... Well, it's like trying to get me to do something I don't want to. Fuck. I go to work, keeping the envelope in my back pocket, and drift through the day, knowing what I'm facing, knowing it won't go well, but also knowing I have to try. After I leave Chris's shop, I drive to the apartment I'm sure Quinn is still living in after trying both of her places of work first. The bar told me she wasn't on the schedule tonight, and the cafe said she had left hours ago. So here I am. I knock on the door, expecting to have to fight Reese to get to Quinn, but bring it on, fucker. The door opens, and it's Quinn. Dressed in jeans and a plain t-shirt, no-nonsense glare firmly in place. What the hell are you doing here? Trust me, it's the last fucking place I want to be. But I need to talk to you. I fight the urge to leave when her attitude shows. She has the nerve to be fucking pissed off at me when she was the one that bailed this time. And I don't mean when she ran away. 
I could see it in her eyes the night I found her with Reese in the alley behind the bar. Has she always loved him? No, we're done talking. Go talk to Blair. We don't usually talk. I shoot back, pissed she even brought up Blair. Then go do whatever it is you do with her and leave me alone. She starts to close the door on my face, and I stop it with my hand, leaning in. Oh, Quinn, you know exactly what she and I do. She swallows and crosses her arms, looking like she wants to cut me, and I briefly wonder if she still carries a knife in her pocket. I couldn't care less what you and that little twit do together. Right, you're too busy fucking Reese. Petty, but I don't give a flying fuck. Her eyes roll as if she's bored with me. What the fuck do you want, Logan? I have something for you. I don't want the fucking guitar. Sell it, burn it, I don't care. I step closer to her, getting in her face. Which is a mistake, because I could get drunk on her scent. Really? The thought of that perfect guitar set on fire doesn't make your soul cry a little? She swallows tightly, and I know how much she loves that guitar. I didn't bring it. Her eyebrows narrow. Then what? I slide the envelope out of the back pocket of my jeans and hand it to her. Take it. And don't be a pain in the ass about this Quinn. For once in your life. She opens the envelope slightly, revealing the big-ass check, and then shoves it back at me, placing it against my chest. But I don't move my hands to grab it. Are you fucking insane? I'm not taking their money. Actually, it's my money. My college fund, anyway. So then go to college. I shake my head, and her hand clenching the check is still pressed against my chest. No, I told Jillian I'm not going. That's fucking stupid. You should go. I'm not going, and this money is going to waste if you don't take it. I'm not a fucking charity case, Logan. I won't take it. Her eyes meet mine, and I see the stubbornness I knew would be there. Quinn, I know you're scared. You don't think there's any way that things can ever work out. So you don't try. You float. You hold your fucking breath and hope you can just make it through the day. But this is a gift that you need to take. You have a shot, a real fucking shot to do whatever you want in this life. Take it. Her body leans into mine, her hand pressing deeper, propped up on her toes as she looks up at me. Fuck you. Original. I place my hand over hers, still holding the check. I won't use it. It'll go to waste. As far as Philip, Jillian, and I are concerned, it's yours. They saved this because they wanted you to go to college. Then it was always for you, even if they didn't know it yet. Anything that was mine was always Quinn's, since the day I met her. She shakes her head adamantly. No. Is this because of Reese? I fight the bile rising, but sack up and say my next sentence. Because there are colleges right here in the KC Metro that you can go to, and still be with your precious Reese. I notice tears form in her eyes. Reese left. What are you talking about? He left. He overdosed, but lived. The day after he was released from the hospital, he packed his shit and left without a word. I don't know if he's dead or alive. Holy shit. It's real shock. I never thought he would leave her. Quinn. She takes a step back, shaking off the sorrow and holding the check up in front of me. I don't want this. I don't want your fucking charity. She's hurting, and I can't make it better. Take it. Do good with it. I fight the urge to touch her. Don't pass up this amazing opportunity because of pride and fear. I tuck my hands in my pockets and turn toward the stairs, having nothing else to say, knowing it's all in Quinn's hands now. Please let her take it. Chapter 32. Quinn. Jillian, wait! I holler in the parking lot at social services when I finally see Jillian exit the building. She stops, pivoting on one foot. Her leather briefcase swung over her shoulder and the pretty blue dress she's wearing shows off a cute, small baby bump. Quinn, what are you doing here? Her face has concern written all over it. I hope Logan knows how lucky he is to have her in his life. I hold out the envelope. I can't take this. My hand trembles as her eyes look at the envelope containing the check with her signature on it. 
damn Logan for dangling this in front of me. He has to know there is no way I can take this. She gives me a kind smile, brushing her blonde hair out of her face. Yes, you can, and you should. It's a beautiful gift. It is. You guys are amazing, but... She smiles. I meant from Logan. He wants you to have it. Why? I still don't understand. I saw the anger in his eyes when he came to my apartment. He acted like a child who'd been forced to apologize by his parents. Not that there was any apology. I can't take it. My hand is still shaking. Please take it back. She shakes her head, her smile never faltering. It's not mine to take back. Quinn, she sighs and places a hand on my shoulder. Take this gift and do something incredible with it. Have the life you should have. I'm not that special. That's definitely not true. She pulls me into a hug. You can do this. You're strong and you've been through hell at a young age. Believe it or not, that actually gives you an advantage in this world. She pulls back, her hands still on my shoulders, and I have no idea what the hell she's talking about. How can my shitty upbringing ever give me a one-up on anything? She winks at me. You'll see. Jillian, are you absolutely sure you can't make him go to school? This is his college fund. He's happy. He's doing exactly what he wants to be doing right now, Quinn. And believe me, I tried. She takes in a deep breath, and I can feel a Jillian question coming before she even asks. He said Reese left. I nod my head, but fight every emotion I feel. He fucking left. He promised he never would, and then he did, like everyone else. Sean swears Reese didn't say a word to him, and he seems pretty upset about it, too, so I'm inclined to believe him. He did. He hasn't come back yet? I shake my head. No, I'm not sure he ever will. I'm sure he will. I shake my head. Reese isn't like Jana. He's never left before, and now that he has, I don't imagine he'll come back for anything. She bites her lip nervously. Funny you should mention that. My eyes darken. Jana's back? A couple of months ago. She came to us to go to rehab again. We put her in a 90-day treatment. I'm not holding my breath. The look on Jillian's face isn't a happy one. She bailed. Tears form in her eyes. We haven't told Logan. He doesn't seem to want to know much about her. Fuck her. She was never a mother to him. I look her dead in the eyes. You're his mother, and you're more than enough. She smiles through watery tears that are now sliding down her cheeks. I just want him to have us both. But maybe he's right, and she's a lost cause. I don't think she actually believes that. I'm not sure Jillian ever truly gives up on anyone. Jana is just plain lost, and always has been, but Logan, it hurts to even say his name. Logan can't hold on to hope or it'll kill him. Distance gives us peace sometimes. She nods her head at that and dabs at her eyes with a tissue she retrieved from her purse. You're a very smart young woman, and that's what I mean by having the advantage. She smiles brightly. You'll always see the world differently and with clear eyes. Aren't you supposed to see the world through bright and shiny eyes? She shrugs, thinking about it. Sometimes, sure. But being a realist isn't a bad thing as long as you still let hope in occasionally. If I wouldn't have learned that, I wouldn't have anything I have today. There's a balance you have to find. I think college and getting out of here could really help you find that. She looks around. Do you need a ride? I shake my head. Thank you, but the bus stop is literally right there. I point to it in front of the building, and it's not far. She doesn't fight me, even though I can see she wants to, but starts toward her car, and I panic, allowing myself to be vulnerable for one second. This is all I've ever known. What if I fail? She turns around, keys in her hand. Then at least you tried, and you know you have a place to come back to. She smiles, and I return it, waving goodbye as she walks to her car. Can I really do this? Chapter 33 Logan The hint that we're closed should be that the fucking lights are off and the closed sign is on the door. 
But damn if there isn't some asshole every night banging on our door at midnight, begging for a tattoo. Granted, that's really not a bad thing, but I'm finishing up cleaning the shop so I can get my ass home. It's been a long fucking day. I passed my exam last month after completing all of my required hours and now have my license to tattoo. But I'm still the newbie, and it's my job to close. Not that I mind. It's quiet. And sometimes I even stay and sketch for a bit in the lounge. But still, that means dealing with after-hour assholes who think they can flash cash in my face, and I'll open the doors. I walk through the dark shop and to the glass front door, stopping in stunned shock when I see the woman standing outside. No. I groan internally and unlock the door. The skinny, pale woman looks at me through glossy eyes, reaching up to touch my cheek, but I flinch and step away. Why are you here? I missed you, Logan. I look at her skinny arms, the worn-out blue veins poking through her pale skin, bruises everywhere. It's late August, but it's chilly out tonight, and she's only wearing a tank top and jeans. She has to be fucking freezing. You shouldn't be here, Jenna. She takes a tentative step forward, and I fight the urge to step away. Seeing her like this is too fucking painful. Her hair is thin, her teeth are decaying, and she is a shell of her former self. You're my son. I shake my head when she places her hand on my cheek, cupping it in her bony fingers. I can't be around you. I grasp her wrist with my hand. You're fucking toxic. She nods her head, a tear falling. But she doesn't argue with me. She doesn't yell this time. You look good. So grown up. It happens to kids. They grow. Not that you were around to see it. I'm leaving town. Not surprising. I haven't asked for a Jana update from Jillian and Philip, but had no doubt she wouldn't make it through this stint in rehab. I remove her hand from my cheek and release her. I hope you find what you're looking for. She walks out the door and turns to look at me. I made a lot of mistakes, Logan. Yeah, no shit. But you weren't one of them. I stare at her in disbelief, waiting for her to say something else. But she doesn't. She walks away into the night. She's never told me that before. My whole life she told me what a mistake I was. What the fuck? I close the door and turn the lock with a click, walking back into the break room, cleaning up sugar packets and getting the Keurig ready for tomorrow morning, when I hear another knock on the glass door. Shit. I walk back out toward the front room, piss the fuck off, and praying it's not my mom again. Weird that I'm actually hoping for a hipster douchebag with too much money. I stop in front of the door, and I'm not sure if the reality is worse or better than what I was expecting. Quinn. What the fuck is up with tonight? I turn the lock and pull open the door, being an asshole and not moving out of the way to allow her to walk inside. Same old Quinn. Not sure why I feel like she should have changed. It's only been a couple of months, but everything feels different yet again. Still, she's wearing ripped jeans and a Led Zeppelin black t-shirt, her shoulder-length hair down and straight. We're closed. She holds up a bag of goldfish crackers, one hand in the back pocket of her jeans. Thought you might be hungry. I study her face and hate how fucking beautiful she is to me. I step out of the way and let her through. She walks inside and I close the door, locking it before turning to look at her. There's no way you're here to share your snack. She shrugs and hands them to me. I take them and place them on the receptionist's desk as she looks around the shop. It's dark but the streetlights shine through the windows and the glass door, lighting in enough to see. I'm very generous, Logan. Quinn. She laughs and shakes her head, crossing her arms. I'm going to college. I fight the smile, not wanting her to see how happy that makes me, because knowing Quinn, she wouldn't go just out of spite. Good, but that doesn't explain what you're doing here. I want a goodbye present. I quirk an eyebrow. Wasn't college the gift? She shakes her head, plopping down in the chair located in my station, the one with the sign Chris gave me posted proudly. Nope. I sit on the swiveling stool next to her chair. You want a tattoo? She nods, taking a deep breath and leaning back, settling into the chair. 
and it's hard for me not to notice her perky tits, rising and falling as she breathes in and out. Hey, I'm not dead. From me. Her teeth nibble on her bottom lip, and I'm momentarily hypnotized by the simple action. We've both done so much damage in only 18 years. Fucked up more times than we can count, let people down. I listen to her words, so far not finding anything to argue with. Her eyes meet mine. We both hurt each other. Fuck, can't argue with that. Yeah. But there was a time when we were just two lost, innocent, fucked up kids who found each other. And before all the bullshit, you were everything to me. Same. She gives me a sad smile. And I can't help but think about how brief our reacquaintance was and how fucking fast we messed it all up. We really messed up this time, huh? Fuck. Maybe she's psychic like Jillian. Yeah. Almost seems like a fucked up dream. I keep thinking that too. Everything happens so damn fast. My throat feels dry, and I cough awkwardly to clear it, unsure what to say. What does all this have to do with the tattoo? I thought there wasn't anything you were passionate about. Her lips turn upward in a pretty smirk. And you knew that wasn't true before I did. Okay. I'm not going to fight her on this. I want nothing more than to be the first one to tattoo her untouched flesh. So, what are we doing then? She takes a deep breath, her eyes meeting mine. I trust you. Fuck. Why does that sound so fucking good to me? Where? And why the hell is my throat so dry? I watch her fingers travel up to the crew neck of her t-shirt and slowly slide it to the side, revealing her collarbone. Here. I swallow, trying to remain professional as I nod my head dumbly. You'll have to take your shirt off. I need better access. Her head nods, and I don't see any uncertainty in them. She really does trust me. Why? I'm not sure. Her hands lift her black t-shirt up and over her head before resting in her lap. I try not to stare at her perfect tits, only covered by a thin black lacy bra. They're small, but absolutely fucking tempting. I stand up, grabbing everything I need and adjusting my semi-hard cock before I take a seat, praying she didn't notice. You sure, Quinn? Her eyes meet mine, her sultry voice floating over to me. Mark me, Logan. Fuck, what is she doing to me? I flex my hands, trying like hell to get them not to tremble. She'd never let me forget it if I fucked up her tattoo. I smile at that thought, but it quickly disappears because this feels like a true goodbye. And no matter what we've been through in the past, that reality fucking hurts. I put my gloves on and come up with the perfect tattoo, one I've thought about for years now, only for her. First of all, this is going to hurt like a bitch. She rolls her eyes, no stranger to pain. Second of all, you'll be fucking addicted right after. She smiles at that. I'm okay with both. I nod and start the tattoo, which, to her credit, she barely flinches when the needle touches her skin. Is Reese back? She shakes her head, looking up at the ceiling. We both know he's never coming back. I don't know that, though. The fucker had Quinn. Why would he just leave like that? You never know. You sound like Jillian. Her lips pull up in a smile at the mention of Jill. When did you see her? When I tried to give the money back. She shrugs the shoulder opposite of where I'm working. Of course, she wouldn't take it and then convinced me to go. She didn't tell me about any of this, but it's not too surprising. Why would she? Sounds like Jillian. I finish the first musical note, a simple quarter note, and then move on to an 18th. So, you're really going, huh? Yes. I still can't believe it. Here? Her breasts push forward with a deep breath as I work on a new note. Tennessee. Holy shit. She laughs slightly at that tucking her hair behind her ear. I know, it's crazy, but they have a kick-ass music program, obviously, and for whatever reason, they accepted me. That's badass. 
and I really fucking mean it. Of course, what about her isn't? Besides being in love with my former best friend who happens to be an addict, Quinn is still the coolest girl I've ever known and will ever know. Chapter 34 Quinn I can't believe I'm here. I've always been tough, but forcing myself to come here and ask Logan for a goodbye present, a Logan Davis original tattoo, was one of the hardest things I've ever done. I'm leaving tomorrow. I cashed the check, paid my tuition, and bought a plane ticket. This is it. I'm really doing this. But I couldn't leave without seeing him. I just couldn't. Jillian is right. This is a precious gift he's given me, and I can't let pride get in the way of thanking him. He's all business as I sit in his chair, shirtless and letting him work his beautiful magic. So you staying in a dorm? I'm glad there's not awkward silence, and instead he's talking to me, although it's nothing too heavy, just simple small talk. No, I don't think I could stand sharing a room with a stranger. I'd probably kill her if she touched my shit or something. His lips turn up in a knowing smirk as he works. Yeah, you don't need a felony on your record. He finishes and takes his gloves off, admiring his work. You ready to see it? I take a deep breath and nod my head. Yes. He smiles and hands me a mirror that I take in trembling hands as I tip it down to see my collarbone. Oh my God. I gasp as I see the beautiful work of art. It's a colorful watercolor tattoo. Black, purple, pink, and blue musical notes on a curved staff. And underneath is the word strong in a beautiful cursive font. Wow. I stare in awe at the stunning tattoo on my skin, and then I start to cry, like full-on ugly sobbing that I've never done before. Logan's hand rests on my shoulder, and I can hear that I'm freaking him the hell out. Shit, Quinn, I'm sorry. Is that not what you wanted? I'm a sobbing mess, placing the mirror on my lap and putting my face in my hands. I'm sure looking like a complete psycho. Fuck, Quinn, talk to me. I finally pull myself together and peek out at him between my fingers. It's perfect. He takes my hands in his, pulling them down from my face as he crouches in front of me. You fucking scared me. That pulls a quick laugh from me as I sniffle, and he hands me a tissue, still crouching down, but giving me my hands to wipe my tears. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't expect that. It, it's perfect. I smile, tossing the tissue in the trash next to the chair. You're a true artist. He smiles as he tucks a piece of my hair behind my ear. I want you to remember that music makes you strong. It always has. My heart is pounding at a rapid rate and clenches at his sweet words, and then his deep voice is low, almost a whisper, when he says, You're going to do great things, Quinn. I'm just going to music school, not becoming a doctor or something. He's deadly serious now. You have the power to change lives with your music. I try to laugh it off, but his intensity is mesmerizing as he gazes into my eyes. That's a little dramatic, don't you think? No. If you can reach one person, one lost soul who's drowning in darkness with your music, and pull them out of it by giving them a glimpse of light, of hope, then Quinn... You've done your job. Wow. I'm lost in his eyes and his words, and truly believe what he's saying. It's our job as artists to reach people, to try our best to shine light in the dark world, and you'll do that. I know you will. I glance down at the beautiful work of art. You definitely do that. I've never seen such beautiful work. You inspire me. His words are soft, and I don't want to fight the urge. I lean forward, my lips capturing his, getting lost in his soul. His fingers thread through my hair, hands encompassing my face as he kisses me back with hunger, needing me like I need him in that moment, starving for each other. Our mouths devour each other's as he lifts me up, my legs wrapping around his waist. He moves to the back room, sitting down on the couch, leaving me on his lap, my hands on his shoulders as we kiss. His mouth travels over my jaw and down my neck, and I can feel his hardness between my thighs, making me tremble with anticipation. His large hands once again hold my face in them as his icy blue eyes stare into mine. Quinn.
He swallows, and I see the uncertainty in them. You're not just a one-night stand to me. My forehead rests against his as I push a shaky breath from my lungs, the air drifting over his lips. I know. No guilt, no regret. One night, and then I get on the plane in the morning. His skin slides against mine as he nods his head in silent agreement. His hand finds the clasp of my bra, unhooking it, and he pulls back. His fingers slip the straps from my shoulder, letting the bra fall to the couch beside him, leaving me exposed, bare, and vulnerable, but full of anticipation. His eyes take in my bare chest as his mouth dips down to the curve of my breast, sliding over my erect nipple, pulling a deep groan from both of us. Fuck, Quinn. I've wanted this for so long. My head tilts back in ecstasy at the sensation of his mouth on me. He's barely touched me and I'm already putty in his hands. His lips find mine again as my hand rests on his heart, feeling the rhythm. My fingers trail over his chest in the soft cotton of his black t-shirt. I find the hem and lift it from his body. Still amazed at the amount of muscle he has now, my lips slide over his neck and down over his tough tattoo. I know tonight will end. I know without a doubt this is goodbye. And I can't think of anything I want more right now. I undo the button on his jeans, and we work together to push them and his boxer briefs to the ground. Then my eyes trail down the hard length of him. You'd think, since we'd known each other essentially our entire lives, that seeing him naked and rock hard would be slightly awkward. But I fight the urge to clench my thighs together at the sight. Wetness pools between my legs with lust and the need to have him inside me. His hand cradles the back of my head as he pulls my mouth to his again, and his hard cock grinding between my legs and making me whimper. Condom? I manage between hot kisses. He nods, casually grabbing one from his jeans, placing it next to us on the couch. But he continues torturing me with his tongue in my mouth, making me desperate. His hands guide my jeans over my ass and I kick them off, leaving my panties on as I grind shamelessly on his cock, feeling every inch of him dying for him to be inside of me. I want you, Logan. I breathlessly gasp in his ear. I've always wanted you, Quinn. My eyes briefly meet his as he slips the condom on seamlessly before removing my panties. My hands tremble as I hold onto his shoulders and slowly slide down on his cock my head lolling back at the feeling of him fully inside me. We both take a minute to feel the sensation of him filling me and stretching me from the inside. His throat bobs as he swallows, and then he wraps an arm around my side, holding me in place. Fuck, Quinn. You feel fucking incredible. My forehead rests against his once again. Fuck me, Logan. I want to enjoy every second here with you. His hips buck upward slightly as my hips move forward, guiding his rigid, thick cock in and out of me at a delicious pace. My chest leans against his, feeling his heart and mind beating together in a synchronized rhythm. And I know deep inside, with everything I have, this is as good as it gets. No matter what, I won't let myself regret this moment. Chapter 35 Logan. I hold Quinn's small body against my own as we lay on the couch together, my front pressed against her back. The sun is starting to rise, and I see it seeping through the shop window to the back room, where we spent the entire night lost in each other. No guilt. No regrets. What would that even be like? It feels like that's all I've had since I left her, Sean, and Reese behind. Quinn stirs her naked body causing mine to react. Morning. I see her smiling even from behind. Good morning. Her arm reaches out and points to the corner. Is that my guitar? I look to where she's pointing and nod. Yeah. She turns, looking at me over her shoulder. What is it doing here? I shrug, slightly embarrassed, but whatever. Too late to hide it now. I couldn't take looking at it anymore, just sitting by my bed, all lonely and shit. So I brought it here. I stand up and tug on my disheveled jeans from last night, walking to the guitar, picking it up. I walk back to Quinn as she pulls on her panties and Led Zeppelin t-shirt and sit next to her, letting her take it from my hands. 
I was going to give it to a client who plays, but I just couldn't do it. So, it's just sat here. Her eyes take in every inch of that guitar, and I see just how much she loves it. Wow, she smiles. You wanted to give it away, but couldn't. Pathetic, I know. I think you've made me a pussy. She laughs at that as she continues to examine the instrument. No, just really sweet. That's something I don't think I've ever been called. It was always supposed to be yours, Quinn. Take it. She nibbles her bottom lip, and I see how much she wants it. But Quinn is a fighter. I think I'd drop dead if she didn't fight me at least a little about everything. I can't, Logan. It wouldn't be right. Why? Because we aren't together? Because you love Reese? Why? I need the answer. She shakes her head. Nothing to do with Reese. I'm leaving, going off to college. But you still won't be gone. Not for me. Take the damn guitar. Play it every fucking day and enjoy it. She swallows, pulling her throat tight and looking up at the ceiling as if it will offer the answer she seeks. It will remind me of what could have been. And as you know, that shit is painful. I wrap an arm around her, letting her head rest on my shoulder. No. Like you said, we fucked up, but we were everything to each other once. So fate is a motherfucker, and our timing fucking sucks. If we really believe, maybe our paths will cross again. Her head lifts, and she looks into my eyes. I see something I've never seen shining in them before. Hope. You believe that? I do. And if not, well, at least you got a guitar, a badass tattoo, and a not-too-shabby night to remember me by. Her eyes roll, but her lips press against mine softly. Thank you. For all of the above. You're not off the hook yet. I want a present before you leave. I look up at the clock on the wall, knowing Chris will be here soon. She leans the guitar against the couch as she stands up, looking around the floor. She smirks, grabbing her jeans and pulling them on, and looking me dead in the eye as she buttons her top button. Wasn't that the sex? I laugh and shrug. I mean, that was damn good. She sits down next to me. Damn straight. I pick the guitar up and hand it to her. Play for me, Quinn. She takes the guitar, giddiness playing in her eyes as she thinks for a moment, and takes a deep breath. Her fingers strum the strings, moving methodically. I know the song before she starts in on the lyrics. Her sweet, raspy voice, the one I hear in my dreams, flows from her lungs as she plays Have a Little Faith in Me by John Hyatt, and I hold on to every single note. I hear the message in her words, and I know I was right about her changing lives. Because she's changed mine. When she finishes, we both turn abruptly to the applause from the asshole standing in the doorway. Fuck, the side door has no bell, and that's the one we all enter through. Chris, Ty, Frankie, and Jay stand in the doorway, whistling and cheering. Quinn shakes her head, smiling with a blush in her cheeks. I toss one of the pillows from the couch at Chris. Fuck off. Chris catches it. Me fuck off? You do realize the break room isn't for hookups, right? Fuck. I forgot my shirt's off, not to mention I haven't had time to clean up the condom wrappers. It's not. Ty feigns confusion. Fuck, that's new to me. Jay laughs and punches Chris's arm playfully. Let the kid have fun. He looks over at Quinn with admiration. That was badass. Chris smiles, and I could see he's not actually pissed, even though he probably should be. Clients will be here soon. I nod my head, taking the hint as they all go back into the shop to set up. Quinn covers her face with her hands. That was embarrassing. I smile and pull my shirt on over my head. Nah, they fucking loved it. If they didn't, believe me, you'd know. They're the most honest group of assholes you'll ever meet. She smiles at that. Are you sure it's okay to take the guitar? Yes, Quinn, I'm completely sure. Okay, I will. She holds it by the neck and pulls me into a hug, wrapping her other arm around my neck. I'm going to miss you. I swallow the despair of letting her go, knowing I have to, knowing it's what's best for her. Me too. She pulls back, wiping a tear from her face. 
Let's hope fate takes a chill pill, and I'll see you again someday. Hope so. I nod toward the door. You need a ride? She shakes her head like I knew she would. I'll take a taxi to the airport. You have work to do, changing lives and shit. I laugh at that and smile as I watch her walk away, offering a lame wave because no words will come to me other than, don't fucking go. Man up. You can do this. Quinn Foster came into my life when I needed her the most. Whether she realizes it or not, she's been extraordinarily selfless, helping everyone she could. Now it's time for her to finally put herself first. No matter how badly I want her, I won't rob her of that. At least we had that one night. Chapter 36 Logan Almost one year later. You're late. I remove my dark sunglasses and look over at Kat, who's standing behind the receptionist's desk. I'm five minutes late. Why are you busting my balls? You're supposed to be the nice one. She scoffs, her long hair touching the desk as she looks at the schedule in front of her. Yeah, well, you have a client. A real pain in the ass. Blonde chick. My heart begins to thud faster in my chest. Quinn? I haven't seen her in almost a year, since that day right in this shop when she walked out of my life to start a new one in Nashville. I haven't talked to her either. That's our style. Avoidance. We said our goodbyes, and we're leaving it up to that fucking bitch, fate. I look around the shop. Chris is working on a middle-aged guy, and Frankie and Ty are both chatting with a client at one of the stations. I'm not sure where Jay is. Where is she? Cat gestures toward the room we have reserved for people who want privacy, but we rarely use it. Chris and most of his clients prefer the open room format. Said she needed something dirty. I like the sound of that. Thanks, Cat. She waves me off as she goes back to the pack schedule, and I walk back to the room, taking a deep breath before turning the handle and walking inside. All I see at first is long blonde hair from behind. The girl is sitting in the chair facing away from me, but when she turns, I see it's not Quinn. It's Blair. Shit. I haven't seen her since last summer. She went off to college at Kansas University, and we said a quick goodbye. No fucking, no tears. Just see you around. Have a nice life. Simple and not complicated, like always. She's the last person I expected to be here. Blair? What are you doing here? She laughs easily, her smile bright and happy. Are you ever going to be happy to see me? I laugh and take a seat on the stool. Surprisingly, I am happy to see her. I just meant, shouldn't you be in school? She shrugs her small shoulders. It's Friday. I only have one class, and it's late in the afternoon. Kind of the advantage of going to school 45 minutes away. She looks good. Pretty much the same with her long blonde hair, polished look, and pink sundress with heels. So, what's up? I thought maybe you could give me a tattoo. I know my face just fell, and I also know she sees it. Suddenly, I'm at war with myself. It's just a tattoo. It's what I do for a living. I tattoo women every single day. But somehow, marking Blair seems like a stark betrayal to Quinn. My hand grips the back of my neck as I struggle with the decision. I, um... Her pretty eyes roll in her head, and she swings her legs over the side to face me. What? What's wrong? Blair, fuck, this shouldn't be so damn hard. I don't think I can. Her right eyebrow lifts as she studies me. This about your friend, the one who was staying with you and then disappeared. I nod. Quinn, her name is Quinn. And she didn't disappear, she's in college in Tennessee. She folds her arms over her chest, seemingly trying to be patient with my dumbass. Okay? So then why can't you give me a tattoo? I gave her one before she left. A really special one. And somehow, I just think if I did that for you, you'll be betraying her. She finishes. Blair may be vapid and spoiled, but she's not fucking stupid. And she's not even that vapid. Yeah, I can't do that to her. And yet, you tattoo people every day? My head tilts to the right with a smirk. I haven't slept with them. I shrug. Well, most of them. 
Her pretty smile shows a fondness as she shakes her head, and I take her hand in mine. You, though, we have history. Real history. She nods, her eyes closing briefly. You know, Logan, if I wasn't cold and dead inside, and you weren't so clearly in love with a chick from your past, I think we could have been great together. The truth is, I don't think she's wrong. My heart's always belonged with Quinn. But if there was never a Quinn, who the fuck knows? Blair seems to get me in a way a lot of others don't. Yeah, maybe. Fate had other plans, though. She laughs at that. No shit. I have no interest in love or actual feelings. And why is that, Blair? Something I've never asked her, but have briefly wondered about. She swings her purse that was resting in her lap over her shoulder as she stands up. I watched my parents, who were supposed to be in love, do nothing but fuck each other over. They caused each other nothing but pain, and they did it on purpose. Fuck that shit. God knows, like my father says, I'm my mother's daughter. I would definitely destroy any man who dared to love me. I stand up, laying my hands on her small shoulders, looking into her eyes because I want her to hear me. Number one, I've met your mother. You are not her. Number two, your father is a dick. She didn't make him that way. He just is. And number three, you just need a man strong enough to weather the storm and one that needs a badass bitch to go through it with him too. Don't ever say never. She smiles and kisses my cheek. You're one of the good ones, Logan Davis. So are you. She rolls her eyes and places her pink sunglasses over her pretty eyes. See you around. I nod and smile fondly as she walks out the door. Fuck, I think I'm going to miss her. A few moments later, Chris walks in, a suspicious smile on his face. Was that Blair? I nod. Yeah, just saying hey. He laughs at that, knowing I'm full of shit, and then takes a seat on the stool. I need to talk to you. Oh shit, what did I do now? Nothing. He looks serious, but amused. I'm thinking about opening another shop soon. That's fucking random. What? Where? Here in KC? He shakes his head. Nah, I'm not sure yet. But I was hoping you would go with Jay and scout a couple of places for me. Me? I point to my chest, knowing this is a huge responsibility. Yeah, you. You're my nephew. We share blood. I think you're the most like me and would make a decision like I would. Jay has the experience. I would go with him, but it'll take a few weeks, and I don't really want to be away from home that long. Besides, I know you can handle it. I try to hide the pride I feel at him giving me his trust. Okay, so where are we going? Well, Los Angeles makes sense because the Monroes have a restoration shop there. I nod. The families are close. I get it. But then, I'm not sure. Maybe Oklahoma City, Dallas. His eyes meet mine. Any other cities you can think of? No way this is all about Quinn. You mean Nashville? He smirks, shrugging his shoulders. Hey, it's a big city. There's plenty of opportunity there. Holy shit. This family is totally insane. Do you actually want to open another shop, or is this about me going after Quinn? A girl I haven't seen in a year. One who's happy and living her own life miles away. I let 15 years go by without Amy. And you better believe if I could go back, I wouldn't let one second go by without her. But I've wanted to open up another shop for a while. Just quietly. Everything is stable. I have the money to do it, and I want to do it. You want to add Nashville to the list and go check on Quinn? I'm okay with that. Chris has always been straight with me. I have no reason to doubt him. How will this work exactly? Your shop without your talent? Or are you shipping Jay off? He chuckles at that. Nah, Jay's a lifer. I plan to train some people here or maybe from the city I choose. I'm not sure, just playing it by ear. First, I gotta find the right spot. Okay, sounds good. When? A few weeks. He stands and grips my shoulder. Thanks, kid. He leaves, and I take a seat. I know I need to let Quinn have her space, but I'm not sure I can pass up the opportunity to check up on her. 
giving fate a nudge isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? Chapter 37 Logan Relax, we'll be fine, I promise. Jillian hands me a list, the one she was just reading from. Okay, but you have to make sure to heat the bottle just a little bit. Use the bottle warmer, but test it first. Philip's voice is amused, not really annoyed. Jillian, he knows. He's been here since Aaron was born. Jillian smiles, caressing her son's bald head. Aaron is nine months old, and already my little buddy. It's pretty cool having a little brother. But Jillian hasn't left him alone yet with anyone but Philip. It's the advantage of having a husband with a career in racing. Philip is desperate for a date night with his wife. I volunteered to babysit, and he jumped on it. Jillian, she's not so sure. I know that. Jillian's eyes meet mine, and I trust you wholeheartedly. She kisses his head. It's just hard to leave him. She gestures to Philip. Even with this guy. Well, I'm more mature than Philip. I tease, and he flips me off. Jillian laughs. That's true. I know he's in good hands. He's my little brother. No way in hell I'm letting anything bad happen to him. She hugs me and Aaron to her body and takes a deep breath. I know. She steps back and swings her purse over her shoulder. By the way, Chris told me about your upcoming trip. Of course he did. Yeah. I study her. You didn't put him up to that, did you? She smiles, and I can't read her. No, it was actually his idea. Believe it or not, Chris is a romantic. Pussy! Philip coughs into his hand, and she smacks his chest playfully. That's that whole maturity thing we were talking about, I point out. Jillian laughs again. Exactly. Anyway, are you going? I nod my head and balance Aaron in my arms. He's a little chunky thing. Yeah, I think so. Good. I think it'll be good for you. She kisses the top of Aaron's head and then kisses my cheek. Okay, if you need anything, call. We'll be fine. Philip gives my shoulder a squeeze and kisses the baby before pushing Jill out the door. I use Aaron's pudgy little hand to wave goodbye as Jillian blows a kiss, and I close the door. All right, little man, what now? You hungry? The baby just looks at me and mumbles something in his own language when I hear a knock at the door. I laugh, shaking my head, walking back to the door to open it. Jesus, Jillian! I stop and stare at the familiar face. Sean? His white grin smiles back at me. Hey man, what's up? I look at him amused, holding my brother in my arms. Not much, man. Well, this is awkward. What the hell is he doing here? My first thought is maybe something happened with Reese, and I'm not sure how I feel about that, to be honest. He nods his head at Aaron. Yours? I laugh, the idea an insane one to me. Hell no, little brother. He purses his lips together, amused. And since we're small talking with ease, I'm assuming nothing is actually wrong. Nice. He looks at the foyer behind me. Damn, Logan, this place is fucking nice. Yeah, not too shabby. How did you know where I live? Quinn, when she was still here. I nod, and try not to seem too obvious. You heard from her lately? Nah, she's out there living her own life. I'm happy for her. And he really is. I can see that, but have to ask. Me too. It seemed like you definitely wanted her to get the hell out of here. I think back to the day Quinn and I confronted Reese about going to rehab. He was adamant that Quinn stay the fuck away. Of course I did. If anyone deserves a shot, it's Quinn, and she needed to get far away from Reese. I fight the anger I feel inside. Yeah. I don't want to fight with Sean, especially since I don't even know why he's here. But I need to know the answer to my question before we go any further with this odd reunion. How could you let that shit happen? I mean, you had to know it was going on. I see guilt pass over his face. At first I didn't. And then it was so fucking unbelievable that he would ever hurt her that I lived in denial. And I never actually saw it with my own fucking eyes. Or you can bet I would have beat the shit out of him. I believe him. He grips the back of his neck. I know you live in Yuppieville now, man, 
But you grew up the same way we did. You know the world isn't really right and wrong, black and white. The lines blur. He smiles and drops his hand to his side. I mean, fuck. The first guitar we got for Quinn, we lifted. Technically, that shit is illegal. What's your point? That it's okay that he put his fucking hands on her because he went through some tough shit and was high? Nope, it's not okay. But it happened. And he did go through unimaginable shit that fucked him up. His teeth are clenched, and I know I should probably drop it. Has he been back? No, I don't think he will. I don't really want to talk about Reese anymore, so I ask. What are you doing here? I move out of the way and invite him in, semi-satisfied with his answer to my previous question. Not that I'm not happy to see ya. He walks inside, and again his eyes scan the massive living room. I don't really know. I just moved to the area and thought I would come say hey. I take a seat on the couch. No shit. You moved to Johnson County, to Yuppieville. He takes a seat on the couch at the other end. Yeah, I'm full-on yuppie now. That makes me laugh as I hand a toy to Aaron. Damn, man. Good for you. Yeah, I don't know. After Reese left and then Quinn, I figured I'd better get my shit together. Started at a legit job, a fucking boring job, but it pays for a pretty decent apartment here. That's awesome, Sean. Really. You ever think about college? I bet I can help you out. He laughs that off. Nah, I can't imagine that. But I have been getting into photography lately, so I guess you never know. Not fixing instruments anymore? I'm still good at that. Not surprising. He's good at everything he's ever tried. Well, can't wait to see some of your pictures someday. Quinn said something about you being into tattoos or some shit. I nod. Yeah, I work at my uncle's shop. You should come down sometime. Let you near me with a needle? I chuckle. Yeah, or one of the other artists. We'll treat you right. I have no doubt. Things with Sean were always easy. He had it just as shitty as the rest of us, but somehow he never seemed fucking bitter. He used to see the good in everything, which, I'm not gonna lie, when we were young and just wanted to be pissed off, got really annoying. I see that same happiness in him now, but I'm not naive enough to believe he doesn't harbor any resentment or darkness. You gonna tell me more about Lyric? His eyes roll, and his fingers grace his chin. That was nothing. Just told a dumbass lie to a rich chick I met at a football game. And yet, you seemed awfully pissed when I implied it wasn't hard to get her into bed. I watch his throat bob with irritation. Look, it was nothing. Okay. But why Mel? I mean, seriously. Seriously? Weren't you fucking her best friend? Yeah, but they went to my school. Even I wouldn't fuck around with Mel. That chick is clingy as fuck. Hence, the fake name. I nod. Okay, makes sense. I was just curious. He groans and leans back into the couch. I don't know, man. Reese and Quinn thought I had some sort of sick obsession with fucking rich girls as some passive-aggressive way to stick it to the rich dude who fucked my mom and then abandoned her. But I think I just have a fucking type. So sue me. We don't know much about his dad. All we ever heard was his mom really loved him, and he asked her to get an abortion, tossed money at her, and bailed. Never to be seen again. I shrug. Maybe it's both. Yeah, maybe. He turns his head to look at me. You going after Quinn, or what? Nope. If I go to Nashville, it won't be the chase after Quinn. I let Aaron chill on the floor with some toys and turn back to Sean. Like you said, she's living her life. Man, don't be stupid. How long have you been apart? It was always you two. Seriously, don't be fucking stupid. I sigh and lean my head back against the soft sofa. I do have an opportunity just to check on her. I just don't want to open that can of worms. With you two, it's already been opened. You need to figure that shit out. You and Reese are tight. Why are you trying to convince me to go after his girl? I care about Reese even if the fucker bailed. Still. It was always you and Quinn, and even he knew it. She was never his. I'm not so sure about that. I think back to the way Quinn looked at Reese the last time I saw them together, about how badly she wanted to save him. I don't want to be a consolation prize. Don't be stupid. Whether Reese is here or a million miles away, 
Quinn was always and will always be yours. No matter how much I want to believe that, I'm not certain I ever truly can. Chapter 38 Logan It's not stalking. I'm here for business. I try to convince myself of that shit as I drive downtown and toward Quinn's address. Jay and I arrived in Nashville this morning and looked around at a couple of locations that would no doubt be great for Chris's new shop. The past two weeks have been nonstop traveling, Los Angeles, Oklahoma City, Dallas, and even Atlanta, before our last stop, Nashville. Jay went back to his hotel room after we had dinner, but since my plane takes off back to Kansas City tomorrow, I had to take tonight to check on Quinn. On my way down the side street right off Main in the rental car, I stop dead in the road as I see a white marquee with simple black letters. Quinn Foster, 9 p.m. They spelled her name wrong, but I know it's my Quinn. I look at the clock. It's 9.15. I ignore the person behind me blaring their horn and pull into the nearest parking spot. I jump out of the car, locking it as the guy that was behind me passes with his middle finger out the window. Can't blame him. I'd probably do the same thing. I walk up to the old weathered brick building and pull open the door. It's a small bar with a pool table, a few booths, and a wooden stage up front with the most beautiful sound in the world coming from it. Quinn. She's standing with her guitar, the guitar I finally talked her into taking, in front of a microphone on a stand and singing her rendition of Landslide. Holy shit. I take a seat in the back booth and watch her sing. There are only a few people in the bar, but every single one of them is watching her, pulled in by her magic. When she finishes that song, she leans into the microphone a little, and I see the bright smile on her face, wrapped in slight sadness, as she says, The next song is my own version of a song that is very important to me. People applaud and coax her into playing. Her fingers start playing, and I know it's have a little faith in me. I swallow the feelings that song evokes in me. Her version is fucking flawless, a little faster in spots than the original, and holding different notes, making it her own. Her raspy voice is entrancing. Her eyes lock on mine, as if she could feel me here, but she doesn't miss a beat as she continues her song. When she finishes her set, she thanks the crowd and carries her guitar right to my booth. Her hair is still to her shoulders, but there's some curl to it tonight. She's wearing a sexy-as-fuck, sparkly black dress that has a halter top and is low-cut. It's so different from what I'm used to her wearing, but it's still completely her. I was so focused on her singing that I didn't even have a chance to notice what she's wearing. But I do now. Damn, Quinn. She smiles at that, placing her guitar in the opposite side of the booth, her hand on her hip. Still stalking me? Hey, I'm here for a legitimate business reason. She doesn't believe me, which is apparent by her right eyebrow lifting as she takes a seat across from me and next to her guitar. Business, huh? Yep. Chris is thinking about opening another shop. Here? Or L.A. or Dallas or Oklahoma City or Atlanta? I shrug, trying to play it cool. I've been all over with Jay, trying to find the perfect spot. She leans forward on her elbows, pushing her perfect breasts together in a tempting motion. You're not fucking with me? Nope, it's true. Although, I think Chris added Nashville on purpose. She smiles at that, sweeping her hair out of her face. How did you know I was playing tonight? I leaned forward across the table, my face closer to hers. I think fate was on our side. Her pale pink lips turn up in a smirk, and I notice she's wearing charcoal eyeshadow and dark eyeliner, which give her a dark, sexy look. She looks damn good. Is that so? Yeah, I was on my way to your place and saw your name outside. How do you know where I live? I laugh and sit back in the booth again. Jillian receives a money order from an envelope addressed from Nashville every month. She gnaws on her bottom lip, looking guilty. It had to be a loan. I couldn't live with myself just taking the handout. She doesn't want the money. Hence the money order. I knew she wouldn't cash a check. Good call. Smart. She uses her hand to brush her hair out of her eyes, tossing it back, ruffling it up in a sexy move that makes me want to jump across the table. So, 
Do you still want to see my place? All I can manage is a simple nod. My throat is too fucking dry to give a verbal answer. She takes it and stands up from the booth, grabbing her guitar and nodding her head at the bartender. I'll see you next week, Bobby. The middle-aged man waves and eyes me suspiciously as Quinn motions with her head for me to follow her out of the bar. I drive us to the address I was headed to earlier, and when she leads me up the stairs and opens the door to the apartment, we don't waste any fucking time. We both knew why we were going back to her place. She places the guitar next to the closed door, and her arms wrap around my neck as our lips mash together, the hunger overwhelming. My back slams against the wall as her hands grip my tea, lifting it up and off as she tosses it behind us, and we quickly move back to our kiss. My fingers find the clasp of her halter top, and I lower the dress to her waist, happy to discover she's not wearing a bra. Fuck, Quinn. She lets out a soft moan as my lips move over the ink I tattooed on her a year ago. I think I love it even more every day. I stare at it in the mirror every morning, convincing myself I'm strong. You are fucking strong. My lips slide over one perky nipple, popping it into my mouth. Her head tilts backward, and a groan escapes her mouth as I nibble slightly and then move to the other. And fucking sexy. She pushes her dress down, and as it pulls on the ground, I drop to my knees, my eyes staring at her lacy black panties as my fingers slip under the straps. I slowly remove them, bringing them down her silky thighs before she steps out of them, and I finally drag my tongue slowly down her slit. She's wet and ready for me. I groan at my first taste, holding her firm ass in my hands, pulling her into me as her hips buck with need. I find her clit with my tongue, encircling it, flicking it softly, and teasing her a little before again sliding down the entire length. Fuck, Logan. I smile and move back to her clit, inserting a finger into her tight heat, my cock straining against my zipper, begging for its turn. Her fingers grip my hair as my finger slides in and out of her, and I work her clit, feeling her pussy clench, and I know she's close. Then, her hips buck. Her voice is hoarse as her hands grip my hair tightly. Holy shit! When she finishes, I stand up. She quickly undoes my jeans, pushing them down along with my briefs, her small hand grabbing my aching cock and stroking it from base to tip, almost making me lose it. My forehead rests against hers. I want you, Quinn. Her lips find mine as she whispers, Take me. I have to get on a plane tomorrow and go back to KC. No regrets, Logan. No guilt. Just tonight. I smile thinking about her words from the last time we were together, and kiss her as she places my cock between her legs. I thrust forward, I swear, nearly dying from the sensation of her pussy around my cock. Fuck, we forgot a condom. She moves her hips, urging me to move with her. I'm on the pill, don't worry about it. Just fuck me like you mean it. I don't want to think about what made her go on the pill in the first place, and pick her up, thrusting inside her like a wild man needing to be inside her, needing this release. Just plain needing her. Chapter 39 Quinn I smile as Logan's arm wraps around my bare middle, pulling my body into his as we lay in my bed. Last night was perfect. Never in a million years did I think he would be at my performance, but as I was singing, I could feel him. I felt his eyes on me, and when I looked out into the small crowd and saw his familiar eyes, I swear my heart stopped for a moment. My hand moves over his. What time's your flight? Not till this evening. His sexy, deep voice whispers into my ear. What do you have in mind? I look back at him over my shoulder, his hair perfectly mussed by my fingers. How about I give you the real tour of Nashville? He smiles, and after we shower together, taking time to enjoy each other's bodies once again, we head out. I show him the campus at my college and some local places, finishing our tour with my favorite fried chicken restaurant. Once we've ordered, it's mostly small talk, and then they bring our food, delicious chicken strips and mashed potatoes with gravy. As we start eating, I have to ask, so what have you been up to for the last year? Not much. He takes a bite and groans as he tastes the delicious flavor. Damn, that's good. I laugh. <laughs> I told you. 
He nods and wipes his hand on the cloth napkin before answering my question more fully. I've just been working, learning everything I can from Chris and being a big brother. None of us had siblings, so that has to be quite a change. Although I know, without a doubt, he's a wonderful big brother. That's awesome. Yeah, Aaron is pretty fucking cute. Yeah, Jillian sent me a picture. You still talk to Jill? I take a bite and chew before answering. Yes, she sends me letters sometimes. Actual handwritten letters in an envelope with a stamp like it's the fucking 90s. He chuckles at that. So you're pen pals. Yeah. I smile, thinking about his amazing stepmother. I really like it. What about Reese? I see the concern in his eyes, and I know it pains him to ask. I haven't heard from him. I hope he's alive, but honestly, who knows? His throat bobs. Yeah, who knows? Talk about Reese kind of put a damper on the conversation, and we go back to eating and making very short small talk. After dinner, he drives back to my apartment. The day of sightseeing and walking around what's become my new home made it one to remember. He walks me up to my door, and I fight the dying feeling inside of me, knowing we're about to say goodbye yet again. You ever think you'll come back to KC? I don't want to lie to him. I'm not sure. I bite my bottom lip and force myself to look up into his eyes. I really like it here. Back there, it was like I was haunted by so many ghosts. But here I'm free. He smiles and cups my cheek in his hand. That's great, Quinn. You deserve to be free. If you're ever back here, you better stop by. <laughs> Absolutely. I think fate is on our side. His lips find mine in a brief, sweet kiss, and my hand wraps around his wrist as he holds my face. I don't want him to go, but I know he has a life back in Kansas City. And a family. I love you. His eyes open and search mine. I had to say it, just once, you know? I love you too, Quinn. And I know he means it as he kisses my lips again and then holds my body to his in a tight hug. Have a safe trip back, Logan. I'll see you again, Quinn. And that's it. Logan Davis is once again out of my life, and all I can do is pray that he's right and fate won't be a total bitch. Chapter 40 Logan A few months later after I last saw Quinn, I'm working in the shop, enjoying life and shooting the shit with a client who I just finished working on when Philip and Jillian walk through the front door of the shop. I see the worried looks on their faces and instantly know something is really fucking wrong. Chris, who was admiring my work a moment earlier, stands at attention and senses the same thing. Fuck, what are you guys doing here? Where's Aaron? I ask as I stand up, and Kat directs my customer to her for payment. Even she senses something is up. Jillian clears her throat softly. He's with Amy. We need to talk to you. I shake my head, and Chris places a hand on my shoulder, giving it a quick squeeze. Go to the break room. They walk to me, and Philip wraps an arm around my shoulder, guiding me to the room. I shrug out of his hold when we walk through the doorway and turn to face them both. Jana? This is about Jana, right? I see tears well up in Jillian's eyes as she nods her head. Fuck, what? She's in jail? She killed someone? What? Even Philip looks teary, which really freaks me the fuck out. He's not a man who cries, no matter how progressive it is these days. He just doesn't. She died, kid. My ass hits the coffee table in the break room as my knees give out. What? When? Last night, Jillian answers as she takes a seat next to me. I'm so sorry, Logan. I look up at Philip. This is bullshit. There's no way she's dead. His eyes tell me she is. The police called this morning. I'm sorry. I'm so fucking sorry, kid. I thought we could save her. Overdose? They share a look that really pisses me off before Jillian answers. It was drug-related. I won't be a dick to Jillian anymore, no matter what I'm going through. I made that promise when I attacked her after Quinn left, and I was high and fucked up. But Philip can take it. I look him right in the eye. How did she die? Don't treat me like a fucking kid. You don't need the details. His eyes are pleading for me to drop it. I'm not a kid. I haven't ever really been a fucking kid. Tell me the goddamn truth now. I growl, 
and I'm as angry as I sound. Jillian shakes her head in a warning to Philip, but he takes a deep breath. She was high, and apparently... He swallows, the motion causing his Adam's apple to wobble in his throat. She was on the train tracks really late at night. I drop my head. She was hit by a fucking train? And then look up at Philip. That's how she went out? I feel Jillian's hand on my back and hear her sobbing next to me. I'm so sorry, Logan. A laugh, a completely humorless laugh, bubbles up and out of my throat, keeping my eyes on Philip. She died in a fucking train wreck. She was the epitome of a train wreck. His eyes close briefly before he looks at me and nods his head. She did. That's fucking classic. I stand up, not able to take Jillian's comforting touch, because I don't want to feel better. Logan, where are you going? I turn around and face my father as I stand in the door. Back to work. Jillian stands up, wiping tears from her eyes. What? You can't work today. Yes, I can. I try to soften my tone. I'm fine. My eyes drift down to her belly that's starting the show another bump. They told me last month they're expecting again. Something about them not getting any younger, so they didn't want to wait long. You can't get all worked up. You have my little sister to think about. Her hand moves over her stomach as she smiles and wipes at her face again. This is an emotional time. You need to grieve. I shrug. Hopefully, she's free now. I gotta work. Thanks for telling me. I'm assuming there will be a funeral. Hopefully not. Confirming what I already know. They'll be providing a send-off for Jana. Cool. Thanks. I'll be there. With that, I walk back into the shop and prepare for my next line. Jana's dead. And I'm definitely not fine. Chapter 41 Quinn Everyone is wearing black, and it's a cold and rainy day. I hate funerals. I've only been to a few, but when Jillian called my cell phone and told me Jana had died, I knew I had to attend this one. Logan is standing with Philip and Jillian up front as the minister says the final words over the shiny black coffin. His black suit fits him nicely, but his eyes are haunted by the moment. By the woman who should have been his mother and been there for him but never was. She's actually Logan walks toward me, his eyes dark with suspicion. Why are you here? I thought you didn't want to come back to KC. I wrap my hand around the opposite wrist. I didn't want to. Then why are you here? Jan is dead. I wanted to check on you. He scoffs at that, and there's that darkness he's always had, one I thought maybe had completely disappeared. I'm fine. You sure? His eyes narrow. Go back to your new life, Quinn. The world's not worse off because she's dead, and we both know that. He's in trouble. I can see it in his eyes, and I also detect the hint of alcohol on his breath. Logan, I'm staying here tonight, so if you want company... Yeah, I'm not really in the mood to fuck. I'm good. I take a deep breath and remind myself he's hurting. I didn't mean that. I'm more than just a one-night stand, remember? And I said that before I fucked you one night. How stupid can you get, Quinn? I suck in a hurt breath, angry and ready to knee the fucker in the balls, dead mother or not, when his angry gaze focuses on something behind me. What the fuck, Quinn? Did you bring him here? What are you talking about? I turn and see who he's talking about as Sean and Reese walk to us. Reese? He looks good. A hell of a lot better than the last time I saw him. He has several days of scruff on his face, but he doesn't look ragged. His dark hair is washed and styled, and he's wearing dark sunglasses, but his cheeks aren't sunken in. He looks strong and healthy. Sober. Quinn. His deep voice is low as he approaches cautiously. 
and I turn back to Logan, who looks even more angry than before. I didn't know he was back, I swear. Sean nods his head in agreement with me. He just got in last night. Fucker surprised me, too. Yeah, good thing he has the same cell number since he's a Johnson County bitch now. You're what? I turn to Sean. His bright white smile is as comforting as the sparkle in his green eyes. <laughs> yep, I'm actually living pretty close to this guy now. He looks over at Logan, who is not amused. He slips on a pair of black sunglasses, his demeanor completely different from what I've grown accustomed to. Yeah, well, this was a fun reunion. Maybe we can do it again at the next funeral. He brushes past me and walks to the car with his family, opening the door and slinking inside, slamming the door shut. I try like hell to stop the painful feeling from taking over the inside of my chest. Fuck, he did not look good, Sean comments. He said he's fine. Reese's mouth is tight-lipped as he speaks. You know that's not true. I do. Reese, where have you been? His large, muscular shoulders shrug upward as he raises the sunglasses, letting them rest on top of his head. I had to leave. I knew you wouldn't go if I was still here to take care of. That wasn't your decision to make. Yes, it was. His smile is calming and familiar, reminiscent of good times with him. Quinn, I hate what I did, and there's no guarantee I'll stay sober. I knew that then, and I knew I couldn't keep you there stuck, just waiting for my next relapse. You just bailed. You didn't tell me anything. I knew you would try to talk me out of it. You thought you could help me. Maybe I could have. I fold my arms over my chest, cold from the rainy, dreary day. How long have you been sober this time? Sean smiles as Reese answers. Since the last time I saw you? I stare at him in astonishment. Really? Yeah, but it doesn't mean I'll stay this way. One fucking setback and I'm done. I know that. He looks pained. You and me, we could never work out. I always knew that. Why do you say that? His eyes drift toward the black limo making its way out of the cemetery. You were always his, and he was always fucking yours. I spent a lot of time being fucking jealous, wondering when he would come back. He leans in a little closer, keeping his voice low. If you thought about him when we were together. My eyes close as I swallow the guilt. Reese, I really did care for you. But you weren't in love with me, and I knew that. I didn't have a shot in hell getting sober when I was thinking about you with him. And of course, I still did when I wasn't around you, but not as much. I'm so sorry. He laughs at that. <laughs> no, no more being sorry. We're all fucked up kids from the wrong side of the tracks. We didn't have parents to teach us anything, but all we can do is try like hell to right our wrongs. I wrap my arms around his neck and pull him into a tight hug, which he returns. I do love you, Reese. I love you too, Quinn. Always. I feel another pair of arms wrap around us both. I love you both, you stubborn motherfuckers. I laugh at Sean and embrace the hug, but feel a sinking feeling as I think about Logan. When we pull out of the hug and Reese shoves Sean backward playfully, I wipe a wild tear that got loose and then sigh heavily, looking over at the fresh dirt on top of Jana's casket. She's really gone. Well, at least she can't hurt him anymore. Sean says as he looks at the same spot. Reese looks up toward the sky and then back at me. You know he's not okay. He needs you. I can't even imagine how hard that is for him to say. I'm not sure I can do anything for him. Reese places his hand on my shoulder. I think you might be the only one who can. I'm not nearly as certain as he is, but I know I have to try. Chapter 42 Logan Sweat drips down my bare chest, and my knuckles are cracked and bleeding. But I don't fucking care. I continue to hit the heavy punching bag in the downstairs gym of Philip and Jillian's house. This day fucking sucked. Watching what was left of my mother's body be lowered into the ground fucked me up more than I want to admit. Fucking Jana. She really didn't give a flying fuck about me right up until the end. Getting high and going down to hang out on the train tracks sounded like a fucking fabulous idea. My fist hits the red bag again. Fuck her! Never mind her fucking kid, right? Hey, stop! 
I feel arms wrap around my torso, pinning my hands to my sides, as Philip physically stops me from pummeling the bag, pulling me back away from it. Stop! I struggle for a moment, and then realize I'm stuck as I drop down to my knees, and he falls down with me. Leave me the fuck alone. Not happening, kid. He releases my arms and turns my body to face him. You need to wear gloves. What the hell are you doing? She fucking died. He nods his head and leans back on his ass, his knees still on the floor. I know. She never fucking cared. Never. He shakes his head from side to side and places a hand on my shoulder. That's not true. Um, no? So she fucking cared when she got arrested and I ended up in foster care. Like three fucking times. Or when she forgot me at the park when I was six. Or when she let her boyfriend smack me around. I'm hurting him deeply, and I can see it. But at this moment, I don't fucking care. Fuck. He runs his fingers through his hair. That was all my fucking fault, too. You know that. It wasn't all her. You weren't there. Exactly. He places a hand over his heart. I wasn't fucking there, and I should have been. But I wanted a career in hot chicks to be a selfish fucking kid. His voice is strained. She wanted you. She... Damn it, Logan. She really wanted you. I don't know how it all got so fucking skewed, and we'll never know. But I'll never forget the way she looked at you in the hospital when you were in her arms. I shake my head angrily. No, don't fucking tell me that. It's true. I swear, I thought you would be okay because of the love I saw in her eyes that day. My head just moves from side to side. How do you know it wasn't an act? That she didn't get pregnant on purpose for a fucking meal ticket? Because that sounds like my mom to me. I don't think she was hooked on that shit yet. But you don't know for sure. You'll never fucking know either because she went and got herself killed. I know she loved you. She just had a seriously shitty way of showing it. And the drugs held her prisoner, Logan. And I'm fucking sorry. I don't blame you. That's the truth. I don't. I'm glad. But you need to forgive her. In your own time. But take comfort in knowing she loved you. And she told me you were the best thing she ever did. I agree. Why couldn't she have just been a mom? She was sick. Believe me, I know that feeling. My mom was never fucking there. She tried, but she was sick. And she just couldn't be. I swallow, pissed at the world and not even really sure why. I have a good life now, but I still carry all that shit with me. I get that. It's part of you. It made you compassionate. His hand playfully hits my shoulder. You make me want to be a better man. Every day. You made me grow up. I smirk. Maybe a little bit. He laughs and pulls me into a hug. I love you. You're the best thing that ever happened to me. And Jana gave me you. So no matter what, I can never hate her. And I hope you don't either. Without her, there would be no you. A small smile forms on my lips. And my head turns when the door to the stairs opens. And a moment later, Quinn is standing at the bottom of them. Oh, I'm sorry. Jillian said I could come down here. Philip gives me another squeeze and pulls back. No problem. I think we're done with our male bonding moment. He looks at me. Right? I smile and shake my head. Yeah, I think I'm good for now. He stands up and walks to Quinn. Good to see you again. She smiles fondly at him. You too. You kids play nice. He walks up the stairs, and I hear the door shut as I stand up and sit on the weight bench. Why are you here, Quinn? You should be on a plane and far away from my mean ass. She shrugs and takes a seat on the floor in front of me, legs up to her chest. She changed out of the black dress she had on at the funeral and is now wearing a red sweater and jeans. I happen to like your ass, mean or not. I was an asshole. Were you drunk? I had a few swigs of whiskey from my own stash I bought with a fake ID I got in high school to try and calm my nerves before the funeral but they were way too big, and I went over my limit. It doesn't matter. She nods her head. Yeah, that part doesn't, but you hurting does, which is where the anger really came from. I shouldn't fucking care. She was your mom, 
no matter how fucking toxic. She was still your mom, and it's got to be strange that she's gone. It is pretty fucking weird. I run my hands through my sweaty hair. I'm sorry, Quinn. I shouldn't have talked to you that way. It's okay. It's not. She smiles. True. You're a hell of a lot more than a one-night stand to me. She smiles at me. Yeah, I know. I have to ask. And Reese? She bites her bottom lip. I had no idea he was back. I hadn't talked to him since he left, but he told me to come here to you. Why the hell would he do that? Her shoulders lift. He thinks it was always you and me, that he was sort of filler. I raise an eyebrow. Was he? No. I tried to fight the urge to punch the bag again. But I was never actually in love with him. I care about him, but I don't love him. I never did. Not like that. That brings an arrogant smile to my face, hearing the unspoken, not like I love you. When's your flight? Tomorrow morning. She stands up and takes my hand. Most people would probably take the time to talk about where this is going, how we clearly love each other, and maybe should try to figure shit out. But us? Go take a shower so we can have another one night together. Yeah, that's just not us. Fucked up or not, she lives in Nashville, and I live here. I stand up, taking her face in my hands and kissing her soft lips. Still, I know, one night will never be enough. And somehow, I'm going to fix the situation we're in. Chapter 43 Quinn Morning! Jillian smiles as she takes a sip from her orange juice, sitting at the kitchen table. I smile at her, taking a seat across from her, my hair still messy from last night with Logan. I should be ashamed, but I'm not. Hi, Jillian. I'm so glad you were here for him, Quinn. I look out the glass doors into the guest house where I used to live, which is Logan's new home. I'm not sure I did any good. You're good for him, trust me. He wasn't doing well at all. He's still asleep. At least he was when I slinked off. I can't take another goodbye. I have to go back. She nods her head in agreement. Yes, you do. I feel the tears welling in my eyes. I don't want to. Her soft hand covers my own that's resting on the table. Do you not want to go back, or do you not want to leave Logan? I love it there. I found this amazing freedom in Nashville. A tear falls, and I quickly wipe it away. But I miss him every minute. I know, sweet girl. I know you do. She smiles and looks out at the guest house. Do you trust me? I nod without hesitation. Yes. Then know that you can get on that plane today and that everything will work out exactly the way it's supposed to very soon. I watch her with wonder. She seems so completely certain. How? Destiny. Her smile is bright and sure. You guys think you've made mistakes that need absolution, that you're both somehow unforgivable, maybe even unlovable. But the thing is, you'll only find redemption in each other. And you had to find yourself before you could save him, and the same goes for Logan. You're both so very young. We don't know how to love. I try to laugh, but it comes out half sobbing. Her hand squeezes mine. Love is one thing that never has to be taught. It's in us. For you, loving Logan is as simple as taking a breath. You just do it. It's natural and what you know. And believe me, he loves you the same. Always. I really miss you, I blurt out, and she smiles. I miss you too, but I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. But you need to. I smile and look back toward the guest house one more time. You know how I know he'll be okay? How? I turn back to her. He lost Jana, but he didn't lose his mom. You're his mom, and he knows it deep down. She tears up now and closes her eyes briefly. I love him like a son. I know. I stand up and give her hand a squeeze. Take care of him for me. Absolutely. 
And if you ever need anything, you let me know. I agree to that, and she stands up giving me a big hug, and I try not to cry. I'm successful until I board the plane back to Nashville. To my new life, the one without Logan, without Jillian, Sean, and Reese. The beautiful new home that I know is missing something, but still holds all my future possibilities. And I pray every day that Jillian is right, and that soon, destiny will come for me. Chapter 44 Logan You really sure about this? I turn to Chris, who's standing on my left. He places a steady hand on my shoulder. Absolutely, but don't fuck it up. Philip, who's on my right, laughs at that. Please, he's my kid. He's not capable of fucking up. Leslie laughs way too hard at that from her place behind me, standing with Cash and their daughter. Oh, please, he's an Adamson. God knows it takes a lot of tries before we get it right. I roll my eyes and adjust the strap of the duffel that swung over my shoulder, talking to Chris directly. This is a big deal. He just shrugs it off easily. You'll do fine. I trust you. He's fucking nuts. Around six months ago, after the funeral and after Quinn left, Chris told me he'd made the decision about the new shop. I swear I thought he would go with L.A., but nope, he chose Nashville. For me. He told me he wanted it to be mine. I was shaking in my converse, but I accepted. The chance to be with Quinn was too great to turn down. And not only that, but also to have my own shop. This is my opportunity to finally be with the girl I was always supposed to be with. And I can't fuck it up. Then fear of failure set in, but I tried like hell never to show it. I still can't believe you opened a shop just to get a girl for me. He laughs at that. If it was in a shitty small town, I'm not sure I would have been as generous. But this is fucking Nashville. We're gonna make some money, kid. Jillian walks to me and hands me a sandwich. My newborn baby sister tucked in the carrier strapped to her chest. Please be careful down there. I look at the bald head of my little sister as Aaron toddles in the grass in front of the house. Are you sure you're okay with me moving so far away? She nods her head. I'm going to miss you like crazy, but as long as you visit and bring Quinn as often as you can, I'm okay with it. Don't think she won't be down there every month under some sort of guise, Philip adds. I laugh at that. She's already booked a flight for next month to help me find a different place than the apartment I rented on a month-to-month -month basis. We walk closer to my car and further away from the rest of the group. Thank you for everything. I swallow, knowing I owe everything to her. I may have lost Jana, but I didn't lose my mom. She smiles, her eyes glassy. I love you, Logan. You've made me incredibly proud. I never had any doubt that you would. Why is that? She smiles. I'm not sure. I just had a feeling about you from the first time we met, and I wasn't wrong. You are exceptional. I love you too, Jillian. She hugs me, and I look back at my family. Okay, I'm really going to do this then. Chris bought a small hole in the wall in Nashville, similar to a shop here, and only a block away from the bar I found Quinn singing in. He paid contractors to transform it into a state-of-the-art tattoo parlor, and then found two local artists here that were willing to relocate. Both guys worked in a shop for three months to prove their skill, and both are fucking solid. We'll do just fine. I give everyone a big-ass hug before I climb in my car and start the eight-hour drive to Nashville. Toward Quinn. I don't want just one night here and there with her. I want a fucking lifetime. Thanks to Jillian texting back and forth with her on Quinn's new cell phone, I know she has a gig tonight at that same bar. When I finally get into town... I don't have time to go to my new place, so I park in front of the bar and walk inside, smiling when I see Quinn up on the stage. Her guitar is in her hand, and she's wearing the same Led Zeppelin t-shirt she wore when I gave her that tattoo, ripped pair of jeans, and hot pink Converse tennis shoes, one she probably bought because she's past those rebel years. Her fingers strum the strings as she sings a Janis Joplin tune, her eyes meeting mine and locking there the entire set. When she's finished, she makes a beeline to me, her arms wrapping around my neck. Did Jillian tell you I was coming? She smiles, looking into my eyes. About six months ago. 
Is that so? She nods. How long do we have? My lips find hers, but don't make contact yet. How about forever? Her right eyebrow lifts. What are you talking about? Chris opened a shop here, down the street. She unlocks her arms from around my neck and playfully shoves me away. Bullshit. I come here every weekend and there's no new shop. I laugh. Yeah, Chris likes anonymity. Thinks it's better when you can't tell what the fuck is there. No sign, but the shop is there, I assure you. I place my hands on her hips, bringing her body back to mine. Actually, it's kind of mine. At least to run. Her face brightens. No way. Yup. If you're fucking with me, Logan Davis. My lips smash against hers, unable to take it any longer. Her arms wrap around my neck again as she kisses me back, not even fighting it for a second. You want to go break it in? I wag my eyebrows at her, and she rolls her eyes. You're fucking ridiculous. I know. You bring it out of me. You left all your family behind for me. I tip my head back, looking into those dark, stormy eyes that are now sparkling. Life seems to surge inside her now, and I know she's found everything she was missing that night we reconnected at the drive-in. Quinn, you really don't fucking get it, do you? Get what? Get what? You're my family. You always were, and they aren't going anywhere. She smiles and presses her lips to mine again. Maybe when I graduate, we can go back. Maybe. Let's just play it by ear. Sounds good. Except you and me. I gesture between the small space between us. Let's never wing it with us ever again. I take her hands in mine and place them both over my heart. I want you in my life forever. I promise you, I'm not going anywhere without you. Her eyes well up with wet tears, and she's so fucking beautiful. Turns out fate wasn't really a motherfucker after all. I kiss her again. Nope, it just took us down a weird path. I like our path, and all I ever wanted was you. You have me. You always have. I always took you with me, whether I knew it or not. She nods her head, her eyes focused on me in the small bar. I love you. She smiles. I'm in love with you. I'm in love with you, Quinn. And I look forward to pissing you off till death do us part. Was that a proposal? Not quite, I shrug. But soon. I can live with that. I wrap my arms around her waist and hold on to her, finally having her. And there's no way I'll ever break my promise. Quinn is mine. And I'm hers. Whatever and whenever. Always. Epilogue. Quinn. Three years later. Where's Logan? I ask Eli, one of the tattoo artists at Lyrics and Ink, Logan's tattoo shop. He's well known for his musical-themed tattoos. Of course, using my body as a canvas for his beautiful art. My right hip now has the lyrics from Have a Little Faith in Me, and my left side has some from Landslide. He's in the back. I nod and walk through the insanely crowded shop and smile when I see my husband sitting on the couch, sketching on his notepad. Are you kidding me? We have a flight to catch. He smiles, looking up at me, mischief in those beautiful blues. I'm almost finished. I'm designing our new tattoos. I'm going to ask Chris to do them when we're there. I smile and take a seat next to him. You're going to let someone else tattoo me? <laughs> no fucking way. I'm doing yours, but he can do mine. I can't lie. The possessiveness isn't exactly a turnoff. I lean my head on his shoulder and smile when I see the design. The left is a swirl of ink turning into letters spelling out my fate in cursive lettering that matches my strong tattoo. And on the right is a musical note that leads into the words my destiny in the font matching his tough tattoo. Which one am I? Your fate or your destiny? He smiles. You're definitely my destiny. Music will always be a part of you, and ink a part of me. I love it. His lips kiss mine. I love you. I love you, too. But we have a flight to catch. Yes, ma'am. He stands up and goes into the main part of the tattoo shop, barking orders to his guys about not letting the place go to shit while he's gone for the weekend. They both salute him, and we leave for the airport.
I graduated from college, but we couldn't leave Nashville. It's become our home. However, we do make monthly trips back to Kansas City to see the family, and they make the trip down every month also, so we're never really without them. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Who knew Quinn Foster would ever belong to an insanely big, crazy-ass happy family? Logan Ah, there he is. You're fucking late. Chris, of course, doesn't miss giving me shit as Quinn and I walk into his tattoo shop. Traffic is fucking terrible from the airport. We would have picked you up, Jillian says as she kisses my cheek. We're fine. I pick up my sister, Millie, as she runs up to me. How are you, Millie? I missed you. I laugh and hug her little body. I missed you too, kiddo. Aaron runs up and hugs me around my waist, and Millie's little feet just barely touch the ground as my body crashes to the ground, tackled by my little brother. Damn, man, letting a kid take your ass down. Reese laughs from his spot at his tattoo station. I still can't believe Chris hired your ass. Doesn't he know you're a delinquent? Reese laughs and flips me off proudly. Didn't stop him from giving your ass a chance. Damn straight. Quinn rolls her eyes and hands Chris my sketch from earlier. You think you can put that over his heart? Chris studies it. Hell yeah, I could do that. The other one is all mine to do. Sure you don't want a real man to do it, Quinn? Reese asks, wagging his eyebrows, and I raise my middle finger. Don't even think about it. Quinn laughs, wrapping her arms around my waist. Oh, please, he has his own girl to tattoo. That's right. I cover Aaron's ears as Millie races back to the lounge. You are one crazy motherfucker. Reese just chuckles, smiling happily as Sean walks in, his arm around his wife. Not as crazy as him. Debatable, Quinn and I say at the same time. Four broken kids, all finding our own unique path. But somehow, it all led us back here. To each other. This has been Redemption, written by Nicole Dykes, narrated by Thurlow Holmes and Dash Coleman. Copyright 2019 by Nicole Dykes. Production copyright 2021 by Nicole Dykes. Produced by Suggestive Audio. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.